ಗುಡ್ you hear me good morning someone has really bad disturbance in the microphone oh, yes i just i'm learning Hola Dimitri, ¿cómo estamos, hermano? Muy bien, compadre. ¿Cómo estás bien? Sí, muy bien, un poco cansado. ¿no? Hello, Lori. Hello, Hello. Hello everybody. Uh, good morning. Good morning, good evening, whatever. <laughs> We all connected here from different time zones. Thank you for joining us. I am Zuha and I'll be the moderator for this panel. Uh, yes. We have one more speaker to join us, uh, so we'll be waiting for him. Just thank you so much. We'll be, we'll go live in two minutes. Nice. Can I share this on my LinkedIn live? Yes, sure. No issues. Uh, you can share the YouTube link, not this uh, meeting link, please. Where's the YouTube link? Uh, you should be able to find that in your email. Uh, one second, I shall send it in the chat box. Uh, you can find the link to the YouTube on our chat box. Ten thirty your time, Lori. Yes, it is. <laughs> A little bit late here, but that's okay. Yeah, I'm central, so I'm 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 one less than you. Okay. <laughs> I lived in upstate New York, Syracuse. Oh, very good. And where are you based out of now, Dimitri? Uh, back in my or, country of origin, Guatemala, Guatemala City, Central America. I see. Okay. Yes. This is definitely a global bunch today. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm happy that I'm in my country representing it for this, just to make it a little more diverse. <laughs> That's Why not? Correct. Why not? I'm happy you woke me up, Dimitri. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. You were a little, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you were tired. Yeah, but it's worth it, man. Oh, yeah. So is this conversation going to be an hour and a half? Uh, uh, we can wrap up quickly too, if you would like, but then we do extend sometimes. Oh, nice. I, I was just wondering. It's, it's all okay. good. <laughs> we actually, uh, we actually expecting when, when we're making the schedule, we thought it would be a buffer time, maybe early, maybe late due to some issues. But then all our panels in the day one and day two, we actually did hit the mark of uh, 10.30 or a oh, one and a half hour. Nice. And how, how many participants are there total? Oh, you mean in the audience? 
Uh, the audience we have is on YouTube Live, so it keeps increasing. Right now, we are at 124. Great. Right. Okay, I'm live on LinkedIn anyways, but with the YouTube feed. Uh, I'm so sorry for the delay. We have our speakers who are logging in right now. So just like we're waiting for them virtual. No worries.
Kuha, you you hear me? Yes, could, it's perfect. Could, could we start with like personal introductions while we wait, please? Oh yes, you know what? I can actually start that. Uh, I even we spoke with our two speakers who are who still not joined. They said that they're almost in. They're just logging in right now. Yes, we have one. In. Uh, so, thank you so much for joining with us for this panel at the Change Maker Summit 2021. And this panel, understanding the global digital transformation. We generally really think about that everything is going online, but never really understand what it definitely actually means. So this panel is what we thought was really necessary in this thing. And thank you for joining us as panelists to discuss this topic. So we, the Changemaker Summit, is organized by About Those Big Dreams. We are a student initiative at Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. So before we go ahead with anything, I would like to give you a glimpse of what an institution is. We are established in the year 2008. A temple of learning at the heart of the city of Perth provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students. Stanley is affiliated to the prestigious Usmani University of Hyderabad. It provides all eligible engineering courses which are accredited by both NBA and NAC with a grade A. Stanley is also an ISO certified institution. Stanley ranks at one not fifth among the best engineering institutions of India and second best women's engineering college in all of South India. Stanley is currently expecting an autonomous status which shall raise the honor of this institution. Stanley has a strong belief to empower women and impact the world. It aims to empower girl students through professional education integrated with values and character to make an impact in this world. And we, about those big dreams, we are a student body under Stanley. And we were formed in April 2020, which of the early days of this pandemic, to shine a light of learning in all the young hearts of the students who are lost and are really confused about how to achieve their big dreams. The chance presented by ATBD in these difficult times is to learn more about the working world from people who are willing to share the story, like all our panelists today. So thank you so much for joining with us. It means a lot that all of us have joined us today. Now, I've introduced your, us to all of you, and I should do the same with all of you to our panelists, to our audience. We have with us Mr. Bappi Das. He has a combined professional experience of 30 years at IAS as Indian Air Forces and Civil. He worked at IAS for 20 years, 1990 to 2010, with aviation instruments and electrical systems, flight data recorder and data recovery, aircraft autopilot system and oxygen system. He was also in human resources and team management, aircraft servicing and maintenance, defense, safety, security for aviation, and others like that. In his civil experience from 2010 to 2020, he was the project manager, project coordinator for railway projects as ST, LT, and Traction. He acted as a consultant and entrepreneur for HT Power Solutions for 132, 33, 11 kV transmission and subtraction, section and commission. He was also involved in renewable energy and power solutions like solar power and hydropower projects. He is a marketing professional, motivational speaker, and a social and professional media expert. He has a political science from Utkal University, MBA in marketing from IGNOV, and has done automation experience engineering and PGDA. We also have with us Mr. Darshan Patel. He is a gardener, farmer, nature lover, people friendly, tech savvy person with few more skills to talk about. He is a PMB certified project manager and an SAP certified solution architect, a hands on programmer, technical analyst, taskmaster. He has sound knowledge of project planning, implementation, delivery process, and quality aspects, communication in language, people development, and sales are his favorite areas. His since 1996, he was working in the IT industry and since 2003 in SAP ERP. He is a subject matter expert for the company in the area of competency development, system architecture, SAP technology, operations, project delivery, and competency industry experience, which includes airlines, healthcare, 
pharmaceutical, manufacturing, electronics, automobile, AFS, and chemical. His specialties include SAP in technical, SAP in functional, project management, planning, negotiations, networking, executive leadership, mentoring, and team building. We also have with us Mr. Dimitri Ortiz. He's a computer scientist with extensive experience in computer networks, infrastructures, and software development. He's currently working as a robotic process automation solutions architect, helping small and medium businesses with their digital transformation, web development freelancing, and working on some personal projects. His goal is to promote the learning of computer programming by sharing free resources and working together with the nonprofit freecodecamp.org in order to help as many people to start a new career in software engineering available at no cost. He is fascinated about direct sales and digital marketing through the polygon speaker, writer, dancer, and student. We then have with us Mr. Eduardo Ibakashi and Roger Grills. Eduardo Roger Grills. He's a digital expert with a big passion for people and users, spreading the message, people first, process second, technology third. He explores, writes, speaks about life, work, technology with a focus on digital culture. The topic of his coming book, 20 plus years in the IT industry, an entrepreneur, a senior consultant, to teach leader in different positions for big corporates where they often refer to him as an entrepreneur. He refers himself as a colleague that will do anything it takes to make the best possible empowering innovative work culture that is diverse and inclusive. We also have with us Ms. Laurie McNeil. She's an accomplished business leader with a unique balance of strategic and hands-on operational expertise. She's a proven trailblazer who effectively leads and empowers diverse groups, including global sales teams, external business partners, and virtual cross-functional teams. Ms. Lori has 15 years plus of leading multifaceted global initiatives in the healthcare industry. She was recruited by Pharmacia Pharmaceutical and then by Pieces and at Pieces. She won an innovation award for her work on a pilot to develop a new line of revenue by creating a new business model to promote patient engagement in the therapeutic area of pain. As a result of that work, a new business unit was formed and she was appointed as the Director of Operations for the global sales team. She led efforts to develop the sales strategy for a national and international market and led global cross-functional teams to ensure seamless execution. In addition, Ms. Laurie is an accomplished leader of strategy, communications, marketing, operations, and training. We are also joined with, by Ms. Shilata Shankar. She's an HR professional with a rich experience of 23 years. She's a graduate in commerce, holds a diploma in management with specialization in human resources and master's degree in personal management. Ms. Shilata is a competent and resourceful professional of demonstrated success and excellent understanding of business dynamics. She has worked in industries such as banking, telecom, IT and ITES. She has been consulting and advising companies in all facets of HR. She has worked in various companies as HR herself. Her two 23 years of extensive experience in the industry has not only offered her the domain expertise and the best resources, but also lured her to work towards the major deficit of amplifying the employees, honing their skills, talents, and helping them climb the corporate ladder with effective solutions. She also teaches HR at MBA colleges. She also conducts training, workshops, and soft skills for corporate organizations, engineering, and management colleges. So those are the six panelists that we have been joined today for this panel, Understanding the Global Digital Transformation. So before anything else, I would like to one by one ask your opinion on this panel. So maybe we start with Mr. Bapi Das. Um, Mr. Bhakti, we, we are not able to hear you. Can you please come again? Yeah. Uh, do you hear me right now? Yes, yes, yes. okay. Fine. Uh, digitization and transmission, what do you can say? Um, 
uh, we we uh, make a change from this analog system to the digital age. It uh, brings us uh, so to do the, everything easily with before programming things. And uh, manual, it may have some problems. So uh, we made it uh, through digital so that we can have a click and do everything. Their programs like automations, industrial automation, office automation, whatever it is. All the things so we are going to introduce, even in railways, even in power sector, everywhere, even banking sector, we are doing it. So it's a good thing uh, that uh, we should go through this automation engineering and uh, digitalization. Basically, I mean to say, digitalization is the automation process. Uh, which can make us life very easy. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhakti Das. Uh, I would like to move on to Mr. Darshan Patil, if you can share some views on this panel. Yeah. Uh, hi, Zuha. Hello, so, sir. Uh, uh, very well. Uh, it's good morning to India. It's <laughs> getting late over here in Mexico. At the same time, I'm part of one birthday party. So <laughs> <laughs> I have just stolen some time from them and told that, okay, I'll be back within a while. So uh, allow me to finish my uh, five minutes. I will not take much time, but uh, would like to share some of my insights about the digital technology, which, is, which should be correlated with the human technology. Whatever we are doing for business, business 4.0 transformation, which is producing the goods, which are for human. But there is one devil which we are taming in our society, that is social media. That we are using it or abusing it. There is a very fine line between these two. And if it is not been corrected very soon, it will spoil the human race. The way it has been created and the way artificial intelligence, all the new era of utilizing or producing or processing the data is been used on this social media to make money by several organizations, maybe Facebook, maybe Google itself, maybe LinkedIn, which are free of charge right now, or they seem to be free of charge, but they are trillions dollar company. And they are using human brain or humans as a product, and we are just guinea pigs for them. So if we do not recognize this for now, I think within next five years, it will be too late. So this is my few words at this forum that collectively students need to come up with certain ideas that let us come, let us come all of us with several ideas where we do not become guinea pigs or scapegoat of it. It doesn't mean that we have to go out of it. We have to use it to stop them abuse it. So there is possibility of using or creating a coronavirus antidote by using the <coughs> stem of coronavirus. So similarly, we can use social media to create awareness to stop abuse of this digital medium. I think that's the very few words I need to say. And probably I need to drop, but I will definitely <laughs> love to watch the recording of it. Thank you so much, Mr. Darshan. Uh, I will now jump from Mexico to Guatemala. Uh, Mr. Dimitri, can you please share some views on the panel? Yes, hello, everyone, and uh, good morning, India. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you guys, uh, uh, enjoying this uh, panel from Guatemala all the way to India. I think it's beautiful to think about that concept because you know I mean it will be a little bit older for India it will, be, it will be very expensive. And so I think that there are many things that are happening around the world 
Um, I think the biggest challenge will be adaptation. Um, I believe that uh, technology is coming fast, and therefore that's the reason. Um, most of the times we fear what we don't understand. And I believe if that's the problem, then we need more education. Um, I've been in the field of IT since 98. Um, people were starting to use um, PCs at that time. At, that, at this point, it was only uh, terminals, some terminals, screen screens. You know, it was like very little option to work um, in a very robust uh, legacy systems as AS400 mainframes and such for big corporations. But then the PC came around and uh, I erected one of the first uh, um, collaborative uh, networks uh, integrated with, um, with mainframes and is, uh, you know, using it through in a software emulation. And uh, we gained the old, the old with the new, and it was like, uh, you know, a transition. So everything has to be a transition. We don't have to digest everything at once. We don't have to, you know, take big bites. I mean, we can, we can, we can, we can definitely address it and approach it in the most personal way. But I do believe that we live in the best time in history and that, that needs to be recognized. I mean, I think it's wonderful that technology is reaching places that it never had before. Um, the internet, uh, you know, I mean, everything, and, and, and you know, we got to remember from the end of time when they discovered fire, that was the best thing. But they were recognizing it doesn't have repercussions, but we didn't stop using it. Like, you know what? Uh, if you're not using an electric stove, you're still using gas stoves and there's fire in your house every day. So, you know, you can look at it that way. You know, we evolved, we, we, we learned to use it. We became responsible. We made it. We made it a cultural thing to understand that it could be dangerous if it's not controlled. So I think that uh, the fourth industrial revolution is bring, It's here, and uh, we need to help everyone, especially us in the in the industry, and especially us that are professionals that have had experience in business, and we have seen also um, how uh, amazing software can be, because it can take us to do things, it can allow us to do amazing things, faster, better, more, more accurate. We talked, uh, Bobby mentioned a little bit about um, process automation. I'm a head solution for a company that does uh, robotic process automation. We look for, obviously, uh, discover the best um, pro business processes to automate so that I, I believe that the mind was not meant to be repetitive. Uh, we're slaves to our work in, in our office. And, you know, some people are just a little afraid. They're thinking, you know, this is going to take away. But if you think about the collaboration, you know, before we used to compete against each other. Now the best mentality and the best approach in a world collaboration is collaboration, not, not com competition. When we have collaboration, then we know that we can grow so much, so, so much faster. I mean, we find power in numbers. And now internationally, we're, getting, we're becoming that. I mean, look at this. Is, this is testament of what I'm talking about. This was not possible even last year, believe me. Yes. I mean, we, we're adapting, we're slowly adapting, but we need to give it a chance. We need to educate ourselves because we cannot have opinions on something we haven't tried. That's a little bit too presumptuous. I think that we need to involve, involve business people in, in, into technology because it should, there shouldn't be a, 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 you know, silos. There shouldn't be any, any walls between us. There should be a collaboration, open dialogue, open collaborations. Luckily now it's better than when I started. We, we had, oh man, if you're IT, you can communicate, you can speak. And, and, and business people couldn't understand your, your dialogue. It, it was like, wow, you know, we, how, how do we communicate? Now we have mediators, we have project managers that specialize with that. So I think we're heading towards an amazing time. And I think that if we find the benefits and, uh, you know, we're all going to be scared. We're scared of something that we don't see or we can't. But you know what? Look at the look at the how, how we have come to this this far. And, uh, mm. you know, you, you would never thought it impossible. You know, I mean, 100 years ago, we were working the land with our hands. Now, you know, we're working with our hands, doing intellectual stuff, things. You know, we're using our mind. Right? We were creating creators. Therefore, we need to use our imagination, creativity. That's something that machines have not caught up on yet. That's a huge advantage. And we create machines. We create software. We create the digital transformation. So what we need is more 
collaboration, like inclusion. We need more women in the field. We have very few women. It's incredible. A woman um, discovered, uh, came up with pro programming, yet that's the least gender we have. I don't understand. I think if we were to exploit the amazing, incredible minds that women have, because it, it's different. But different, what I mean by that sometimes is advantage, because we are limited to how we think. And it's bad news if we're the ones that are majority, I believe. I think we need way more diversity because it's going to create more wonderful things. Women, by, 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 by instinct, have this like organizational minds and abilities, you know, uh, instincts that shine and need to come in technology. So that's why it's beautiful and wonderful to know who I'm speaking to. And I, and I think that there's a wonderful, amazing world waiting for us. As long as we are willing to leverage technology to better our world. I mean, we're talking about flying cars here. We need to get the, this, this traffic here. I mean, you know, this traffic needs to get out and get away. You know, we need to, we need to make things better. We need to dis discover things that, we, that are at our fingertips. We just need to push it a little more. But again, we are the ones that create it. So we are the ones that have to regulate it. We are the ones that have to decide in unison. We cannot have minorities deciding the future. Mm. Of technology. We need to have everyone's collaboration. We need to have everyone's point of view. We need to have everyone's needs clear so that we know where we're going because this is going to be global. We are getting connected more and more. Information is being shared every day and it's reaching <laughs> now. So it's wonderful. So I'm very excited and looking forward ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dimitri. Those were some great words, and also quite flatly you went in between. Thank you. <laughs> now from Guatemala, we jump to Norway. <laughs> Ms. Eduardo, thank you. We're here, looking, here, looking forward to hear you now. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Thank you, Dimitri, for calling and waking me up today because <laughs> it's very it's very early or late, I would say, in Norway now. It's like... Yeah, so here we go. I have a lot of coffee today, so let's do it. Uh, I came to Sweden when I was five years old, and uh, my parents were very academical, so they decided to live with Swedish only, so we could integrate. But they didn't calculate in their academical calculation how that would affect me as a colored person, right? So I suffered hell, you can say, from, like, I don't wash, like, I pray to God that my children don't experience what I had to experience, but they gave me a gift. I had to hide in the library, so I started to read. When I was 11, 12 years old, I thought that Gabriel Garcia Marquez was a hero. My, my like classmate, they thought that Spider-Man was a hero, you understand? <laughs> and what I did was that I started to find the answer, what is wrong with humanity? Like, what is wrong with these people? Like, why are they hurting me? Why do we have apartheid? Why do we have all these things? Like, how can human land on the moon and be so stupid when it comes to its own humanity, you know? And still today, we're still there. That's the problem, you know? Like, technology is not the problem. It's humans. Always been human that is the problem. Never technology. It's, it's, it's not technology that sell itself. Like, it, it's not technology that take our privacy away and sell our data to big corporates, right? That was like Mark Zuckerberg and all his fancy border of directors. It, it was not like technology that decided that. It's not technology that decide that AI will go bad, you know, that it will spy on us. It's the government that will do that. It's the secret police that will do that. It's humans that is the issue here. It's not never technology. And that, that is what annoys me the most in the whole debate that when I was in, I started my first company at 2000, I started university at 98, like, and when I was, like, watching The Matrix for the first time, I went to the cinema. Could someone please turn off their mic because it's a lot of disturbance? Oh. So, when The Matrix come out, I was in the university, I was in the peak, I was, like, in the, like, I was already ha running a company. I actually started a company, I was nominated to Future Telecom Store in second year, all others was PhD, actually. That was really strange, I can tell you, but I never seen myself more than another human. Like, 
title role doesn't mean anything to me. What it, what they, the only thing that means to me is what you can achieve as a human for others, actually, or for society. So going to see The Matrix, I was sitting watching that movie, and I was so angry and sad. And my, my, my classmates, they were like, Eduardo, look at the effects. And I was like, are you not seeing what I'm seeing? They're talking about us, like we're living that matrix. We are the ones sleeping. Don't you see that? And this was the most fun thing. I was building the matrix with my classmates. We were the <laughs> telecom engineers, actually. <laughs> so digital transformation for me is for humans to wake up. Like companies need to understand, we need to have decentralized uh, leadership. We need to talk about people because as long as it's people that are buying and paying for the product, they should matter the most. As long as Eduardo, Dimitri, and all these amazing designers, programmers are doing the products with passion and love, we should matter the most and nothing else. Any company that don't understand this are getting it wrong, I can tell you. That is the fact. Like That is how it is. You know? So that is the problem. We need to humanize leadership. We need to humanize the workplace. And humans must stop act so stupid and use their intelligence. That, that's how I see it. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Eduardo. Uh, now I'll jump to Ms. Sorry McNeil. If you can please share your opinions on this panel. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here today. Uh, this morning for some of you here in India, this evening for um, one book myself here out of the US. So I think it's fantastic in regards to some of the things that have been happening with the global digital transformation. Notice I said some of the things, and I agree with my esteemed panelists when we're talking about um, how it's so important to humanize the aspect of the global aspect of interacting. Because I think the beauty of this is a, a great example, Dimitri, I think you said it yourself, where we're all here together and just a few years back and, and even more than that a decade ago, it would have been hard to imagine all of us being here in these different time zones and all of these countries. And yet here we are today to be able to have this type of discussion. So on one hand, it's fantastic that it is connecting us. But at the same time, there is a disconnection that can happen unless you're intentional about it. And so, Eduardo, I think that that's the point that you're making here when you're talking about humanizing it. It's being intentional. So I think that as we continue to move forward in this digital world, um, and especially from a global aspect, and goodness knows that COVID is going to um, make this even more prevalent as we move forward throughout 2021 and beyond. Um, what it looks like today is going to very, look very different um, a year from now and, and the years going on from there. So with the organizations that I work with, um, one, as a matter of fact, right now um, has an organization where half the colleagues are based in the U.S., the other half are based in India. Um, one of the things I work with them is to make sure that they're really understanding and appreciating some of the differences in regards to culture. Because what I find with organizations now is so important because when you think about the global digital transformation, you've got four aspects. You've got the business process that comes into play, the business model, the domain, but then also this cultural and organizational component. And that to me, just like my colleagues have said, have been a very crucial and important part um, because for you to really take advantage of that, it does take intention. So. For example, something that is simple as making sure that when you're working on global teams or global projects, trying to understand the culture of some of the others that are on the team, understanding something as simple as national holidays um, with the one team that I work on um, very recently, it was Diwali. And so with Diwali, we had to have some education for the folks in the U.S. to better understand more about the customs and what was taking place with the holiday and what it represented, beautiful traditions. And at the same time, it was taking place very close to Thanksgiving. And so it was a wonderful opportunity for these groups to come together and have this understanding, this opportunity to share and therefore build a stronger connection through the digital aspect. And so think about the ways that you can use that. And 
I think it's really important as well when it comes. And like I said, these are simple things, but yet they're so important. The fact that when you have panelists right here and that you can see us, that's the big difference instead of just people turning off their camera and maybe multitasking, but not really seeing each other. When you're not face to face and COVID is certainly changing that for all of us right now. So we don't have um, that beauty and appreciation to be able to be face to face or just be right across from the table. Um, and at the same time, we wouldn't have been able to do that anyway without it being very costly and a lot of effort for us to all be there um, at Stanley University to have this kind of discussion. So with that being said, you have to think about those little aspects that you can do, whether it is being able to turn on a camera and being able to see each other face to face, utilizing certain things with the chat to be able to discuss with that. But then also, like I said, the other beautiful things of humanizing it, just like Eduardo had said, and that can be appreciating the cultures and really sharing those things and being intentional about team building. That to me is really going to help that. Um, in my studies at Harvard, when we had global students coming from all over, um, sometimes for the weekend together, that was the best part of the coursework was being able to meet people from all over the globe. So take advantage of that because the beauty of the global digital training is the diversity. So don't shy away from it, but make sure that you're getting the most out of it that you possibly can. And that is the beauty of it. And at the same time, Dimitri, I want to go back to what you said about women. Women make everything better. <laughs> I did a panel recently that was global women's business summit, and we were talking about womenomics. And I will say when it comes to womenomics, it's more than aspect around uh, the women and the creativity and the way they go about things. It's also good for business. It's great when it comes to businesses to be able to have women not just in the workforce, but also in positions of leadership. And so the more that we can do to elevate women and help them grow and understand and flourish, it's not just going to help them from an individual level, but it will from a cultural family unit, but then also from a national and global aspect of that as well, too. So I just had to throw that in for the <laughs> well, I know we're here for Change Maker Summit. <laughs> it's a passion of mine, both change management and women's development. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Ms. Sorry. That, uh, I love the way you speak. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we'll come back to India. Uh, we have Ms. Chileta, and I would love if you could share some of your opinions about the panel with us. Good morning this, um, and good evening to the rest of the world out there. Um, thanks to Laurie and Dimitri what, and uh, Edru, Eduardo who spoke about um, culture, who spoke about uh, women and who spoke about transformation. Um, I'll go to the steps where I'm most comfortable with uh, as a human resource professional. Today, everything is, needs to be digitized. Everything needs to be um, human connected, but also technology uh, um, thrown in for the good, because uh, whether it is performance management systems or onboarding or even interviews and recruitments, that becomes a very crucial thing. Uh, gone are the days where we used to have hundreds of people coming into our uh, office spaces and having one-to-one -one interactions and one-to-one -one recruitments or interviews. Today in this world, in this dynamic world, and thanks to COVID, um, things have changed uh, dry, dynamically and dramatically. In that sense, you know, it's it's futile to have uh, uh, ask candidates to come to our offices and have have interviews conducted. So that being the case, uh, recruitments, performance management systems, and uh, like Laurie rightly said, uh, we are uh, you know we have offices in India and branches across the world. So how do I measure my uh, teammates or team members or uh, employees' uh, uh, performance? So in that sense, uh, the technology has, has, uh, technology has uh, vastly helped us. Um, also in the context of comp and benefits, compensation benefits. Now the compensation salary that may, uh, even within India, it's so varied. 
vis-a-vis -vis technologies, vis-a-vis -vis cities, etc. So in that sense, I need to have the technology thrown in for the good. And I, um, while yes, there has to be a humanization to it, like um, um, Darshan said, but I don't think um, uh, I will agree with Darshan in that context. Saying uh, human, uh, the humanization should be shouldn't indulge in the technology. It has to go hand in glove. Um, thanks to uh, Dimitri, what he praised the women. Um, I will agree with Laurie what she said in the context of culture. Today, the example that she gave was uh, Diwali and Thanksgiving. You know. The, 15, 20 years back, uh, to educate people on Diwali or Dashra was a task for especially for HR people. Today, now we can upload videos, you know, uh, pictures and say this is what our culture is. And we can also give up our writing on why we celebrate a Dashra or a Diwali or a Holi. Mm -hmm. And it becomes so much more integrated for uh, our colleagues across the world. And they become a part of the Indian culture. But likewise, when I get to learn about Thanksgiving or uh, any other uh, festival across the world, for me, it is a learning. And for me, it's more of a culture exchange than not just, oh, my colleague is in Guatemala, my colleague is in some, in some other world. So it becomes a big family unit. And that becomes very easy to work with um, coming from different cultures. Um, like Laurie rightly said, um, you know, culture is very important and women who are propagating that is becoming more, even more important. Um, uh, why I say this is men don't give so much of importance to culture. Probably they'll give it to you. They'll give you an upload of it in one or two sentences and be done with it. We can, we can extend it in the larger context with uh, dramatizations, telling, etc. So that becomes much more interesting for the uh, for the person who does not know others' culture. Um, the second part is uh, that I want to talk about is, um, you know, digital transformation. If you take the banking sector, it's become so, so, so easy for us. Um, 15 years back or 18 years back, I used to stand in long queues to deposit money or withdraw money. And today, then came the ATMs, then came the digitization, then we, we are all today transacting online. So uh, this is very important. And uh, one more point that I would want to add is um, we were interacting with the president of um, Franklin Templeton, India. And he said Indians, uh, particularly, are not shying away from technology. If you bring in a new, another new technology, they're not shying away from it. They're willing to learn and they're not scared of losing their jobs. Saying, okay, this doesn't work, this, uh, this will work and I will get on to another platform. Visa be the U West, that's what he specifically said. The West is a little more um, uh, closed in the sense, I want to work on AI and I know that, uh, I know AI, I want to work on it. While India is more open-minded and willing to learn um, or step into things and learning things and moving on to another technology. So these are three of my points. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Shilata. That was lovely listening to you. And about your second point about uh, women being over there. So is it like men need to step up or women need to just let the men, the, let, the men should let women handle it? Um, I, I will agree with both the points because women are by, uh, like uh, Dimitri said, they're very instinctive. They're very compassionate also. As leaders, you need to be compassionate. Um, I will agree with Laudy what she said. She did not mention the word compassion, but she meant it. Um, she's, you know, in, in, we are very inherently instinctive. We are very inherently compassionate. And we, you know, if I may use this word, we, are, we have a sixth sense. We can understand, uh, uh, you know, foresee things in a lot of ways, whether it is emotions, whether it's how businesses need to function, because even if businesses need to function in a more technology way and all agreed, but all there is a human humanness to the whole um, involvement of technology or involvement of business or growing of business. So in that sense, I think women are more um, understand things a little more better, uh, are more compassionate. So it's it's works for me both ways. And um, um, like Dimitri said, uh, we need women leaders at the top a lot more. Thank you so much, Ushilata. 
and it was lovely listening to all of your opinions on the panel and thank you for joining this panel understanding the global digital transformation now uh, since when we talk about transformation is generally in every sector so first off i would like to direct uh, my first question to mr bappi das you are from the renewable sector and know a lot about that area can you actually please elaborate on the digital transformation that is affecting this renewable sector what have i seen before we were analog if you are like mama lata shankar ma he can increase his volume please Uh, if i say uh, uh say from analog system like uh, banking sector he said uh, we have many times uh, to uh, be on the queue and now it is atm and everything before that uh, the things uh, we do in on industrial sector what you are doing actually Uh, there are plenty of manpower there are plenty of people now we have cranes with motor and gen- generators everything we make it automa- automated automation and uh, and the things are done very uh, clearly and uh, with the program as uh, dimitri said uh, yes we have the uh, software we have the programs so that uh, made it uh, without and uh, without any uh, humor in fact without any uh, step uh, with uh, so 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 safety and uh, with security so in everywhere that uh, this uh, digitalization we have the security uh, we have the cloud system that uh, nobody can uh, thief or uh, theft of uh, things in the from our accounts and everything so if uh, we have uh, now it is uh, digital lockers and everything we have even we have the digital wallet so it is very easy to save our time it is cost uh, costing so less if you are going to, now we, are, we both we all are sitting together if we go there only so we will have uh, time we will have we, we have to waste our time we have to go the, there we, we have to uh, spend money now it is uh, so uh, less cost and uh, there are many more things like uh, hr is a system and giving a job or interviewer and we are saving our time we are saving our money we are saving our, uh, we are saving our uh, security so that we are not going to the road we are not getting into the accidents and everything so everything we are doing and very very digital is the thing we very, make it very minute we need it in seconds okay we can we can divide it into into seconds we need it 5 seconds okay we will be finished it will be finished by 5 seconds not human we have to okay i'll try it to do so machine and uh, digitization it's uh, very very closely now it is people are working on it and uh, i think uh, the very soon we are we are going to do anything do uh, don't to do anything uh, we have to only program the things and uh, sit and watch what is happening and we have to control the things do we go to the digital system up to see the step we have to learn it fast as we, as we are very very we are human we can learn everything anything so uh, we have to learn it before because the safety and security if you are not learning it there is safety as, as mr dadan said if you are not not learning we are having a smartphone with hand so we may misuse it somebody else it misuse it for you so it it become danger for life so we have to learn it very necessary it will become so vital life as well as society we have to learn it uh, very very minute and we have to be very confident about that what we are going to, going to do because uh, if we are going in industry we don't know what is programming going on we don't know anything about this uh, automation and everything the uh, system is running running and we are just entering in fact we get this stop So we have to very much uh, careful about this uh, transformation before we have to learn it and uh, within a minimum time we will finish our many jobs <coughs> for us we can make 24 hundred hours within a day so digital is the amazing i have experienced since aircraft to the uh, railways and uh, power sector 
If we if we go for the system before the aircraft is at this one. It manually. Pilot will say that I have that altitude, that uh, speed, and everything. You don't understand. If you see it digitally, you understand what happened there in the air. Here also, if railway, one, one train is going, if you are not, uh, if you are not uh, uh, watching the things, uh, the driver cannot do anything. Everything is digitalized. There is a green light. There is a red light. They they don't know what is happening, but everything computer is doing. The digitalization and the programming. So after uh, they are uh, yeah, they are making very easy for. We hope uh, we will we will go for a very quick. You can watch this. They say be much careful about that. I don't hear anything actually. Uh, time, right? this right now I'm saying. Please come again, Miss Puppy. Before uh, we go for uh, emulation, we have to be very much careful. In the things we are getting relaxed, we have to take our time for learning for that. We have to very much confirm and confident about the things, what we need to do actually, what we are doing. As, as I said, smartphone. Before handling a smartphone, we have to learn for six days, eight days, one month. Then we have to. And what you are going to do, you, you take your own time and give uh, and do it very carefully. And because digital lesson is not that easy, you are thinking. You once you click it, everything out of your hand. So how secured, how uh, safe before uh, before doing all this digital lesson transmission, transformation, or everything. So you have to be very much careful about that and uh, learn it perfectly. Everybody is not an engineer. Everybody is not software professional. But uh, as a, as everybody can learn anything. So they have to learn it before uh, using it, what I mean to say. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's going to very fast. And we are all are very, very smarter now. <laughs> you can uh, Thank do anything. You. Thank you so much, Mr. Papi. That is actually a really important thing that many people even give up on getting themselves digitalized, but they, they should actually keep up. And there are really good examples that you used. Thank you so much. I would like to next take my question to Mr. Eduardo. Um, there's a lot of transformations that is happening, and there are a lot of technologies that are coming up. So can you tell us like what would you expect in maybe the next five years, the next 10 years, or maybe just a few more years, let's say, in the field of engineering and business through digital transformations? Yeah. Could you please mute the other participants when I speak, please, because... Okay. When we went over, uh, like, to electricity from, like, steam power as the main source of, like, energy, uh, like, in the industry, right? When everybody agreed that, oh, electricity is the future, it took 30 to 40 years until we actually electrified the industry. That's the same amount of time that it takes to remove all the leaders from top level one, two, and three, actually. And that is the biggest problem, you know, like paradigm shift takes a lot of time because a lot of leaders don't understand what's going on, you know. And they try to stop evolution. That, that's what has happening, you know. So that's the main problem. Like most corporates today in any country in the world, they don't understand co uh, like well-being. They don't understand inclusion. They don't understand diversity. They don't understand the less they can do it. You know, they still have like hierarchy, like toxic hierarchy. Like I will tell you what is a positive hierarchy. That is what I do. It's called empowering leadership. I never talk about what we do. My team talk what they do. You know, I'm not a boss. I don't like bosses like me and them. We will clash. I can tell you that. I'm, I like leaders, you know. Leader le means you lift other people up about you. And you understand it's not about you. It's not about your title, your role. It's about other people. Because that's what we're going to. We're going to decentralize leadership totally, you know. And all these leaders, they try to stop that because they love their titles. They love their role so much. That's not the only thing they have, you know. That's annoying me because a company is formed not by a title or roles. 
it, it, it's formed by the purpose that a company do, right? Like Tesla, for example, they have a purpose, you know? All these companies have a purpose and they're not driven this way, you know? And that, that's the main problem, you know? Like leaders do not understand and they try to like, how can you say? They don't give HR resources to handle inclusion and diversity. They tell HR, okay, now you need to be inclusive and diverse, but they don't give them the resources. HR don't know how to handle conflicts. Usually what people call me when a leader misbehaves, they will come to me. They don't go to HR because HR, they know that they can't handle the problem. They don't, that is what's happening. Like they let skilled jerks like bosses on top level two, three what to like misbehave to other people. I don't tolerate that. You don't do that to my people. You know, I don't care like what role you have or in which industry I am because I'll either the leader's only obligation is to create an empowering haven for their tribe, you know? And that is based on what? It's, it's based on, uh, actually, this is research I'm talking about. I'm not talking, and the research I'm talking about has been there for 30, 40 years. Like, carrot on the stick, it means if you perform more, I pay you more. If you don't perform, I will punish you. That was gone, like, like ages ago, you know? People today are motivated by three things, actually. Autonomy, purpose, and mastery. That is, that is how it works, you know? And that is reality. But tell me, how many companies in your country apply this? Not many, right? In Latin America, less even. So that is the problem, you know? So the more leaders wake up, uh, if they don't wake up, they will be left behind because the smartest people... They choose where to work. I choose where I want to work. It's not like I will beg Elon Musk for a job, you know? Like, that is the fact. You know? The same with Dimitri. Like, intelligent people, they choose. So you need to treat them nice to start with, you know? So th th there's so many problems, I don't even know where to begin. Like, first of all, leaders, companies must understand, uh, read the research. It's out there. What is motivation? What is purpose? What is true leadership? And what is empowering, uh, what is healthy hierarchy, what is empowering leadership, because that's the future. And decentralized uh, organization, that's also the future. So that's the thing, you know, like they need to start to read, learn, like, because this is coming, the world is changing and they can't stop that, you know. Thank you so much, Mr. Eduardo, and thank you, Mr. Dimitri, for pointing that out for me. Uh, that was actually quite insightful into the industry a lot. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Dimitri, uh, you work in the RPA a lot. Um, so can you actually expand on how this RPA supports and influences the digital transformation and how it's integrated into it? Yes, uh, thank you. Right. Um, I'm actually directly... Uh, involved in overseeing, overseeing the projects as a solutions architect. I help, uh, I help from, the, from the discovery calls to understanding um, this, uh, and actually this, uh, researching the company, understanding their, their vision, understanding their structure, their model, their tragedies, um, understanding what, they, what has worked for them. And it's, it, 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 it's really a lot of research and really a lot of questions. I believe that the reason why I do what I do is because now we're getting to the point where we're finding IT professionals that can actually communicate. What I mean by that is ability to listen, not to open your mouth with intention. Because uh, for, for so long, uh, there has been that gap, as I mentioned, between IT department um, when I started uh, over two decades ago and uh, the way it's being handled now. I believe that... Uh, there are there are uh, there are more people, diverse people coming into technology, and uh, with with more um, with different with different ideas, different perspectives, and so therefore I believe that it's becoming a, a, you know a lot better. It's improving from when we were a few years ago, and uh, that's part of the reason why I think that uh, the communication is is key to anything. I mean, any world problem we have right now. If you think about it, if there a direct and honest communication, I'm not saying it would be the end of our problem, but it would definitely be a better world. Communication is one of the most important things. If you think about it, even programming, 
to do with communication because it's language. I speak a few languages and I love mastering that communication because if you think about it, it's the most important skill we develop no matter what industry we, we are in. It doesn't matter what part of our life we're talking about. So I think that that's one key factor that we need to understand as diversity as we're talking about a global participation and collaboration. Um, I believe that uh, in, in places like LinkedIn, for example, I bowed myself to share cultural videos and content because I believe that every one of us has the responsibility to share that to the world. And I just hope that they get educated by chance. I think we all have a responsibility to, to um, strive to understand each other. And that's communication going back. So um, as, as a solutions architect, I talked with leaders, uh, um, decision makers, stakeholders in general, and the communication has to be clear about where they want to go and what they want to do. One of the, one of the challenges that I have found is exactly with that. Some of the leaders don't tell their employees exactly what's going on because some of the people, and again, like I said, people feel what they don't understand. So the worst thing you can do as a leader is not be frank and direct with your people and not tell them exactly what we're doing just because they may not understand it or may, they may fear it. With, with automation, that's one of the challenges that is out there right now. The, the ability for employees to understand digital transformation, the fact that it's going to take, that it's, go, that it's coming fast and it's going to drastically change the way we do business. But again, I want to remind you, we just came from 2020. We just came from drastic changes. So as you can see, the difference between animals and us is the ability of adaptation, adapting to what is presented to us, the challenges we're facing. And right now, the challenges I think we're facing is the fact that not, not enough people are involved. In the past, again, this division with business and technology was too big for us, and we didn't go too far. The limitations weren't just hardware or software. There were also silos. There were also lack of communication. There, there's also, uh, you know, antiquated ways, uh, absolute, uh, obsolete mentality that does not help the process of evolution and innovation. Um, we should never be afraid of making things better. We should never be afraid of using our skills to a different level. I think we should be very um, ambitious and clear about our goals and our, and, 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 and our final destiny, that we want to make sure that we start to change the things that haven't worked and start to implement new ideas. Not be afraid of implementing these new ideas because you know what? We, I think sometimes we romance our past too much. We are comfortable and we like to be comfortable. And when, when that is challenged, sometimes we, we step back and we reject it. And we sometimes are afraid of it. We don't trust it. So I think that in, um, these, uh, with, with uh, robotic process automation, what I love about the company that I work for, is that we're targeting small to medium-sized businesses. Before, only big enterprises used to get this privilege of implementing this expensive software. Now, it's beautiful because now I'm seeing that it's going to be able, uh, the small and medium-sized businesses are going to be able to also have it. We're working on that. We're working on cheaper software, uh, associations and collaborations with different companies. Because I believe that competition is what makes us innovate. When we allow monopolies, when we allow dominions, when we allow a very few to make the calls, as 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 uh, as it was spoken earlier, when we allow certain um, monopolies and certain tech companies to to really have too much power, I think it, I think we need to understand the repercussions of that, and the fact that we need to be involved, not just be uh, on the sidelines. It's it's for us, so we need to be part of it, and uh, I think that we need to give uh, we need to share that message with everyone that we need to innovate and we need to evolve into what this fourth evolution is bringing it's bringing opportunity it's bringing change it's bringing accuracy it's bringing uh enhancement it's bringing completely mind-changing game-changing uh different routes that we haven't explored yet and we should not be always looking at the pessimistic stuff like I, there's always going to be i mean tell me one thing that's perfect nothing any structure, any 
workflow, any uh, style of work, there is no such thing as perfect. We've, it's taken us a while to get to where we're at. But I'm very excited to have an optimistic view about the future because we are having, we are being able to leverage technology more than ever now. Technology, I think, is one of the easiest fields to jump into right now as well, without degrees. Yeah. That's why I promote that. And I'm very, ha I, I, like I said, I'm excited for what's what's coming because you know what? I think we've been slow. We've been slowly dragging our feet a little bit, doing this repetitious things instead of using our minds. Our minds are incredible. We use very little of them. We need to explore the mind. We need to just use our creativity to the fullest extent and, 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 and capacity. And we need to bring that to the business. And we need to bring empathy, something that machines will not bring. We need to be strong where machines are weak. And we need to let machines be strong where they can be. And that collaboration is going to take us to digital transformation. Thank you so much, Ms. Dimitri, Mr. Dimitri. You speak very passionately about collaboration, even throughout your conversation, throughout your talk. You were just really emphasizing on collaboration and on working together and on integrating everything. So I really, really appreciate that, actually. Um, next, I would like to uh, speak with Ms. Laurie McNeil. Uh, you, as a strategic leader, you are leading strategic, uh, strategic advisor. So what will be your advice when it comes to customer satisfaction or sales satisfaction through the digital transformation of things these days, especially? Well, so if it comes to customer satisfaction through um, the digital transformation, I think that there's a lot of things to consider with this. And I think that it's also not just the customer satisfaction. I think it goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago, just as far as employee satisfaction. You know, this goes back to, I think, what Eduardo had referenced in regards to um, the paradigm shift and what's taking place with that. We're, we're looking at multiple stakeholders. And if you look at this strategically, and if you look at it from an integrated aspect, that's what I think is so key when it comes to the digital transformation. Um, when I work with a client and I'm thinking about change, you know, we're, this is a change maker summit. So let's try to put it in the context of transformation and change that's taking place there. Um, I, I want to just broaden this a little bit um, to think about it, not just from a customer perspective, but all of the different stakeholders that are involved when change is taking place. Because number one, we talked before about the importance of purpose. Um, Eduardo, I think that was something that you'd referenced as well, is, is something that's really important um, to the folks that are involved with that. And I, I want to emphasize that that's what's important, whether that's internally or externally. And quite honestly, it might just not be as simple. It, it never is, quite honestly. It's never as simple as just a few stakeholders involved. It could be uh, vendors business partners, it could be communities that are involved with that. So when we're looking at transformation and the change that's taking place, there's a lot of complexity that's involved with that. Now, one of the other aspects when it comes to the satisfaction of this, whether we're talking about the customer as a stakeholder or internal, um, Dimitri, you were talking about the importance of communication. And I agree with you 100% on that. And so when it comes to the vision, that happens to be one of the most important things. But one of the things that I always talk about when it comes to change and when it comes to transformation is to also think about this from a perspective of the five stages of grief. Now, some of you may be familiar with that and maybe it's just in one context because this is a psychological model that was introduced decades ago. And it was specifically done when a psychologist was looking at um, someone that actually had terminal illness and the different stages that they were going through before they actually accepted the fate and what was going to happen. Then the model was looked at from a caregiver's perspective. And guess what? It's continued to evolve. And you can apply the same methodology when you look at change in regards to a business setting. Why is that? Because, um, Dimitri, just as you were talking about, it's that fear of change. And so it's, it's almost a loss. And so it doesn't really matter, quite honestly, if it's from a customer perspective as the stakeholder, if it's an internal perspective from an employee, 
or what have you, there can be that feeling of loss because it is that uncertainty. It's not knowing what's going to take place. So therefore, um, you have to think about the different stages that they're going through, whether that happens to be anger, denial, depression, bargaining, or acceptance. And guess what? It's not linear. And um, so you have to think about the time that it's going to take to be able to even get to the satisfaction, to be able to get to the vision. You have to allow for that, that paradigm shift, just that, as Eduardo had referenced a few moments ago, and be able to think about what is causing some of the fear. And so those are some things um, to think about because another psychological model, and this happens to be my wheelhouse, thinking about psychology um, and how this applies to it. And I think even if we're looking at engineering, you, you have to think about how the psychology layers into these things because it's the human side of that. So think about another psychological model that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, and at least you're familiar with a little bit, and that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, so this is important when it comes to change, because a lot of times for communicating what the change, what the transformation is going to be, the um, very top, the pyramid, that's the self-actualization, that's basically going to be the purpose. And that is what leaders, as they start to communicate transformation, change and what's taking place, they're already there because they have the vision and they're trying to bring others there for the purpose. But now what they have to be able to do is to satisfy um, the most basic needs. And that's quite honestly, survival. It's also thinking about the security. So I, I talk about this as well, because when we think about a global transformation and from a digital perspective, you have to consider what can be done to make it more inclusive. Because um, the other thing, Dimitri, that you were talking about was not having enough people involved. Um, in some of these regards. And so the more that you can make them feel part of the process, that's going to help them also feel more secure and feel like they belong. And that's also moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that's why I think it's important as we're considering the digital aspect, let's throw in some psychological um, understanding of this as well. So whether we want to layer in these different methodologies and models, looking at it from the five stages of grief, if we're looking at it from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those are some really key things. And then ultimately, that's where you can start to finally get more towards the satisfaction that you were talking about. And it's that truth, it's the understanding, and that will eventually help everybody else start to get on board with whatever change that is. Um, and wherever we're going to go down this journey of digital transformation um, from here and beyond, because it's going to be a long journey. And just like Dimitri talked about in regards to the change, it's going to be important to adapt. And so we have to constantly think about that adaption. But at the same time, um, just like Eduardo had said, think about the paradigm shift that's going to be taking place along the way, time and time and time again. And so that's where these other things come into play. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Laurie. Uh, that was a very interesting perspective to to think, even think about psychology and also studying that in the entire process. Uh, thank you so much uh, about for your talk. Um, next, I would like to ask Ms. Sheelata, um, there are a lot of things that we're talking about collaboration and communication also over here. So I would actually like to ask you, how do you think that is important in this entire transformation of moving towards digitalization? You're, you're muted. Yeah. Um, thanks for the thanks for that question, uh, Zuha. It was a very interesting question. And like uh, uh, Dimitri and uh, Zuha, Laurie mentioned, um, being in HR, I think communication is pivotal uh, and the most basic uh, key factor mm -hmm. in HR professional. Um, the reason I say that is, um, you know, I have last two decades of my work experience, I've constantly interacted with my teammates, my employees, uh, irrespective of what hierarchy I have held at that point in time. I've always uh, interacted a lot with my uh, employees and I've um, 
understood the pulse of an employee. What I mean by that is, you know, there have been many times uh, that when I've gone back to their respective reporting managers and told him that he's not going to be, he's not happy, he may leave in a short time. And uh, the reporting manager brushes me off. And three months later, he says, you were right. He's, go he's put in his papers. So it is very important to constantly interact with the employees, constantly communicate with them. And it's not like uh, Eduardo said, it's not boss subordinate uh, uh, role that you have to fulfill. You may be his boss or her boss, but it's very important to say that. And this is my first um, a uh, line that I tell all my uh, new new members or new company that I join that whatever designation I hold is only for the paper. And you and me are friends today. Starting from today, you and me are friends. So people have come and spoken about their um, boyfriends, girlfriends. I'm the agony aunt in more ways than one. But that gives me a connect to the people. Uh, that bridges the gap. That breaks the walls. So for me, uh, why, you know, I switch off when they talk about their boyfriends and girlfriends. And uh, but for them, I, they feel that I can go to Sri Lata Ma'am and talk about anything. She will be listening to me. She will be compassionate. And um, as an HR professional or in the world of digital today, we are sitting across the world and having teams across the world. I think communication is the most important factor. Um, why? is not just in the context of understanding your employees, but understanding how they function, what is required, what is not required. And uh, like Dimitri rightly said, is in this dynamic world of um, digitization, transformation, uh, 2020 has given us so many avenues where we have been working from home. Then how do you understand the pulse of the employee? You know, you constantly interact with them. It's, uh, it's not just going to say, okay, how many reports have you done at the end of the day? But uh, through webinars and through um, um, phone calls and various technologies of communication that one interacts with the employees, not just teammates, but across the um, uh, spectrum of the organization. When you interact with them, the, the chances of them leaving the company or even the context of today's, uh, you know, uh, young uh, youth get into depression, that is minimized. Uh, that, uh, for me, is very, very important. You know, you have a lot of youngsters uh, getting into depression for the for these inane things, for the smallest of things. Then how do you bridge that? You, It's not just the parent who does it, even the employee or the reporting manager has to do it, or the HR person. You interact with them. It can be for a coffee. You can probably take them out for a coffee in your own pantry and uh, have a you know, chat with them, it could be as inane as some movie star or movie or something like that. But ensure that you communicate to them so that they understand that they can reach out to you. For me, that is very important as an HR person. And that's gone a long way for me to understand that not just to break the uh, ice, so to speak, or break the wall. Or the second aspect, like I mentioned to you, has it has brought down the attrition to a large extent in my communication with them. So how are you there? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shilata. Um, I really like all the topics that you all spoke about as panelists of this topic and this conversation really covers a lot of things that is affected by digital transformation and how we should be dealing with this. But, and we were talking earlier also, it's so easily that we've already covered our one and a half hour together. We're almost done with our time. So, Coming to the conclusion of this panel, Understanding Global Digital Transformation, and truly, this panel actually is the most global panel that we've had in this entire Changemaker Summit. So that's, yes, the most. Uh, that's incredible. Um, so thank you so much for joining with us and sharing your views. Um, to the end, I do want to just add one more point. Uh, yeah, yes. Could we add one gold nugget each? Like, could we say one nugget each? I was actually just coming to that. If someone could conclude it for me, that's what I was going to ask because we have like just a few more minutes. So, yeah, I, you know, one by one, everyone can please do that. Starting from Ms. Shireta, please, yes. Yeah, um, I'll add to what Dimitri uh, uh, earlier said is, and uh, Laurie also brought up this point, 
that um, it is very uh, vital for anybody for you me and the technical people not to shy away from technology you know there have i i have learned dbase and uh, um, cobol when i was studying and if i stick to dbase and cobol i'm i'm the one who's going to be a loser i'm the one who's going to be obsolete um uh, uh, dimitri rightly used this word obsolete that i have to invent myself i have to innovate not just you know the manager coming and saying hey you need to learn this so that you will progress in your career it is for me it is the onus is on me to learn and not shy away from technology not be scared of technology also because the more i learn and i am within the group and within the group i will be able to grow in my career if i am sticking to my cobol and dbase you know today you and you wouldn't have invited me for this uh, uh, mm-hmm. so it is very important for me to constantly change and and go with the technologies yeah uh thank you so much next i would ask mr eduardo to add his value uh, yeah like when i talk about the problems i get very emotional but i will talk about the solution now on the solution yes. then i get very happy because I thought for many years that the humans were doomed like we're so hateful we will die before I even I, I die myself you know but reality is when I started to look at the beautiful in humanity like we put a man on the moon we created the, like poetry we have made all these amazing things right and then I realized we actually have a choice we can choose we uh, the owners can choose to give hr more resources to do inclusion to do well-being to avoid that people burn out me as a leader can choose to be a better leader you know if i can wake up so actually i think the future is quite bright because more and more people are waking up you know like we have a choice like my friend dimitri said one in my podcast he said if i have to choose between negativity and positivity i choose positivity and when dimitri said that to me it was like it was everything that i had concluded you know like i think if we get in touch with our human side more and we use the more intelligent part of the brain and not so much the reptile like the territorial part i think we can do very good actually we have poetry we have music we have so many beautiful things right <laughs> and i write poetry oh lovely Yeah um uh, you you didn't you didn't mention that Zuha but I've uh, I write poetry I've written about 27 poems uh, I hope to publish a book to the soon so technology is going to help me in publishing a book gone are the you know you had to go through 10 different things and request them to publish a book today everything is online and I can sell it in Amazon so that technology again is going to be um, enhanced and uh, help me in in my own quest That's actually amazing how it's making everyone so self sufficient and just self motivated in doing a lot of things that's like a really big boon of technology not just uh, self sufficient but also gives you that inputs for your creativity as well oh yeah right right sure <laughs> next i would like to ask ms bapida to please give us a concluding session for this entire panel uh, before we uh, stop this thing We can't hear you, Mr. Bapidat. Yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Okay. Do, do you hear me? It's better. It's not working. How how about you remove your earphones and maybe speak loudly? Okay. For you, we go and can conclude this. Ah, we have to be very careful. Do you hear me? Yes. Now. Uh- so we have to be very careful and very confident and uh, we must move forward because we are going moving very very fast to the generation so uh, we have to see the things we have to be, become very confident about all the things we are doing on digital and before that uh, we must be very careful in that and uh, 
to cooperate with the situation and uh, to move forward very very carefully thank you mm-hmm. thank you so much mr gopidas thank you for so much for those words uh, next up i would like to ask mr dimitri to please give us a proper conclusion for this panel Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity for being here. Um, I just want to tell everyone around the world, Stanley College, ladies, this is the best time to live in history in a time of living in the world. This is like, you, you know, there are no limits to what we can learn. There are no limits to what we can develop. There are no limits where we can reach right now. You know, everyone's collaborating. Everyone's coming together. There are no... uh discriminations unless we allow them to be we need to be strong we need to be determined that we can change this world we should never accept anything face value or the status quo we should always strive to be as as you know who famously said be the change you want to see in the world i think you're very familiar with it and okay. really motivate yourselves to continue your careers and become leaders and show the rest of the women around the world that we need everyone to be involved we need everyone on board because unity uh, we find power in numbers and we should collaborate we should unite and we should create a better world and that the message i have for you thank you so much for that beautiful message and finally we have ms lori making if you can share some nice conclusion points for this panel I would just leave you with one quote. One quote because this is going to sum it up in regards to the mindset that you should have when you leave this discussion today. It's a quote from Henry Ford, um famous here in the US, but I I'm sure that some of you may be familiar with this and it's whether you think you can or you think you can't. You're right. It's your <laughs> mindset. It is your mindset as to whether or not you will be successful when it comes to global digital transformation so bottom line you should definitely think that you can because you're going to be right it's all about the mindset and being able to do that so whether you think you can or you think you can you are right 100% thank you so much and thank you for joining this panel understanding the understanding the global digital transformation and one of the ironic things about this panel was that we also touched a lot on the topics that we had even in the past two days so that's i don't know quite ironic to me uh, so thank you so much we just done we we actually right on time with our one and a half hour <laughs> thank you so much for joining with us for this panel it was great and lovely so to host you all it was lovely to host you all in this panel Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for Stanley College also. Thank you. And lovely meeting all of you. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. After a lot of interaction in the past month, it's lovely to all meeting you all virtually also like this. Same here. Like Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Now I would like to direct myself to the audience who are watching us right now on Stanley Women's College YouTube live. Uh thank you for joining with us for the Change Maker Summit 2021. We'll be going with our next in about half an hour that is 11 o'clock a.m. IST. So looking forward to seeing you at the time. We would, thank don't you. We have it. Can we take questions from the audience? Uh we're not actually taking doing that in this um uh, Okay. Submit now. I'm so sorry, and we all actually do our time. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe next time. Thank you for hosting, uh, uh, Zuha. You've done a lovely job, and thanks for all the cooperation as well. Uh, Dimitri and Laurie and uh, uh, Bappi and uh, Eduardo, it was lovely listening to you and interacting with you. Thank you so likewise. much. The same, likewise. It was amazing. Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should connect. Yeah, yeah like I, I, I have the podcast Eduardo live. Like that, we should do like a group session there about to continue the conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> that actually be great. I would note down the YouTube live comments, and then we can also have that in that live. 
Yeah, Maybe that would be amazing. Together on LinkedIn. Yeah, um, I connect me there. I will set it up. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Right. And, and but not this this early this time. And now I need to go to sleep. Actually, I'm very tired. <laughs> Here as well. I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> but we, I, it was an honor coming. And I say, like Dimitri, we need more women. Like, and we need to support, you know, that the numbers for like women, what they need to suffer like in life to get ahead against us men is ridiculous. Like, we can't have it like that. Like Dimitri says, you know, we have the choice actually. We have the choice to change. You know? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for our panelists. Love to Thank see you. you. A next time. A very good next time. Bye bye. Thanks, Ufa. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet bye. you. Thank you. Good night. Buenas noches. <laughs>
Good morning, Mr. Vivek. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you completely all right. Thank you so much for joining with us. All right. Thank you so much for the yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Would you like to even test your webcam maybe? Okay, one second. Are you not able to, Mr. Vivek? Yeah, it was just trying to find the webcam. Now I've just clicked on enable. Okay. okay. Take some time to initialize it. Okay, no issues. Okay, fine. Yeah, can you see me now? Um, it's loading. Oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yes, right. you can see me all right. All right, awesome. So everything looks fine. We'll be starting. You can maybe join back in 15 minutes and then we can initialize everything together. All right, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining with us also and this cooperation. Hey. Lovely. Hey, absolutely. My pleasure. How do I leave this? Where do I find the leave button? Uh, how about you just unmute yourself and maybe switch your webcam on? Uh, we can, and then just switch it back on when we start. Okay, just okay. Fine. More minutes ago. All right, sure. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. And leaving is there are three buttons and like three dots in the side. So you can just click that and leave later. All right, sure. All right, yeah. Thank you and all Thank the best you. to you. Thank you so much.
Can, uh, huh, huh. can you see me? Yes, we can see you. We can see you. No problem. And uh, uh, I request you kindly address me as General Astana uh, because that's the normal norm and that's what the Constitution says. Okay, bye. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. General Asthana. Good morning. Uh, I would actually request all our esteemed panelists uh, for this session to please switch their webcams on and also unmute themselves. We'll be starting now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Vivek. Good morning, General Asthana. Good to see you in your uniform. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Sushil, uh, I would actually request if you can join with using your microphone. You're on listening mode. Yes. Through your microphone, you use. You're on listening mode. Mr. Saurav and Mr. Miraj, uh, please, we can share your webcam with us. We'd love to see you for this panel. Good morning, everyone, again. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
A very good morning to all. Uh, we just have Mr. Saurav to join us. We'll be just waiting for him and starting in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so as we wait, first off, I would like to welcome you all to our panel, India at the Global Front, organized by the Changemaker Summit 2021. Uh, we are organized by About Those Big Dreams, uh, a student initiative at Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. So before we start this panel, I would like to give you a glimpse of what our college is. Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women, Hyderabad, is a leading institution established in the year 2008. A temple of learning at the heart of the city of Perth provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students. Stanley is affiliated to the prestigious Usmani University of Hyderabad. It provides all eligible engineering courses which are accredited by both NBA and MAC with a grade A. Stanley is also an ISO certified institution. We rank at 105th among the best engineering institutions of India and second best women's engineering college in all of South India. Stanley is currently expecting an autonomous status, which shall raise the honor of this institution. Stanley has a strong belief to empower women, impact the world. It aims to empower girl students through professional education, integrated with values and character to make an impact in this world. And we, about those big dreams, are student initiative at Stanley. We were formed in April 2020, midst of the early days of this pandemic to shine the light of learning in all the young hearts at Stanley. We started off at Stanley and now we are globally registrations for this Changemaker Summit. ATBD, we aim to provide a chance to our viewers in these difficult times to learn more about the working world from people who are willing to share their story, like all of our wonderful panelists today over here. Thank you so much for joining with us for this panel, India at the Global Front. Let me actually first, since I just gave you all an introduction about Stanley, I should introduce Stanley to all of you. We have with us Mr. Miraj Fahim. He's a serial entrepreneur who started first as a student entrepreneur. He founded India's first food camp, the Hacking School, which was acquired later by iCollege Australia and Code.in, founded and India's first student-focused startup incubator, the Adventure Park. Mayaj is an innovation fellow with the government of Telangana. He is passionate about education, technology, and student entrepreneurship. We also have with us Mr. Saurav Karmakar. He is doing research on flexible robotics. His vision to make a hybrid origami and self -robo soft robot for medtech, defense, and aerospace applications. His startup. Infinos Tech LLP is into a renewable energy-based portable device for the biotech application and educational tool for the medical and specially able students with customized AR plus robotics plus solution. He is Indian chapter chair of Space Innocence International to grow awareness about space. He's also helping entrepreneurs about building products from scratch. Also is doing various artistic activities in his life. We have with us General Shashi Asthana. He is the author, is a strategic and security analyst, a veteran infantry general with 40 years experience in national and international fields and UN. A globally acknowledged strategic and military writer, analyst, authored over 350 publications. He is interviewed by various national and international news chapters, newspapers, and organizations. He is the currently chief instructor, USI of India, the oldest Indian think tank in India. On Government Security Council, CEE, IOED, ITC, ITVMNN, 
and other UN organizations. On advisory board of Sweden, member EP on Expert Group Challenges Forum, former additional director, General Infantry, awarded twice by the President of India himself, United Nations, and former Prime Minister of Moldova and Governor of Haryana. We have with us Mr. Sushil Tripathi. He is certified in organization development analysis, talent management, assessment center, competency mapping, assessment and development. He is also trained in emotional intelligence, DIST, OPQ 32R, and balanced scorecard like tools. In almost two decades of work experience in multiple industries like construction, manufacturing, energy, and retail with Gati, Mosebayer, and CRM Silk Mills, he has led many HR initiatives in the field of organization design, development, and change management with special achievement in creating sustainable leadership pipelines. Mr. Sushil is having very keen interest in astrology and is awarded recently CHRO of the Year 2020 by HR Association of India. And he's also recognized as top HR minds of the country by World HR Day Congress in 2020. Finally, we have Mr. Vivek Gupta. He has 23 years of experience in diverse industries ranging from IT, ITES, financial services, and environmental services, and a certified brain-based results coach with 300 plus coaching hours with clients from diverse backgrounds and leadership roles in the APAC region. As a certified culture ambassador, he has been instrumental in helping leadership teams define the organizational values, purpose, and drove culture transformations during large MNAs within the organization. His deepest satisfaction comes from the fact that he had the opportunity to work with leaders in diverse industries and have been able to provoke their thoughts as their thinking partner. It is an honor for me as a moderator, Zuha Ansari, for being host for this panel, India at the Global Front. Thank you so much for joining with us, all of you. Thank you for having us, Zuha. Thank you, Zuha. Thank you, Zuha. <laughs> Uh, so before we start this panel, I would actually like to get a nice opinion from all of you on this panel because this is a panel that all of you have joined with us for. So starting with uh, General Shashi Asthana, if you can share with us some opinion on this panel of India at the Global Front, it would be lovely. Okay, firstly, uh, a big thanks to Stanley College and the Changemaker Summit. Thanks to Zuha. And thanks to the brilliant minds on your panel. And most importantly, thanks to all the young people who are listening to us. Because speaking to you rejuvenates us. And let me tell you that we all hope that with your brilliant minds and your efforts, you produce a better India than the kind of India my generation gave it to you. Your generation will certainly give a much stronger and a better India. And that is what the change making is all about. And this change maker summit, when I can see a whole lot of uh, technical minds uh, who are applying their minds in a times when the technology is the key uh, to the comprehensive national park, I'd be, I'd be absolutely honored to be on the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, General Asthana. Uh, next up, I would like to Mr. Miraj Fahim to share some opinion on the panel. Um, thanks, Zoha. Uh, but again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is indeed a very interesting, uh, uh, I would call it, uh, I don't know if I can call it a concept, but yeah, India at the global front, India is already making waves. India has been making waves for the past, especially for the, for the past uh, two decades. I have been fortunate to uh, travel extensively the last year. I mean, uh, 2019, not 2020, of course. Um, and then uh, looking at us Indians doing wonders outside India gives us immense pride. But then uh, also, you know, uh, presenting India to the outside world and inviting them to India itself and experiencing everything firsthand is uh, a different experience altogether. So, in fact, this is something that I I was working at the government, uh, you know, of Telangana 
again, you know, really extensively on how do we uh, put India on the global map, not just for uh, the things that we are known for, but also things that, you know, we are great at, but the world has no clue about it. So this is going to be interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'd love to discuss all of those factors in this panel. Uh, next up, Mr. Sushil Tripathi, if you could hear your opinions on the panel, please. So, Joha, first, uh, I would say, when I heard about this theme, I was little, literally feeling it's still Corona or pandemic or uncertainty is not over for me because the topic is very challenging, very interesting. And uh, putting thoughts from HR perspective or from talent perspective to change or uh, uh, to share thoughts where India actually is placed currently is definitely very challenging. But I will definitely take cues from General Asthana. He rightly uh, linked with uh, this uh, uh, mm -hmm. Indian position with what he is expecting in terms of younger generation and naturally it is going to be a great expectation from you people because though I am not veteran like general and other people, uh, not uh, travelled extensively also across the world, but with my limited know-how, I definitely uh, always suggest to young people, yes, uh, whatever Indian government with past, we are trying uh, hard. We are putting all possible efforts to take India to its destined level. Yes, there are issues, challenges, but I am fortunate because I am first time going to be a part of this kind of great panel. Uh, coming experience from diverse field, yes, uh, I have learned a lot, heard a lot about military, but first time we will get know-how from uh, veterans. So that is the best part of this panel. So I am keenly looking for uh, this panel, yes. Uh, it's totally all right, Mr. Sushil. Thank you for joining with us for this panel. Uh, next up, Mr. Vivek Gupta. Can you please share your opinions on this panel with us? Yeah, thanks, Zuha. First of all, uh, thanks to all the panelists, my fellow panelists for joining. Um, and it's great to be a part of such a diverse panel, um, you know, starting with General Astana to, Man to Miraj, Sushil, um, and everybody else. So, so my thought here is this, you know, like General Astana said, India has been doing good. Uh, you know, the previous generation has brought us to, a, a, you know, a certain level. And I would like to kind of, you know, mention it like a relay race, right? So what what India is, you know, the stage at India is right now is it's a relay race. You know, the previous generation has done really well. They've, you know, they've come up to a certain point now. Our current generation is doing what we can. But then the youth of this country, you know, it's up to all of you to take the baton from here and then make head waves. India is already at the global front. I think we've announced well that we are here, but it's up to this generation, the current generation, to, to kind of ensure that we stay there. Um, so yeah, I look forward to an awesome uh, session and um, look forward to hearing the, the great views of my fellow panelists as well. So thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Mr. Vivek. Uh, so this is actually quite an important panel. This is a very unique panel compared to the others that we have had in the past two days of this Change Makers Summit because this is the first time that we are actually referring to India and only talking about India and the works of India and representation globally. So I would really be looking forward to hearing all your great opinions on this panel. So first up, uh, it would be great to actually understand the complete standpoint of India in the global side and uh, what the importance of India is, like why India is necessary and how it's contributing in India. And I would really like Mr. Gen uh, General Asthana to please give us an overview of this. Uh, you see, the global uh, hierarchy is changing. COVID has actually affected the entire uh, global system. And in this global system, what has happened is that the center of gravity of economy, the center of gravity of population and technology shifted to Indo-Pacific. Now, if you see the location of India, it is centrally located. It is located in a manner that it has minimum obstructions for trade to anybody. Strategically, if you see, there are two poles which are appearing. China is trying to exert 
to dislodge uh, us from the superpower status and in both combinations for us india is important if he has to balance china for china uh, it is important that if a big market like india uh, shifts sides then china has a major, major problem so under all circumstances india is a important hub and india is a country which the whole world looks at it secondly when the covid started i remember i have been in united nations for a number of times so that time the whole world was thinking how the indian uh, india as a country as a country maximum maximum population density is going to respond to this pandemic because that will set the pace for the entire world we provide 60% of the vaccines to the entire world and therefore uh, the way india is going to explode uh, that was all eyes were on that now the way india responded was something miraculous uh, because initially we were into a lockdown which the which the humanity never saw uh, the scale of lockdown and we developed something uh, overnight the way the whole world could not imagine uh, before covid we were not even manufacturing uh, any ventilator or pro personal protection kit and during covid we became the second largest manufacturing uh, manufacturer of the personal protection equipment so considering all that uh, people are still now looking at india because india will be able to supply vaccines at a cheap rate and uh, a reliable vaccine away from the intention of profiteering which china has been doing and using covid to its profiteering uh, intention so this is one part of it the second thing which i want to tell the younger generation is that you all must feel proud of india the way india is today we are a strong country we proved it a number of times you remember 1971 war ops the whole world was against it that you shouldn't do it we did it when we it was in our national interest we divided a country into two a war which is an example which never happened there after such a uh, such a war which uh, produced 93000 uh, prisoners of war we decided to go nuclear because china went nuclear so obviously we had our national interest we didn't bother the whole world sanctioned us but we didn't do we do it we did it like we wanted to do so we are a strong country and under these circumstances uh, we should be proud of what we do everything what we do is a world record you make uh, aadhar card it's a world record you make uh, the health scheme it's a world record whatever you make uh, by virtue of our population it's a world record uh, so that's how the india is and when i see globally i find internally we don't Uh, generate that kind of confidence the whole world looks at you as a very great country so that's a, some that's a dichotomy which we must resolve we must have a self confidence of the kind uh, where we feel that uh, uh, india is there now when we come to the brain part you see we have the highest technologically qualified young english speaking manpower in the world now this manpower is the key which can change the entire dimensions of the world china yes they have done well economically because they opened up earlier than us but the fact is that their population is aged because of one child policy they are not going to be able to sustain that kind of thing uh, which they are into so we have potential and uh, this potential is perhaps we are going to exploit and the next important thing which i want to highlight is we are lot of people get disillusioned by a uh, lot of uh, crime happening or corruption happening and things like that now let me tell you two things one is we are a 73 years old country it's not a very long uh, period in the life of a country there are countries like united states you've seen recently you see what has happened in capital hill there are 250 300 years of democracy europe is by many hundred years of democracy so we are a young country and when we came up as a country the manufacturing bases were not there they were still in europe 
So we started from a scratch, and considering that, uh, I think we have done fairly well. And secondly, we have a problem of distribution of wealth. One percent people hold eighty percent of wealth. So obviously, bulk of the country has to scrounge for ten to twenty percent of wealth. And therefore, what happens is corruption and all uh, the crime. This is automatic. And there is no ideal country in the world. Every country has got its strength and weaknesses. There is no Ram Raj in this world. So we have our own strength. We have our own weaknesses, and we let's be proud of what we do and what we can do. I'll stop here for the time being and take my turn later. Where the panelists get their turn. Thank you so much, General Askana. Uh, we are finally also joined by Mr. Saurav Karmakar. Uh, I hope. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, good morning, Mr. Saurav. Good morning. Uh, we've we've started with the panel. We had the global panel. If you can please share some of your opinions on this panel, that'd be lovely. Okay. So first of all, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me, and uh, it's really uh, like honored to join all the panelists. And uh, I think uh, this topic is very interesting, and the name of this summit is very interesting. That is Change Maker Summit. So uh, you know, it's very uh, good to see how uh, you know uh, people from maybe globe and uh, from from our own country are participating as a speaker or maybe the audience and uh, do things very. Actually, so uh, regarding this, uh, you know, summit or the theme, I really love to say that uh, uh, India actually is in very good situation. If we see uh, the present scenario, the way we are handling it, and uh, the theme that I really love is uh, how we are trying to solve the problem very. authentically like it is very indigenous but still making global remark so that is what i really love about and uh, as as uh, you know uh, shashi sir told i think it's really interesting to see the way we are making records it's like it's really good to see that way we are doing something and we are able to make something really big so i think when we are thinking something about such big we need to make uh, more ambitious decisions and we have to uh think about how we are going to implement that like how the execution process should be and based on that we think we can do a lot of great things for the yeah so i think i will uh start with this comment and uh, yeah maybe next uh whatever is uh, there i can i can obviously tell further for the other panelists yeah uh thank you so thank you for your honor uh we've also we've discussed as we were talking and all of your opinions that you've shared all of you really emphasized on the next world of india the next step of india and that is the youth and a lot of the youth are actually watching us right now so the first question that i would like to direct is the, to mr miraj fahim over here uh, since you deal a lot with the youth and can you actually elaborate on the potential of youth at india at the global front okay <clears throat> uh, this is a very uh, touchy subject but yeah i'll still take it um absolutely i work really very closely with a lot of uh, you know youngsters um especially uh, on again another touchy subject which is entrepreneurship uh we are a country of uh, 140 crore people 1.48 uh, you know billion people and uh, like uh, you know general uh, asthana was saying <clears throat> just by the virtue of our population we are absolutely powerful right and even if you uh, get uh an opportunity to get into the minds of these uh, you know young population um you sh- you will be you will be surprised right you will be pleasantly surprised looking at the quality of their thoughts looking at their dreams looking at their aspirations looking at the desires and uh, you know looking at how much they want to make it happen right and this is the kind of country we want to be in and this is the best possible place for actually any country and we should be uh we should feel fortunate and we should take pride in that you know we um are at the right place uh, with the right people doing the right thing so it's indeed a matter of pride uh having said that uh it's also a little bit concerning more than 50% of our population is young right and that's a lot right and like with any uh you know a young population and if 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 uh 
just to draw an analogy, you can get into a class full of youngsters and try to manage them to uh, just try to get them to calm down and you will know how uh, difficult it is to deal with them. And now uh, just extrapolate the numbers to 700 crore youngsters in a country and, you know, <clears throat> uh, a bunch of guys wanting them to structure them down, calm them down, sit them down and make them do one thing, right? It can get a tad bit difficult. It can be a little bit challenging, but trust me, it's going to be worth it. Uh, so I am extremely excited about the whole opportunity because, uh, and especially my, uh, you know, current engagement with student entrepreneurs, my current subject uh, is student entrepreneurship. I've been working on it for the past two years after I sold my company. So looking at the ideas, looking at the zeal, looking at the fire uh, in their bellies, I can uh, not sit down. Uh, it it doesn't let me sleep, right? <clears throat> There's such talent, that's such opportunity and such right people wanting to do the right thing for the country, right? Now, just imagine 1% of this population manages to succeed. I'm talking about producing hundreds of unicorns. I'm talking about these unicorn companies creating hundreds and thousands, you know, tens, I mean, hundreds and thousands of jobs, uh, you know, for our uh, fellow countrymen. And that's going to bring in security. That's going to improve the quality of life. And that's going to project India like it should be projected, right? Uh, just the other day, Rajana Nandan, uh, the India head of uh, uh, Sequoia Capitals, uh, tweeted, by 2025, we are expected to have about 55 uh, you know, unicorn companies. And just imagine the kind of uh, opportunity we are talking about. India, again, by the virtue of its population, is extremely large. Right. And that also means opportunity. That also means, uh, you know, uh, great talent. It also means you can mold this any way that you would like to. So we have to be extremely careful. So it can go either ways. And we have to understand that fact. That is one thing. Second thing, I, I run this uh, coding bootcamp called the Hacking School, which I sold. So just in the year 2019, we managed to get uh, students from more than 20 countries. So students from more than 20 countries came to India, to Hyderabad, lived with us for three months, wanting to learn how to code. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, people from countries like Uzbekistan, South Africa, uh, South Korea, and so on and on, right? There were a few countries I hadn't even heard of before. Now, what I'm talking about is people look up to us for so many things. People look up to us for, you know, uh, education. People look up to us for uh, the great quality of healthcare and, uh, you know, medical doctors that we have in here. People look up to uh, us for our scientists. People look up to us for our technological advancements. So we have been, uh, you know, the world's North Star for a really long and good time. Now comes the most interesting part. We have to ask ourselves, how are we going to sustain, uh, you know, being that North Star? Because uh, being the largest democracy in the world, being one of the largest countries, uh, you know, in the world, it's also very demanding for us to how are we going to sustain the whole thing without getting confused or without getting distracted by, you know, what uh, our neighboring countries uh, might want to tell us, might want to do with us or, you know, uh, the change of forces uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and again uh as if all of this was not difficult um you know we are introduced to pandemics uh unplanned pandemics so we got to you know deal with so many things so we have to be a little bit generous we have to be a little bit kind to each other we have to you know just focus on doing things and whenever i am invited to colleges whenever i go there and i uh, tell them I, I just tell them this one thing right Whenever you get an opportunity to do something, just imagine you're standing on the crease, uh, you're getting to bat in the World Cup finals for India, right? And do what you would do then, right? That's your chance. That's your chance to, uh, you know, uh, help India shine. That's your chance to make the country proud and just do that, right? And that's exactly what it's all about. Imagine 1% of our young population uh, pursues entrepreneurship, goes out and goes out and creates a unicorn. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of jobs. That's talking about uh, security, that financial security. That's talking about improved quality of life and so on and on. So that's what I think, and uh, it's indeed, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a great time to be in at a great place thank you so much mr miraj your talk was actually very exciting and also very hopeful uh, thank you for that and coming to this pandemic yes uh, this pandemic has been awful for all of us but what do you think the indian government needs to do to jump start the indian economy and put it back on rails post covid 19 and i would like to direct this question to mr sushil tripathi if you could elaborate on us so very very pertinent uh, question uh, so i will begin with uh, like uh, where general stan stana stopped and uh, what fahim discussed so uh, we should begin with the reality yes uh, we are at global front we have been doing great we should have faith in the country and country is naturally fair and doing all possible justice to everyone and that is the reason we are given opportunity to say whatever we want to say without any constraint whatever we want to do we have freedom to do and history has been great in terms of uh, illustrious history we have been but what i have experienced over 20 plus odd years of experience working with uh, different companies what i personally feel country has to take a different kind of strategy though they have already started see if you are having millions or billions of people uh, young workforce so if you go by the trends or the records uh, putted by all government agencies is still unemployment rate in the country if you compare with other like china and japan we are doing very bad reasons are not like we are not uh, having good education system medical system we claim all, we claim all great things about great doctors great iit iims uh, what i think many times india has been relying or economy of india has been surviving majorly on service sectors and that is the reason we are getting maximum revenue from service sector if you compare with manufacturing sector and probably that neglect from uh, i would not name any any organization any country so if you are not concerned about the kind of talent the kind of skill set the kind of raw material here i am referring raw material as a talent pool so if you are having billions of people or maybe 60 70 crore of young people so ideally we should develop a, a strategy or create a platform where these people can be deployed see there are examples so china korea vietnam turkey germany these european countries they thrived on the basis of itis so compulsory technical education to all their people who just pass out from 10th onwards in india you will see people are just concerning about engineering education and uh, what they expect uh, somehow get opportunity to begin their career and people in nor- in northern part they might be looking for government job or uh, people in south particularly telangana or maybe kerala they look towards gulf countries and people who are from iit or maybe from iim they look for us uk and european countries to get a uh, settlement we can talk all good good things about the country that this country is having everything x y g but since childhood culturally we have trained our people they always look towards other what country has given to them they are least bothered about that every time they are just pointing out country ne ye nahi kiya country ne wo nahi kiya and every time we are so self centered and that has been part of our culture general asthana also touched about uh, corruption bureaucracy and then all these things are prevailing there might be this is our colonial legacy or maybe i go a uh, far back in the history then we have been looted massacred or brutally murdered by many people from different part of the country 
so we have everything available with us we are great technocrats we are great coders we are great manufacturers also but somewhere culture which is very important part of any of the country instead of looking inspiration or job opportunity opportunity from outside the world we have to create opportunity in the india so basically if you see why india suffered not like others because fundamentally india is an agricultural country still see tier 3 tier 4 cities are there who supported india to not collapse with this onslaught of pandemic so what i would suggest we have to create that kind of curriculum like uh, someone talks about compulsory military training to create discipline to create uh, uh, balanced life to create or to be frugal to be dynamic to create well structured body likewise job should be linked with manufacturing setup so right balance should be there in terms of service and manufacturing sector so technical education should be compulsorily linked with opportunity in indian industry so then there are uh, legal uh, environment then lot of regulatory issues are there which current government is trying to you know that improve upon so to be very precise and summarize what i would suggest our economy should be a right kind of mix between service and manufacturing sector agriculture linked uh, economy agriculture linked manufacturing sector should be nurtured developed at a larger scale then only we can talk about ki yes india has got its due place in the global economy market god has given everything to us so that uh, we must accept and we are fortunate in that way with that i would conclude thank you um, so much mr yes yes mr miraj uh, sorry to cut you uh, there zora but i think uh, the beauty of a panel discussion is uh, the ability to add to uh, fellow panelists uh, comments uh, on a quick and a light note what i would to, uh, like to add to you know what uh, mr sushil uh, said is i think uh, you know the government should uh, actually not do anything and let uh, everybody else do their uh, jobs that's it not getting into the way i think it would be the biggest help and support that the government can be doing at this point in time let everybody do their job and nothing else over to you <laughs> thank you for the additional comment uh, mr miraj um i would then direct uh, my next question to general asthana can you please and there's no other better person to start this conversation and if you can tell us the international standpoint with global organizations that india has it be lovely for this panel uh i'll start with the united nations uh, you would see that we started as a uh, non permanent member from 1st january and when we were voted you will find that i think 95 or 96% uh, countries in the world voted for us now that is the kind of reputation which we carry and the whole world wants us uh, into united nations and as a permanent member uh, today what has happened is that united nations security council those p5s uh, they don't represent the actual reality of the world uh, there are no developing countries there they were actually the ones who were uh, the victors of second world war and they came and they made this organization and so that's how they are there as and they have veto power now unfortunately despite the rest of the world trying for india to be one of the p5 members uh one country that is china uh, has been stopping us and uh, unfortunately the charter of united nations the, this, uh, article 180 says very clearly that it has to be two third majority of unga which is not a problem Uh, but every single p5 member has to agree now that is something which is not possible uh, because of the current system but notwithstanding that india when we want to do a thing then we do a thing like i gave you the example of the uh, nuclear test whether uh, if i wanted or they didn't want uh, we we it was in our national interest we did it so that's one part of it the second thing is you will find that in every single major organization which matters whether it is g20 whether it is sco whether it is uh, quad 
whether it is uh, western oriented organization whether it is uh, the organization by uh, chinese and russians everybody wants us there whether it is ris or whether it is uh, uh, jai uh, i i hope you you recall these words so uh, everybody wants india on their side uh, because of uh, the reasons which we explained the second point i want to highlight is uh, now that you have given me a chance uh, again to add on to what mr sushil was saying first day to my youth gentlemen and uh, uh, dear girls uh, the young generation uh, uh, entrepreneurs i would say you all must dream and dream is not what you see while sleeping it is something what does not let you sleep and that is what uh, president abdul kalam had said yes and to do that you have to believe in yourself you have to have your time management right your dreams must get converted into workable goals and those goals must get converted into targets and then you break those targets into what i can do today what i can do now and then take a step forward accordingly remember all the challenges which every panelist will be speaking and which we have been speaking because i may not be there for very long these challenges are there but we all steered our careers through these challenges everyone who has risen even including china if china has risen then it has fought through those challenges we all have fought through those challenges so at individual level at community level at organizational level and at your career level you have to fight through you are not at a disadvantage if the whole world is suffering from covid so you are so it's a common challenge for everybody so you have to come out better in that secondly change your attitude from negativeness it must move to positiveness from hopelessness it must move to uh, achievements that yes i can do it things can be done so long you are alive you can do everything and i can give you hundreds and thousands of examples Uh, uh from the uh, defense forces but then uh, everyone will say no this is a defense force example but let me give you a small personal example i think that nobody will be take offense to it i as a director general infantry had a brain tumor got paralyzed on to the left side my whole entire left side was paralyzed i continued on that appointment you imagine today infantry is fighting everywhere it is one third of the army but my organization put so much of faith in me that even in that state he will carry on i have three brain tube the surgeries i am still paralyzed but the day i left even from that day onwards i am still into uh, whatever she mentioned into governing councils of i don't know how many un organizations so the point is i am very sure that i am writing and till the time my eyes are open and my hand is working i will be writing i will be typing and i will be contributing now this is the passion which you have to carry so this is one part of it which i thought i must highlight that you are there uh, you are never lost you have never lost if you lose sometimes if you don't get success that means don't say that you are you have failed your success has been postponed that's the word which you must use when it comes to uh, the global arena i think uh, a lot of things are happening where we feel that uh, india has a chance uh, when it comes to uh, the manufacturing chain as uh, he mentioned uh, certainly uh, there is a handicap which uh, we carried uh, because we didn't start with that manufacturing base to start with but certainly now it is growing and Uh, a very good point which he brought up was that we have to put technology why are you looking at a job after studies you should create job you should look at uh, entrepreneurship why should you be a, a job creator than being a job seeker so that must also get on to the mind of the younger generation i think that would help uh, 
similarly when it comes to uh, the technology part, the challenges part of it now covid you see what all it has taught us uh, it has taught us what is the importance of the health workers it has taught us what is the importance of the safai wala it has taught us what is the importance of the maid it has also taught us that everybody irrespective of your status whether you are president of a country or you are a common man and a sleeper uh, and a sweeper uh, the the uh, pandemic doesn't make any distinction so we all are same we all are same in all respects so gracefulness for each other similarly when it comes to discipline uh, we have to just change the attitude why is it that in front of any window of a public office there should be four queues it always has to be only one queue why shouldn't it get, get ingrained into our and it gets it gets into uh, if we just change the attitude like you see uh, our metros today are uh, last year just before covid i had gone to usa today indian metros are better than the metros in new york let me tell you people uh, they dirty every place but now the sense of cleanliness is coming when metro came everybody realized you know this is something which needs to be clean and till date if you see metros are absolutely clean yeah. because everybody irrespective of the man in the society which stata he is uh, has assumed that this has to be kept clean so this is how it is so uh, if we just change the attitude it is going to happen and last uh, minute It is India. It is our country. You are India. We are India. I am India. You are India. And this change of India can be made only by collectively by us. That every one of us has to decide to make a change. If you decide to make a change, change will happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, General Asthana, for that lovely talk. You know, and uh, I would like to tell my. Uh, dear panelists over here, that Mr. Uh, the General Asana has to actually take our leave because he has some own work right now. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Asana, for this panel, India at the Global Front for the Change Maker Summit. It was lovely having you here. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you so much. So much. Thank, you so thank you, General Asana, for making us charge. And <laughs> now I'm feeling I am at Targhee. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, General Asana. Yeah, very insightful. Thank you. Okay, so getting back to the India at the Global Front panel, uh, I would like to direct my next question to Mr. Vivek Gupta. Um, can you, okay, General Asana already told a lot about the Indian collaboration. So can you actually elaborate on how the world looks at India and how India should move forward? Okay, great question, Zuba. So let's go back in history. Yeah, um, let's go back a few hundred, maybe thousand years. So historically, India has been the hub, right, for trade. It has been the hub for education. It has been the hub for technological or scientific advancements, right? So we have had whatever it takes to to build a much civilized, uh, I mean, build a more uh, advanced civilization, right? But then, yes, over the years, things happened. Uh, things didn't go in the right direction. But things are changing. Now is the time for India to shine, right? We've already made all the necessary advancement that need to be made. You know, you name the field, and we are there. You know, whether the science and technology. You know, whether it is you know going into space and you know making our you know a space research more powerful than most of the other countries. We are the we, we are one of the few countries. You know, maybe. just among the top 5 countries who had the, who have what it takes to get to the moon or to mars or whatever right um, you call you name the energy sector so whatever regardless of the sector that we talk about we are already there and we are making much bigger strides than any other country now miraj you know at the beginning he spoke about a young population and i think that's really critical for us at this point because 65% of uh, of india's population is under the age of 35 right so what does it mean it means that compared to any other country over the next few decades uh, maybe maybe about 4 to 5 decades india will be the youngest country with a much bigger and young workforce you know compared to any other big superpower at this point you know usa china japan all of these countries are aging 
So, so the youth of this country has tremendous opportunity. Now, what does it take to move forward? I think General Asana also touched upon it, right? It is the mindset with which we operate. And, and me being a coach, you know, I've coached, I've coached people from various organizations. I've coached a few youngsters. It takes just one thing to, to be successful. And that is to have a vision of what you want to really achieve, right? Today, I see a lot of people are not very focused in what they want to do, right? So we are, do, we are following the herd mentality. Now, uh, I think some of the other speakers also touched upon entrepreneurship. And Fahim, uh, you know, Miraj, he himself is an entrepreneur. Now, you know, interestingly, a few days back, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with my son and uh, he's getting into management. So I asked him, you know, why is it that you want to get into management? And I was hoping that he gives me a good answer. He said, I don't want to join an organization. I want to create a startup. And I was surprised, you know, a person who has not even finished his graduation is talking about, you know, starting a, a company and giving job opportunities. And I think that is the power that the youth have. Today, where we are uh, and what we've seen is that we have the biggest and the brightest minds compared to any other country in the world. But then the mentality of our youth is that we want to go outside of India to make money for ourselves or for our families and come back. But if we just shift that and, you know, make sure that we are doing whatever it takes within this country to, to make sure that people from outside the country are looking forward to come to India. I think Miraj spoke about this uh, in 2019, the hackathon event where he, you know, he had students from different countries coming into India. And I think that's, that's where we are headed and that should be our vision. Just like we had the Nalanda University where, you know, I mean, nobody's seen it, but we've, we've read about it, that we've had flags from more than 35 countries over there, which means that, you know, historically people used to come to India for education, but now it's the other way around, right? Uh, we spoke about the manufacturing industry. So I think some of the initiatives that have recently been started, like the Make in India, the Digital India, the Startup India. So these are all the initiatives in the right direction, um, because these are the things that are critical at this point. We have to overtake China if we have to become a superpower. So India is not yet a superpower, but do we have what it takes to be a superpower? Absolutely, yes. Right? Uh, from a country in 2004 that had just two mobile manufacturing uh, plants in, the, you know, in our entire country, today we are the second largest mobile manufacturer in the world. And uh, thanks to the COVID, um, you know, from a positive side, a lot of organizations are now coming into India, right? Um, I've been, I've worked in some of the big organizations, uh, you know, in the world. Uh, I've been part of Microsoft. I've been part of GE. Now let's talk about Microsoft. A majority of the, the software developers in Microsoft are Indians. And I would attribute the success of Microsoft to the bright minds that our Indians have given it, right? The top CEOs of today's big organizations are Indians. Um, if you look at, you know, in the in the field of uh, politics, I think Indians are making waves in politics also in, in countries like U US and the UK and so on. So we do have a lot of opportunity. Uh, people do look up to us um, from a country that has been the, um, how should I say it? So we have a solution for everything, right? We've given the word Jugaad to the English dictionary. So people would spend uh, millions and thousands to find a solution and we would have the most sustainable, cost-effective way of doing it and in a much faster manner, right? I think that's the power that India has and it is up to the youth of this country, all of you who are watching this, uh, you know, this seminar, this summit, it is up to you to make sure that you have what it takes, you are able to, you know, see in the right direction, regardless of what's happening in the country or in the world, if you have your vision in mind, if you say that, okay, this is what I want to achieve, and we start working towards that, I think that's what, you know, it, that is what it takes to make you successful, and that is what it is going to take to make India successful. So, yes, to coming back to your question, Zuha, I think the world looks up to us. They look up to our, uh, our minds. They look up to how we are placed strategically, you know, from a geological standpoint, um, how we are placed, uh, you know, from an ethnic and cultural background. Uh, we are the, we are the largest English speaking nation. And I think that is advantage enough for us to, to do what it takes to, to, to be at the center stage and remain there. Yeah, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Vivek. Uh, since it seems like you know Mr. Miraj over here. You've been, you've met maybe? 
Mm, no, just heard him for the first time, seeing him for the first time. Oh, oh, that's cool. Uh, but uh, Mr. Mehraj, would you actually like to carry that question further, that answer over there? Right. Um, in fact, I would like to uh, refer to my previous, uh, you know, comment on the same point. <clears throat> people absolutely look up to us you know uh, in 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 all directions actually right uh, be it uh, the good direction be it the not so good direction people absolutely look up look up to us uh, why i'm saying this is, is because uh, you know uh, like i told you uh, just by uh, the virtue of our population you know just by the uh, economies of scale you know the chances of we messing up is very 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 high Okay, uh, you do one thing wrong and it uh, you know goes viral. You do one thing wrong and then you know it 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 uh, grows exponentially overnight. You know it it happens and it it can happen especially when you are working in such a crowded nation, right? Uh, but that's not the case with US. If you walk on the roads uh, in the US, you will not find uh, you know most of the times you are alone, right? So the chances of you not uh, People not people looking up to you is never there, right? So, uh, be it good, be it bad, uh, you know, nothing multiplies. But that's not the case in here. The moment you do something, uh, you know, bad, it fires up. It fires up like crazy, right? So the onus is on us for us to be, you know, careful and to take things extremely positively. And it's a state of mind, right? Whatever we want to be doing, it's a state of mind. I think, and I think, I really think it's very high time that. All of us start, uh, you know, um, changing our mindsets. Uh, when I say changing our mindsets, mindsets, I don't mean to say, okay, you know, our mindsets are currently bad or narrow. What I mean to say is we have to uh, think bigger. We can do much, much more bigger and better than what we are doing right now. Uh, and mainly because, you know, people are looking up to us. If you just just open up LinkedIn and you will find the number of, uh, you know, people calling them calling themselves motivational speakers is what, growing ev every day. Um, see, uh, we need creators. We need entrepreneurs. We need problem solvers. We need people who can help uh, others. We need people who can open up the doors and, uh, you know, let people in. Right. We need to get over this uh, petty mindset of, uh, you know, what's in it for me. Right. That has uh, already uh, killed a lot of, you know, India vibe for a really long time. But I guess it's high time that we uh, start working on that factor and uh, make ourselves more productive, more positive and do bigger uh, things. You know, we have that ability in us. We are the country that gave zero to the world. We have, we are the country that gave one of the most important invention solutions to the world, right? Uh, Hyderabad produces uh, more than half of India's, uh, you know, const contributes to the more than half of India's pharmaceutical industry, right? So when you are in a position of uh, responsibility, when you're in a position of authority like we are in, right, you cannot uh, stress upon the petty factors, right? You have to look on the other side and see what positive uh, facts can you talk about? Where can you add more things to it? And how can you play a role there, right? Uh, one very tiny uh, bit, again, you know, it's a very sensitive topic that I would like to touch upon, internships. I'm, I'm a hardcore uh, entrepreneur and I promote entrepreneurship like crazy, right? I literally want everybody in the world to, uh, you know, give it a try. And my focus area is student entrepreneurs because, because I think... Uh, you have the, you get the best chance to succeed uh, when you got the ability to fast uh, fail fast. So and that's why I push people to you know try uh, starting up right from uh, when they are in college, right? And even if they do not succeed, they would have gathered enough experience uh, that can help them find you know a decent job once they are out of college. So they have absolutely nothing to lose, and that's exactly what my incubator Adventure Park does. Now, uh, talking about in internships, you know, there is this constant debate of paid internships and unpaid internships, uh, you know, that's keeping that 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 keeps happening on uh, LinkedIn. And, and I'm, you know, totally fed up of uh, looking at it. Absolutely. Right. If you can find a paid internship, go do it. If you can't find a paid internship, go and do a free, free internship. There is nothing to debate on. All right. Okay. The fact is you have to make yourself productive. You have to find something that is worth your time. Okay, and the whole fact that 
paid internship, unpaid internship. See, if a company is willing to pay you something, it means you have got a sellable skill set. If you think a company is giving you an unpaid internship, it means you did not have a sellable skill set. It means you have to work on building a scalable, sellable skill set. It's as simple as that. It's not not a matter of money. It's not that you know people uh, like to get free work done. People like to you know uh, hire people and not pay them. No, um, any entrepreneur worth his salt, any founder uh, of a company, the biggest pride uh, you know, if you go and ask him, you know, what makes you uh, proud? Is it your company? No, it's the ability to pay your company, pay your team on time. You know, that is what everybody aims for. Nobody like likes to you know fall on that seat. But if you do not have anything sellable, right, which is the case of majority of our countrymen, right, people still in college, people who have just graduated, how many of them are employable? Let's talk about their employability, right? There is no discussion around that. And when that touchy topic comes up, the whole, uh, you know, paid and unpaid thing uh, dies down. So we have to stop getting into that, uh, you know, useless loop of, you know, um, this for that right so if this then that no we have to look beyond it and it's high time we start doing it i think uh, pandemic uh, has been enough of a lesson for all of us to work on ourselves uh, start you know making changes that are required and keep moving on because people are looking up to us people are looking at what we are doing right and if we are not going to change then they know what we are doing wrong and trust me that's a dangerous thing to happen. Thank you so much, Mr. Mirage. In this panel, we are discussing a lot about problem solving. And Mr. Saurav Karmakar, in the initial conversation that we were having, he mentioned about solving problem authentically. And that's what India does. Can you please like to uh, elaborate, on, elaborate that? on that? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I would agree to Mr. Fahim and uh, Vivek Gupta. And also I would like to uh, uh, tell also a little bit about, uh, especially so like he told about a lot of things that uh, we're facing or the mindset. So I think there is a very good line, touchy line, that change is a new constant. So I think we should uh, think about the change. Change is the new constant. So we should have the mindset that can change the things like not only our ourselves it also can change the society people i don't know it, it it brings like everything from the single individual like right so it's like the one drop of water makes the sea so i think that is one of the most important thing regarding the uh you know, question uh the most important thing i think uh, uh, india should start doing or maybe already we have started but it's very limited that is like the research-based things or problem solving skills so if you think about problem solving, uh, there are like two ways majorly I feel. One is like uh, there is a problem, you pick it up, you try to give a best approach and then you get something output and then you can you can go for some kind of, you know, it could be venture, it could be some sort of result which can bring some solutions and all. Other thing that you bring some new problems. So we have great examples like uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> so I think, I think he is the you know, genius who is making... Uh, research into a uh, great future like you know it, it shows that if we if you want to make innovation it can come from something from us i mean nobody thought like whatever he is doing now so i think this is one of the best thing that is happening so i would always support that we should also think about uh, problem solving in terms of the novelty and innovation uh, because uh, it, research is a very uh, you know uh, like very very professional term but i think one of the most important part of research is that uh, you should also educate ourselves and then you should also grow things into into in a very easy level like like i think i think for example like i have been into some uh, research into space and uh, i'm also doing research on healthcare so i think these are the areas that like you need things to be done and india is like the first country i guess like if you think about the mars mission uh, not only Mars mission, if you go for it, nowadays, again, Gargonian mission will come and uh, there are a lot of new challenges will come. Nobody has done that. And ISRO is one of the best examples, I think, like globally that we are trying to do or we are getting a lot of new, new technologies, like in the one mission. Like we don't know how many uh, number of technologies are there in one mission, right? So, and that is, should be cheap. That should be also 
like uh, like there are a lot of you know uh, criticism that uh, india let's say being a third world country till now uh, we we always criticize that okay what's happening like we why don't we work for the poverty but we are sending the space missions and all but we can't limit that like we should be in the in the in the front so if we can lead something india actually can lead that like india has a great history of space science before so we can actually solve problem and go to that come to another perspective of the research is that uh, we should understand how easily and how cost effective things we can provide to the people okay it could be again it could be again uh, a venture it could be again a kind of research output from the academic sector but uh, it's it's very important that uh, india can actually provide this because it it it, it can actually make the cost effective things and uh, i think uh, the the panelists mentioned about the jugar technology right so this jugar technology is like what we can actually promote in a very authentic way scientifically and i think we can bring a lot of things so i i feel like if we can focus on it could be engineering college it could be non technical whatever sector if we can think about the problem we give a good approach and with the right approach we can actually make huge impact and that could be an innovation where we can show cost effectiveness and also we can show that it's a huge impactful area because uh, you can't get like you know population like 1.3 billion people where you can actually make the change so i think uh, that's one of the mis- uh, most important thing that we can do and also apart from that also we can actually change the education system where we can make our young minds very problem solving and productive in terms of uh, this kind of fancy word let's say research i again use as a fancy word because we should think about how we can help it because lot of academic research we can find uh, it is not solving the problem but it can be like we should take that problem solving skills into next level and yeah it can be done if you see the silicon valley i think uh, uh, i think i think the professors were there like they in, in, like inspired the students and then the silicon valley started in us right so we need some people we need some uh, you know technical non technical professors or maybe people who want to make the change and also you can see a lot of people who are like uh, not having a lot of education lot of technical education but they are making great impact i don't remember the name of the person but uh, he's from assam and he has done a lot of great uh, very simple machines which is making great impact and he got a lot of awards also so it shows that if you want to change something if you want to prob- you want to deal with the problem properly you can deal with it and you have enough problems in india and we can solve it and i think uh we have the chance now and i think we hopefully zuba i think you're on mute <laughs> okay another thing that uh, okay first of all thank you mr saurav karmakar another great thing that we were discussing on this panel was the strategic importance of uh, india india it was mentioned by mentioned by general asara and also mr vivek gupta i would really like to get to get to the party for you on the on the topic too jo uh, have what i feel uh, first uh, will take one or two minute uh, to share my thoughts uh, like we have discussed a lot in terms of uh, what we should be doing to make india really great uh, at global level but if you refer the data as which are available so now i will touch few dark side also because uh, uh, it is not advisable only to focus on positive or brighter side we should be also ready to accept the ground reality so we'll share few thoughts on entrepreneurship also so everywhere we have been uh, talking a lot in terms of we have to be a job creator we have to be an entrepreneur this or that harsh fact is like this i last year i visited all uh, young generation iims and you will be surprised to know when i interacted with their uh, heads uh, who were head of those uh, incubation center or uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, cell there was a story even uh, saudi arab so prince or king of saudi arab was ready to offer millions of real 
to sponsor girls entrepreneur in that particular institute and unfortunately out of 100 proposals so even 10 proposals were not in line with the standards so what is happening in india whatever entrepreneur or small unicorn kind of setup or concepts are conceived in the mind of young generation it is very short lived they are just there in the market to create brand image and then they are ready to sell so their immediate concern is not to create a job for larger masses that is just for to create money and that is the reason their life span is very short and second aspect which is very important here to note out of 100 entrepreneurship uh, hardly 5 or 10 get success in indian environment i am not telling ki this is right or wrong yes definitely we should look to get or to create this kind of culture or work environment but why i am again and again emphasizing on culture part because being into hr fraternity or hr leader and since i am addressing to young generation this is very important here to note ki that uh, if you see the global talent uh, index level global uh, innovation index where india stands so innovation level it is beyond 100 and last year only at global talent index competitiveness level india was standing at 80th position 80th rank pe tha and we were lagged in entire brics countries so when i say brics brazil russia and all these countries so the problem is in our culture so why i am telling culture so culture is related with our insecurity might be it is in our dna we are insecure if we feel pride in telling ki that microsoft is great due to indians yes we are great but we are great in serving others we are not great in serving our country our our immediate interest yes we are bothered about that iitians feel pride ki yes in the very first day of their placement they get crore or plus salary but where in hong kong singapore uk us so they get desired education required education tax uh, from we kind of professionals and working people and then yes they are sending money to the country but finally you see us uk european people they work on innovation then they get patent then they get copyright so finally whatever they are doing they spend their 5 10 years of life in their innovation they are elon musk so now he has become number one people in terms of richness because he is continuously in innovation but what we are doing we are lagged we are we feel happy in arranging jugaad we take pride in telling ki we are great in making jugaad but at what cost whether jugaad is really helping us to getting patent whether we are able to get revenue in terms of jugaad we are just following shortcuts so shortcut hoga arab mein jayenge wahan se ghar ko paisa bhejenge shaadi hoga vyah hoga that is the our thought process if you visit up bihar might be you are from iit iim you are drawing salary of 30 lakh 40 lakh but people are not ready to give their daughter to you they are ready to run after a clerk who is earning 30000 40000 of rupees and another person is earning 30 lakh 40 lakh but he is not getting married and another person people are running like anything so that is our cultural thought process cultural biases so i can uh, talk so many good things about this should happen or that should happen but see when i was childhood i used to read nandan uh, jatak tales so that moral science that story was there family bonding uh, joint family dada dadi nana nani so we used to got that kind of uh, learning to be empathetic to others uh, you be sensitive to the need of others but now what we are learning from day one we are focused in the campus ki placement hoga ki nahi hoga 
and the ranking of college itself depends on the placement no one is bothered about learning rightly miraj talked about ki why organizations are not ready to pay certain amount because they are comparing with your skills so either you become sellable or you just be a like a, i would not use bad words but yes we have become just like a slave servant we feel great we feel pride in showing ki yes kira uh, microsoft is led by indian google is led by indian but boss out of 500 fortune company just five seven eight people and if you compare india's attractiveness level and global level in terms of talent attraction and retention we are doing very bad there so that is the reality so we have to work because uh, like mr gupta rightly said he is a culture architect so culture part we feel pride in uh, writing that song hum logo ko samajh ke tu to samjho dil var jaani and then all bad things uh, we write in that song and feel happy so that is the situation of our country so what more i can tell you see that is the reason i yes i realize ki we are bestowed we are gifted country is great everything is there but at a ground level we have to work on our thought process mindset general also talked about attitude but attitude what in chennai if a, a job of peon gets open up then phd people applies for that job we see the situation of innovation and we talk about the uh, yes ki we are great in isro isro scientists they are threatened they are not having security so if you compare management graduate gets lakhs lakhs of rupees but what uh, the scientists are getting so that is the mindset that is a colonial legacy so we have to come out from this then we can talk all the great thing about yes we have fertile land we have great uh, uh, environment uh, four season crop season winter summer everything we are having that was the reason we were once called sone ki chidiya so still we are sone ki chidiya but you people have to create this kind of mindset cultural thought process ki what you have done for the nation that should be the top priority instead of looking what india is doing for you we are just concerned about sadak kharab hai pani nahi aa raha hai bijli nahi aa raha hai politicians are corrupt they are doing not good but who are selecting these people jab vote dena hota hai to then we are at home ki dhoop bahut hai then people who are in the line they would be heard and that would be represented by politicians and leaders so the best part from leaders to the bottom line we have to develop that or nurture that kind of culture so come out from insecurity come out from that uh, i always say frustrated mindset just concerned about you 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 so that is my thought process thank you so much mr sushil um, next i would like to direct my question to mr vivek gupta um we've discussed a lot of points but can we discuss immediate things that india is india can do good and india can just directly rise up in i think there are a lot of things that india can rise up in um and you know some of my fellow speakers have already touched upon so so with the covid i think we have uh, you know a brilliant opportunity to move forward um you know whether it is in the space of manufacturing there's a lot of foreign direct uh, you know uh, investment coming into india so the fdi is increasing the trust of other countries is increasing in india many companies are looking at closing down their plants in china or you know some of the other parts of the world and bring them into india so there is a lot of opportunity to create more jobs there is a lot of opportunity to do a lot of innovation in our country i think many of us spoke about innovation and, and that's the that's the most important thing that is required at this at this point i had attended a a, a meeting recently and uh, you know very interesting story that i wanted to say you know it all it's all about mindset that we touched upon earlier so when we were young and in school you know in our art classes we were taught how to draw a flower 
And what's the first thing that, you know, everybody that comes to the mind when we want to draw a flower, a circle, and then we go bumpity, 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 bumpity. We draw a stem and then two leaves, right? Uh, fast forward 20 years. Now, if somebody says draw a flower, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? A circle and then bumpity, 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 a stem and two leaves. So where has our thought process gone? Where has our innovation and the creativity gone in all these 20 years? It all goes back to how we were taught to do something. But then the problem is that we tend to stick with it, right? So we need to change this. We need to be more creative. Um, we need to be more patient. Today's youth is very brilliant. Um, you know, they are much more intelligent. They are much more tech savvy than, you know, the previous generations. Uh, what it also, they are much more fast. However, the one thing that I think we should all learn is delayed gratification. Fast doesn't mean necessarily instant results, right? We should put in the focus. We put, we should put in the right efforts and if all the right effort has got has gone in, then all the you know the results that we want will come in in, in in turn. So that is something that we should be focusing on. And what the country needs at this point is for everybody to be focused on what we want to achieve. And I think various governments. I mean, I I don't want to name any political government over here or any political party, but I think everybody is doing what it can to kind of create a you know a sustainable future for the state or for the country. The one thing that we all should do is have trust in the future of the country. Um, don't be bothered about what's happening around us. You know, we this is a change maker summit. And, you know, if you follow the change curve, we all start with excitement and then we start going down because we, we start losing hope about, um, you know, what this change is all about. We have our own questions. Can I do it? Can I not do it? What will others think of me? But then there are some people who move forward. And, uh, and, there are, and there will be a lot of forces to pull all the others behind from moving forward. But then, like I said earlier, I think it's important that we keep our eyes close to what's happening around us and keep our you know, eyes open on, the, on, our, on our vision and keep moving forward. And if we are ready to do that, there's nothing that can stop us. Uh, thank you so much for your insights, Mr. Vivek. And uh, actually, with this, we are coming to the end of our panel discussion on India at the global front. So, yes. <laughs> so, towards the end, I would like to just go around once and for a conclusion that you would like to address our audience with. So, let me start with Mr. Miraj Fahim, please. Uh, it was definitely uh, an enlightening, uh, you know, session. And, uh, you know, like uh, Vivek uh, rightly mentioned, delayed gratification, right? I think we have to get uh, done with the whole obsession with instant gratification, instant gratification, right? I want to get rich overnight. It's not going to happen. So please stop chasing it. And I'm uh, being very direct. I'm, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Uh, and especially, you know, because a lot of uh, uh, students are watching it, please get done with your obsession of uh, instant gratification, okay? Uh, you will have to work really hard for things that you uh, really want, and easy answers are not going to be the right ones, and the right ones are not going to be easy. Please get that uh, thing straight to your heads. That's point number one. Um, point number two, research, yes. Uh, you know what? You will have to follow your passion. If you really want to make uh, make it big in your lives, then you will have to follow your passion, not your neighbor's passion, not the passion of Satya Nadala or, you know, Sundar Pichai, because, you know, they just made it happen. They made it happen because they pursued what they were passionate about. Okay. So do not, uh, you know, follow somebody else's path. Do not follow somebody else's uh, dreams. Do not follow somebody else's, you know, career graph. It's their career graph, right? You were born unique right? You have your own set of genes. You have your own set of DNAs. You have your own set of skill sets. Even if you do not know what it is, explore. Give yourself some time. Experiment with yourself, right? Do yourself a favor and work on yourself. Figure out where your heart lies and then pursue it. Stick with it until you make it happen. And you will make it happen. The whole problem why India uh, looks the way it looks right now is because we, uh, you know, literally live somebody else's life we live our neighbor's life we live our cousin's life we live our best friend's life we live our uh, the life of you know somebody who 
we don't even know right we read about him in the newspaper and we are like we want to be like him right uske paas wo car aagi mere paas meko wo car chahiye kyun chahiye right so you do not have to live somebody else's life and this is something that you really have to accept the fact please pursue your own damn dreams okay uh, one very important thing uh, that you know uh, sushil ji was uh, talking about and i would like to slightly touch upon it is you know the success factor uh, he was saying ke uh, the rate of success is very low and trust me sir that is how it's going to look like and i'm talking about only 1% success rate and thanks to uh, again you know i uh, i've used the word population a lot today um thanks to the population of our country 1% itself is a lot right and that's sufficient enough uh, to actually move the needle of our country right so let's only talk about 1% success rates we only need 1% okay and that's exactly the case even with hr i guess right you do not end up hiring everybody who you interview so that's how it's going to look like okay uh, so do not get obsessed in getting big large numbers um do things do not that do not scale and that's absolutely fine this is something that paul graham of y combinator said um it's fine okay and things that do not uh, usually scale they have an impact and trust me my dear friends impact is extremely awesome okay impact scales impact has ripple effects impact travels right it goes really far uh and you know it's it's really loud so that's okay if you know things that you are passionate about do not seem um fancy do not seem bright do not seem uh, do not look good uh, i have been an innovate, innovation fellow with the government of telangana you have to innovate and the whole concept of innovation means solving problems do not think about you know mere ko mera what's in it for me okay please get done with that mindset it has caused enough damage to ourselves and our country already stop living the lives of uh, others you are unique you are awesome do what you really want to do try really hard even if you're failing at it trust me it's going to be worth it you will have a story that the world would would really love to listen to right once you even fail even if you're going to bomb at it bomb in a miraculously awesome way okay so that's from my side thank you mr miraj uh, next i would like mr sushil tripathi to please add a conclusion for the audience so we'll just add uh, on miraj ki uh, with this beautiful lines of a very uh, popular song jo raah chuni tune us raah pe rahi chalte jana re ho kitni bhi lambi raah raage aap log jante hain because uh, fahim uh, described it in a beautiful way so uh, for me also see uh, don't live life of others and passion also i i i always believe passion comes only if you start getting success recognition support from the market because see uh, you are not able to find out why if we are just concerned about roti kapda makan still we are lead, living at basic level so i will not talk about that passion passion again is a most misused word in management science so for me kyun mba kar rahe hain ya why you are in this beautiful college just to find out answer of this why and then once that why is found out then pursue with whole heart ekla chalo re whether someone is there with you or not you will find out your ways you stick to that and then you will achieve success so that's all from mind Thank you, Mr. Sushir. Finally, finally, Mr. Sharma, can you add? Yeah. So uh, I would like to touch upon the uh, word called Atmanirbhar Bharat. So if we have, like, we would need to be, you know, self-dependent, we can actually achieve great things, and uh, we we should, uh, you know, I I always love the uh, online of. Uh, the most poetic goal that uh, if you just focus on your work self dependent and you can just uh, do things great like where the mind is fear uh, you know without fear sorry with the word mind is without fear so just be fearless do things be atmanirbhar and you know be the person to be 
like innovative and uh, make things into global front i mean do for humanity and do for everyone it will be like automatically great so yeah thank you thank you so much mr zoro and to all the our esteemed panelists thank you for joining us for this panel india at the global front with the change maker summit 2021 uh it was lovely hosting all of you over here and hope we can continue this relationship even further thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you so much and thanks to all the fellow panelists as well i just like to leave with one thought um, i think it's important to understand that what got us here will not necessarily take us forward right so what it means is that we have to constantly keep thinking of the possibilities we have to constantly keep thinking of new ways of building and new things and new things to do if we really have to take india forward and if we really have to take our society forward so thank you all for your great great um, lovely to hear you and i hope that we keep the connection going thank you thank you thank you very much everyone i am very happy uh, to join and i guess uh we'll look forward to further future yeah thank you thank you so much and thank you for such possible hopeful, hopeful uh, insights on the entire topic india truly seem to have a lot of potential at the global front and definitely our youth should keep that in mind when they're working in their own lives and in their own passion that they're contributing to the country thank you so much then that's all awesome. thank you thank you for joining india at the global front Thank you and good luck to all the viewers and viewers. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to direct myself to the audience of the Change Maker Summit 2021. Thank you for continuing with us uh, for the day three of India of uh, the Change Maker Summit. Uh, we'll be. going forward from with our next at 1 o'clock so see you everyone thank you so much we'll be looking forward to seeing you then
You are currently the only person in this conference.
Hi Aisha and hi everyone out there. Pandan Preet this side from New Delhi, India. Hello, Ms. Pandan Preet. I hope you're doing great. Hello. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Doing amazing over here. Hope the same for you. Yeah. Yeah. And we have Ms. Deepa Sayal also with us. Could you also please check your microphone? And uh, Ms. Pandan, uh, could you please uh, switch on your camera and check your hand? Yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I can see you. Yeah. And yes, we have Ms. Deepa Sayal. Uh, ma'am, uh, you're on mute. Could you please unmute yourself, ma'am? Uh, Ms. Deepa? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Perfect, perfect, ma'am. Well, hi, and a very good afternoon to both of you. And I'm so looking forward to this season and expert panel. So really looking forward to network with everybody. Same yes, that, that's really something. Great. Yes, we are looking forward for it too. We have Mr. Sunil Roberts with us. Sir, could you also please uh, turn on your video cam? Just and we have, uh, yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. Ms. Melissa Arulapan also joined us. Could you also please switch on your cam? Hi. Hello. Hello. So Aisha, your full name is Sayeda Aisha Kaleem because I was looking for your name on LinkedIn. Then I got to know about your full name. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sayeda Aisha Kaleem. Yeah, yeah. Nice name. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Malika, ma'am. Hello. How are you doing? Good Yeah, so while the others are joining, I think I'll break the ice and say hello, Melissa. I'm Deepa Sayal. Very nice to meet you. We meet you, in fact. And uh, I just see two videos. Are there other people as well there? Yeah, so Neil Roberts sir is also joined, and I think we just need to wait for him to put a video. On. Yeah, just give me a minute. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure why I cannot see you all anymore. Just give me a second. Okay, by the way, you are visible to us. Yeah, I know. I saw you earlier and I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> the technical glitch is the new normal. Let me just enter again. So, Deepa Ji, yeah, where are you based? Okay, I'm in Delhi. Yeah, okay, Delhi. Yes, yes, and uh, if you want me to introduce myself in two lines, I'll be more than happy to tell you what I do. And uh, I am basically a CEO of ADG Online that builds software solutions here in the capital for about 50 plus government ministries. And I also run, a, I'm the president for Rival India, which is running, uh, which is running programs for women, MSMEs and business school students in terms of startup coaching. In, in terms of pitch deck presentations, incubation and acceleration. That's my point. Okay. And which part of Delhi are you uh, stationed? So the office is in Nehru Place, and the back end office where I sit is in Suraj If you've seen Chansu, yeah, I, I know of Suraj It's somewhere near Faridabad, no? Yeah. So we are in the plaza, first floor, and the ground floor. Okay. 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 So I am from Janakpuri, New Delhi. That's the West Delhi part. So meeting very yeah. many faces and many new faces. That's the beauty. Yeah. So what do you do, Bandar? Uh, primarily, I'm an edutrainer and I'm running the coaching and training institute by the name of Genius Editorial. And we are into a whole lot of training, coaching, mentoring students and uh, women, uh, you know, youth, all straight off uh, people from different age groups, different genders, everyone. And uh, we kind of try to upscale, upscale and upgrade themselves all the time for, you know, our basic idea is to empower masses and transform them. Right. That's the whole idea. Yeah. 
So Aisha, why is this a choice as a platform? Uh, is it something that you people have devised yourself as a platform? The BBB. Sorry, ma'am, could you please repeat? As I was just saying, uh, I mean, since we keep coming across all these new platforms these days, and this is something yes. new for me, the BBB thing. So is it something you people have created, or is it something which is already there? So, ma'am, it's like there, and we've been using it. So, and we found it very comfortable to use. I mean, it is very user friendly and very good. Yeah, and good to use. But probably all the engineering girls and the you know technical the technological stuff here, we probably used it here and created the stuff for yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So, so, but I'm just to add, this is based in open source. The the okay. This particular software, and it's it's very uh, easy to uh, pull in APIs from this and integrate. So, frankly speaking, Deepa ji, I am a very technophobic and a very you know, technological illiterate kind of a person who's just built up on her literacy skills in technology during the lockdown period. So, we all are yeah, so we're all learning, and I'm finding it very interesting actually. I mean, every day you get to learn something new. Absolutely. So, I'm actually enjoying this period. To someone who's wary of even switching on her washing machine today and you know, conducting so many webinars and virtual meetings, this is something really great for me. Absolutely. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. How are you all? We're all doing fine. What's the time of the day? Do you know? We have uh, eight uh, uh, evening or morning? Morning. Morning. Okay. Okay. What about you? Is it, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, around one fifty p.m. Hey, India. Hey, oh. How are you doing? Oh, well, I'm very excited about. You. Great opportunity to share, uh, to collaborate and share and uh, help so many people to uh, be more of themselves and uh, add value to others. Absolutely. That's so well said. Yeah. Melissa, ma'am, is your problem sorted? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, on, I thought I was on Explorer, but I was on Chrome, so that's okay. Okay, okay. okay. So I see five incredible women on my screen, and it's very it's very difficult to keep quiet, you know, for women especially. For me, it's very difficult to keep quiet. Why don't you fill in the bucket and let's see by the time others are joining? Hello, is yes. yes. my audible? I Hello? see there's some noise in the background. Something else is running behind you, I think. I think I will reconnect once again. Yeah, I think that will be better. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Yeah. No, no, I'm and I'm... For some reason, I'm able to dial into my phone, but not to my. Uh... Laptop or something, so I just wanted to figure that out as well. Hi, Dr. Irene, how are you doing? I'm great. Hello, everyone. Great to see you. <laughs> so, all pretty women are there, no? Different <laughs> resplendent faces here. So, where are you all located? I'm here in Germany. It's morning time. <laughs> Okay, and I'm from India, and uh, it's around one one fifty five p.m. afternoon time. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah I'm usually between uh, London and uh, Riga. Sometimes actually I do a bit in Germany, so let's uh, connect uh, in there. And uh, whenever I go next year, we can get a full copy. Inga, it's a bit difficult to hear you. Do you feel the oh, same? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe you can check it before we start. Thank you for feedback. I'll check the next one. Aisha, in the meanwhile, I think you can check your audio. No, I have a, I have the same problem as well. I'm getting some kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, is it different now? 
Uh, there are a few words it's, where the voice is cracking. Yeah, and, and it's a little low actually. The voice is a little low. If you're connected oh, to the uh, laptop, I think you'll you can see if the volume is uh, okay or not. Yeah. Uh, uh, Keeper Sayal, um, you are on mute actually. Uh, we couldn't hear you. Could you please tell us again? I think try connecting with your cell phone audio. Don't use the laptop audio. I think that will correct the problem. We do this all the time and it, it troubles you. So try if you can, you know. The cell phone uh, audio. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, Mr. Sunil Robert uh, is uh, the video cam uh, showing an error. He is facing a problem yes. with the video. He just said that. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, sir. So, yeah, sure, sure, sir. We do have time. We do have time. We can uh, start picking up and then start the panel. So, and a while I'll, uh, I'll also fill in this log. So we'll fill this up. Dr. Irene, hi. I'd like to formally introduce, well, I'm not hijacking the panel, but just a warm and a big hi to all of you. My name is Deepa Sayal, and I, I'm here in Delhi, in the New Delhi capital. And so happy to connect with all of you, and we're hoping to know you more. Thank you so much. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, so Stanley College has actually you know, given us a chance to network and increase our network. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It is an honor for us, actually. It is a great honor for us to be uh, you know, hosting such uh, amazing speakers. Great. Great for our network and network also. Manasha, man, you are also from India. I'm from Bangalore, yeah. Okay, fine. So, I, I, I've been to Bangalore last year. Uh, yeah, uh, the there is an echo, and I think that's the mobile problem because I find that when we have mobile, those on mobiles, they actually cause an echo problem. Right now, yeah, um, right, yeah. yeah. Right, yes, right. Uh, Miss Inga, could you uh, maybe mute one of the device that you're using? Just one, any one yeah. of the device. Yeah, yeah I, tried to, uh, I tried, I tried to, to connect with mobile, mobile, but uh, I don't think it's yes. working with ourselves. Switch it off. Yeah, how is it now? Is it's it better? better. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, I can see. Yes. Hey, uh, I just wanted Finally. to know something. Finally. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Hey, Melissa. Hi, Bandu. Long time. Hi. Huh? <laughs> So yeah, I'm great to connect with you after a long time. Melissa used to know me when since I had a lot of hair. <laughs> and mine was black, yeah. So. <laughs> the moment I saw your names, I was so happy. At least, uh, in, in, instead of five, uh, uh, intimidated by five women, I'll be intimidated by three only because I know two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know we won't intimidate you. <laughs> I say you're being inspired, not intimidated, inspired. No, I'm empowered. actually feeling um, very good because in all my years inside the, uh, the company I work also, I used to talk about how in speaker panels there isn't gender balance. Uh, but today, happy to be breaking a glass ceiling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, oh, joining, right. oh, so I'm, joining from, I'm joining from New Jersey, where it's 3.25 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> really <laughs> awe-inspiring, sir. Yeah. <laughs> only, only, because, only because I'm from the same city as this college is, um, okay. uh, is my hometown. Yes. That's great to know, sir. 
So yes, I think we have all of them in and the microphone, video, everything working perfectly. So we can dive into the panel. Right. So please allow me to begin. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So hello and beautiful afternoon. Good morning or good evening to all of you present over here. I, Sayeda Aisha Kaleem, welcome you to our panel, Build Your Network, True Network. Before I start over with the session, let me take a moment to give all our panelists and our viewers a glimpse of our campus. Sandy College of Engineering and Technology for Women is the leading institution established in the year 2008, a temple of learning that provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students. Sandy is affiliated to the prestigious Osmania University of Hyderabad. It are eligible engineering courses which are accredited both by NBA and NAC with grade A. Stanley is also an ISO certified institution and ranks at 105th among the best engineering institutes of India and second best women's engineering college in all of South India. Now, moving ahead with our panel, we have six dynamic speakers joining us today and it is my pleasure to moderate all these six. Thank you very much. So let me just give a small introduction about our uh, esteemed uh, panelists over here. We have Ms. Vandan Preet Mahajan, an entrepreneur having a demonstrated history of working in education management with several successful ventures into teaching, coaching, and mentoring. Her key specializations include communication skills and life skills coaching, catering to different age groups, providing personality development modules, mentoring youth with respect to skill building, language translation, curriculum development, and creative writing. Great to have you with us, ma'am. My pleasure, dear. Thank you so much for the invite. We have with us Ms. Deepa Sayal, a startup coach, keynote speaker, and entrepreneurship catalyst with incubator and incubator with 20 years of holistic experience in the information technology domain, and was recently featured in the CNBC TV18 to be amongst the 32 impactful women changing the digital world. She was also featured among the MSME top 100 women entrepreneurs in India by Sri Nitin Gadkari. Great to have a woman like you over here with us, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. We have with us Dr. Irene Kilobi. She's the founder and managing director of Brandpreneurs and Brandfluencers. She supports pioneers, visionaries, and change makers in the three subject areas of community building, corporate influence and strategy, and connecting Gen XYZ. She spent several years in companies such as BMW, Siemens, and Beyond. For four years now, she has been anchored in the startup and online scene, implementing social selling activities and implementing target group-oriented go-to-market and planning strategies. Great to have you with us, ma'am. Thank you so much. We also have with us Ms. Inga Ezra. She's a highly experienced senior team mentor, coach, facilitator, who has more than 25 years of experience working with professionals, middle-level and senior leaders at an international level in different countries and cultural contexts. The founder and developer partner of Success Engine Limited and the author of the Success Planner book, a professionally qualified, experienced and highly esteemed expert in leadership development, personal impact and performance management. Great to have with you. Great to have you with us now. Happy to be here. We also have with us Ms. Melissa Arulapan, she has spent over three decades in challenging and exciting communication roles in the corporate and consultancy sector in India. She is currently Indian, India Communications Head of US-based human data science firm, IQVIA. She was earlier Vice President and Director, Development, Corporate Voice, Weber Shandwick, and before that with Glaxo India. Passionate about nurturing and developing talent, Melissa is actively involved in teaching PR and running professional development initiatives. Great to have you with us, ma'am. Sorry, thank you. Delighted to be here. Yeah. And then we also have with us Mr. Sunil Robert, reputation builder through relationships. Whether it was hardcore sales in, in Eureka Forbes or technical sales for a Swedish firm or being a brand custodian for a top bank in Hyderabad, it was and will always be about people and heart-to-heart -heart connections for him. He is blessed to have found platforms with both small and large corporations to showcase his talents. 
In recent times, he had the privilege to speak and share his experience at reputed fora, including a TEDx event. It's amazing to have you with us, sir. Thank you. Great to be here. Right. So now we're moving on ahead with our panel. That is build your network, your true network. I think everyone has a different view of network. Like I feel that you know we all have different views of how exactly a network works, and and it has been developing over the years for us. So I'd like each one of you to give a few few points or maybe share your view upon what you think is a network. Like I'd, I'd like to start. I'd like Mr. Uh, Dr. Irene Kilby to start, please. Dr. Irene? I'm unmuting myself. Yes, hello. Yeah, it's, um, we have to define what is, in fact, a definition of a network, right? And um, nowadays, I like to use the term community more often. So what is, in fact, a community? And I love this definition. A community is a group of people who pursue a common goal, cultivate common interests, and feel committed to common values. So we see you clearly emphasis is on the common, and then we have three aspects here: goal, interest, and values. So there needs to be a common ground why people come together. There can be many different reasons because they, they share the same interest, they have the same profession, or they um, want to pursue a certain mission. So that's, in fact, for me, a community or, in a greater sense, a network. Yes, ma'am, I agree with your uh, opinion. It, it really shows that, yes, community uh, shows community could be built up from different things. It could be sharing passion, sharing so anything. Yes, thank you. I'd like uh, Ms. Melissa to add in her views to this piece. Uh, ma'am, could you please unmute yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll stay unmuted now. I think, yeah, I completely agree. And I think I would also add that a professional group is really, uh, I mean, a, a net, professional network is really a very, very strong platform for building connections. Um, and I think the emphasis here really is on connections, on relationships, and on shared interests. Um, and I mean, I'd say share, shared interests with a caveat, because sometimes it might not just it might not necessarily be about shared interest, but those shared interests really helps build value um, to a professional network. Um, personal networks, on the other hand, are more at a very operate at a very different level, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But I think it's important to understand that, particularly for all those in attendance here and the students, is that you can have a personal network, you can have a professional network. Um, and they both serve very different purposes. But a personal network is more about your own interests and values. It's it's about connecting with people who matter a lot to you on a very personal level. A professional network looks at it from a professional aspect and what you aspire to be, what you want to create, what you want to connect, what you want to be seen as um, in a professional sense. Yes, ma'am, that is absolutely correct. Professional and personal networks, two very important networks, yet very different. So, yes, we'll get into it soon. Um, we'll get into that uh, detail. And I'd like Mr. Sunil Roberts to please add in a few points. Sure. Uh, what I was fascinated was um, by the usage of the term uh, community. Um, the word community and the word communication have the same root word, common, communal. Uh, in fact, the word communion, uh, which is used in, in uh, religious terms, is actually find a, finding a connection or what is common between God and humanity, that kind of thing. So every time you find something in common with somebody or a group, you're, you're finding uh, communication happening and community happening. In fact, uh, the word that I wanted to share, I'd like to borrow from Seth Gordon, who popularized this whole notion of tribes. A tribe is a certain small group of community where, which exhibits a certain type of common behavior. Let me give you an example. Back in the day when I was growing up in Hyderabad, I used to be part of multiple groups. 
if i was playing cricket near engineering college grounds then all the friends from the engineering college area and in my area where we used to play cricket we are all from the cricketing community many years later i went to the yuvavani english all india radio sort of a circle and back in the day we did not have much uh, western music so all the community that was part of the western music community was a thriving uh, tribe to which i belong a few years later i was part of a debating circle in hyderabad uh, in the second part ymca so all the intellectual type of a crowd and again these are communities so uh, the music guys used to look down on the intellectual type of a guys the intellectual type took down so each tribe demonstrates certain behaviors and depends on which community you want to go and be a part of it has a certain set of behaviors a certain dynamic that go on inside and uh, you want to join that then you go and uh, aspire to be a part of that and so on and so forth but in my view i wanted to propound this notion that we are all tribal in nature and the faster we adhere to the tribal norms culture behavior the faster we become an insider otherwise we will never be part of that tribe yes sir. so adopting to the the culture that you're saying as you're saying is basically like getting ourselves become that uh, you know get into that common thing that that community is built on like the basic that the common factor that every individual has uh, if we get that then we will be a part of the community right Yes. So uh, I'd like Miss uh, Inga to share her uh, views on this. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I um, I was uh, really impressed and inspired by uh, Sanil sharing a quote by uh, Seth Godin. As uh, I was going to start with Seth Godin's quote as well, so we are very much aligned. As uh, I see a uh, community, uh, I see uh, the network uh, definitely uh, as a uh, community. However, I look at uh, it from a slightly different angle, which is. Uh, adding value so uh, network that uh, as i see it uh, it's the purpose of building network is that uh, we're being part of network how can i add value to others and uh, have value from others so it's a win win situation uh, if you are uh, being part uh, of some network either for career development business development building friendships and support uh, network whichever network it is it's uh, from my perspective it's about value and um why i mentioned said godin now uh, one of the quotes i love uh, by him is that uh, he says build trust before you need it building trust uh, right when you want to sail it's too late and um believe it or not we are selling something to someone each and every day either we are selling the idea to our kids that they need to uh, get up from the bed and uh, go to brush their teeth or we are selling the idea uh that um the teacher needs to kind of give us a better mark uh, if we are uh, if we are going to school or we are selling idea to someone collaborate with us it's about uh, personality marketing and sales so uh through network we can build the value in advance so that we build trust with other people from perspective that uh, they uh, really get to know us and we get to know them and it's easier later on when we want to accomplish some project or um get uh, promoted or uh, get offered some uh, dream job opportunity uh, or um, attract ideal clients coming to us it's easier as uh, we have already network of people who know how we are adding value who trust us who likes us uh, and uh, who are happy to support us and likewise it's uh, as i mentioned it should be win win situation that part of the network uh, we also promote other people we share other people message and uh, we help each other so that's the kind of uh, my perspective on network it's how do we add value on and build trust through having and building network right now, that is a really very really, uh, good way to view network it is uh, like in the good way how we do it building trust is definitely very important and how we build trust maintain it and then keep adding values to it that's a very uh, good idea thank you i'd like miss bandan also to please uh, throw some light on this yeah so asha i'd like to start off by saying that first of all this lockdown period during the covid 19 has been more of a great pause period for all of us it has given us a lot of try, you know time to introspect to have time for self reflection and it was during these days only that i realized that we all tend to invest in our money but are we actually investing in our relationships 
I think even as a person, if I consider myself, my personal example, I think I've been spending days and nights worrying and scurrying about money, finances, and I think I've plugged my assets and liabilities into online retirement, uh, you know, calculators in an attempt to forecast my future worth. Uh, so when I was into this phase of introspection, I think it proved to be very truthful. And then I realized that if I really wanted to assess my present or predict my future for that matter, I think I was spending way too much time focusing on the value of the wrong set of assets. And soon I arrived at the realization that in one's portfolio, social capital is far more important than any other asset, than any other financial capital. Now, I believe that seeking out and working in collaboration with others who share your same values, I think uh, a lot of my co-panelists use these words, values, interests, and passions. So I think uh, networking is all about being a VIP, sharing values, interests, and passions. And they go on to provide you a stronger foundation to reach greater heights in terms of both success and happiness, and which in turn... You know, it actually helped me build a strong and enduring interpersonal safety net as well that I know as of now, as of today, has the capacity to, you know, help me sail through even any financial calamity that I may face in the future as well. So having said that, having given my personal exemplar, uh, I would like to quote uh, Sir Richard Branson here, who once said that networking helps to bring value to others and yourself through the power of connections. I think something that uh, Dr. Irene started off with, and I think it's all about collaborating the roles of the head, heart, and of course, the wallet. So that's really important. And I think networking is for those people who believe that, uh, you know, who are firm believers of the never eat alone theory. So as uh, Dr. Inga said, it should be a win-win situation for everybody, right? So, uh, and uh, I would also like to just uh, give a brief about, uh, you know, this recent book that I read by uh, Porter Gate. Uh, your network is your net worth. And I'd just like to state a few key takeaways about what she has to say on networking. So she says that, I mean, uh, see, we are thriving in a, or surviving in a VUCA world. VUCA as in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And we are seeing these whole lot of shifting cultural values, and there is this explosion of digital technology across. So this is the time when we actually need to, uh, you know, network using the three E's. Now, what are these three E's? We need to ensure that we work in a more in network, in a more efficient, in a more enjoyable, and in a more effective manner. So, uh, I see networking has, you know, actually um, even moved from a, from being just a transactional game to being a transformational phenomenon. And networking 2.0, therefore, is all about point number one: networking around you, your beliefs, your values that you share with others. Second, it is about establishing lasting relationships. Third, it is about incurring personal transformation as well. Fourth, it is cre about creating tangible wealth. And fifth, last but definitely not the least, it is also about finding happiness and success. So that's my take on networking. So that is actually a really good uh, way that you have described networking. It, it gives like every idea, like how we should, you know, go forward and, move, you know, build our own networks. So, yes, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you very much. That was very nice. And I'd like Ms. Deepa Sayal to please uh, enlighten us with what network is for you and how would you, you know, define it? So, Aisha, I think all the seasoned speakers have summarized this in a very good manner as to what is network. I'll pick it up beyond uh, the next part, which I think would be relevant to the engineering students when right? I say hybrid work culture. So what is happening today is that we are building collaborative work cultures across the world. You know, So when it is creating, as, as uh, Bandhan has beautifully put it, that interpersonal skill is very, very important if you're wanting to build something meaningful, not only just as a human being personal, but even on the professional part where you are trying to build hybrid work cultures to build an impact. I'll give you a small, very small recent example. Uh, during the COVID, uh, I was smitten by this passion of building my network, and we conceptualizing and creating this event. And surprised that I am, in the last two months, through the network, we have come to know so many people, at least hundreds of mentors, hundreds of mentors, who have joined the brigade with us, and we are able to create a ripple effect, which is meaningful to about two lakh eyeballs, as students, business professionals, so that is the power of network. Going forward, the pandemic has changed the denomination for us. 
we would have people sitting in different geographies connecting to each other like we are doing today and making such meaningful conversations that can impact lives for so many other children, professionals, and especially the engineering students who might be listening to this conversation. So very lucky all of them are to get to know from so many seasoned people. It's very important to build your network and invest. When we say invest and build a network, that means creating something which is meaningful to others. There's something that I'd like to put which is very candid. Some people may or may not agree, but I also think that your true net worth is beyond the brand that you work for. It is what you cultivate within yourselves and create an impact like a pond in the pond, you know, a ripple in the pond. So I think it's about making meaningful life stories, impacting others, building collaborative work cultures, and the best part is give before you receive. So, you know, people say there are no free lunches and stuff, but I'd say you give and you get back. And that it has to be meaningful. And then comes the commercial realization for Bond. But first, build lucrative but healthy relationship with other human beings. Yeah, That's and Deepa, brief summary. Deepa ji, if you allow me, I would just like to add one more line to what you just said. So, and that is uh, when you said it's all about giving and you know that thing. So it's give, give, and then get. So Correct. you know, focus more on the giving part of it and less on the getting part of it. So uh, uh, that was really beautifully expositioned by you. In, in fact, uh, when um, uh, one of our panelists was speaking. It reminded me of an Indian, uh, or even it's very popular in South of India. I don't know about the rest of India. There's a saying that says, you dig a well long before you're thirsty. Yeah. So this whole notion of drawing water from a well happens not when you're thirsty. <laughs> Somebody dug a well with the intent of giving and giving and giving. And so if you want to draw from the well, Somebody had to dig first, right? I mean, it's a powerful metaphor for us to, to grapple and have this notion. Because in today's generation of young people, particularly the engineering students that are possibly listening, it's just easy for you to assume that everything was out there. I mean, Melissa, uh, would, uh, whom I know for past uh, two, three decades, would tell you that it wasn't like that. It was carefully cultivating relationships and then working in a professional manner. So dig the well before you're thirsty. Yeah, that is really very good. I was just going to say that same, use the same term, Sunil, which is cultivating uh, relationships. And I think that's extremely important. That whole process of cultivation is actually an art and a science in itself. Uh, and I think that's the caution that everyone needs to also tread with because it's not just about developing relationships for the sake of developing relationships. There has to be a goal uh, in mind and you know you need to be guided with what by what you want to achieve through this network that you build because you can build various kinds of networks but at the end of the day while you may give you also at some point want to get from this and I think that's important. Absolutely very well said. Yes. I would also like to add something. Um, I really like what uh, Mr. Singer Isaira said um, about adding value, you know, because we all have limited time, right? So you got to give people a reason why they should be um, entering your network. So they got to feel like I'm better off being part of your network rather than being alone or being part of another network because we have a lot of choice, right, out there. So that's a very major point I have to emphasize on because time is valuable and um, why should I be spending one hour or even more hours with you if you're not adding any value to what I need at the moment? Yes, ma'am, that, that's true. That's really true that, you know, adding values and uh, as, a, as the panelist said that, yes, building yourself is important first and then, you know, giving, giving, giving is important. And then, you know, what we get. So that really does build a strong relationship. And it's not just for the sake of relationship, as like uh, Ms. Melissa said. It's supposed to be, you know, with a goal that we have. So I must say, I'm really amazed by, you know, your ideology that all of, uh, all of the panelists have put out here. So, yes, now since the, the point about uh, COVID came in, like how Ms. Deepa said. So it is like, uh, you know, um, how Ms. Deepa and Ms. Bandhan also did add into it that we have COVID, uh, you know, it is just, it is a very huge change 
into networking. I mean, normally we go networking. It's it's usually you know one on one, and we contact. It is mostly socializing on you know physical level. But now everything is shifted to digital one, social media, and you know everything like that. So I'd like to ask all of you that you know how is it that the networking has changed, and how should it be now during the COVID times, that is during this pandemic, and after you know the post COVID. So I'd like Mr. Inga to please start, and then we can continue. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, the times have changed, and uh, the way how we approach, communicate, and add value is uh, slightly changing uh, during these uh, tough times as well. However, uh, I'd like to look at it from kind of uh, opportunities and positive perspective, as um, this uh, COVID time has uh, taught us uh, to be more flexible, to be innovative, and uh, to find, uh, look for, and find other ways uh, how we can approach, uh, how we can build network, how we can collaborate. And of course, now it's um, one of uh, great opportunities to collaborate with people, not just locally, but uh, also globally, as uh, if before, uh, we uh, thought we need to travel to other countries. Uh, uh, it took a long time to uh, fly five, six, seven, eight hours across the globe uh, or to an, uh, another continent. But currently, we are, look at us uh, here, we are connected here from, uh, even from different time zones. Uh, somebody has a morning, uh, somebody lunchtime, uh, or late evening, or night even. So um, it's uh, now this COVID time, uh, I'd look at uh, what are opportunities that we can utilize. And now it's building network and expanding even more on global basis and uh, learning uh, from people who are um, completely different from you, who are from a different country, different geography, a different religion, different uh, culture, different uh, habits. What is it that we can learn from each other uh, to uh, keep developing ourselves and keep sharing again and adding value to others? So uh, I think this COVID time gives us, um, well, it, it is challenging indeed and uh, it's tough. Uh, however, uh, it gives us opportunity to um, be more flexible, innovative, creative, and uh, think how else we can connect and add value to others. Right. So social distancing led us to internetworking. Distancing networking. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Could you please yes, sir, please add in your uh, points to it, sir, about how social distancing has led to internet working and social media. I was actually um, um, I've I've been on LinkedIn for about uh, 15 years now, but what I discovered was you, you have to have a very strong purpose. Uh, and the strategy, what you do on LinkedIn. Uh, I get so many uh, requests, not because I'm I'm famous like Seth Godin or something like that, but uh, I had uh, done some work, I'd written a couple of books, I'd given a TED Talk. So many young people connect with me uh, saying, sir, I'd like to get connected with you. But once I accept it, they just vanish. And uh, I, I'm always uh, interested what happens. Why do people network? Is it for a vanity metric that says, oh, I have X number of uh, LinkedIn followers or Instagram uh, followers? Is it for vanity? Or do you use these tools for a very specific purpose of job hunting, build, building uh, skills and talents, uh, developing a plan for your career? If you're an entrepreneur connecting for different things. So, so what's really the end game here? So in LinkedIn, what I found for many years, I just let it grow organically because I had a day job and I was not exactly looking for a job because most people think of LinkedIn as a job hunting tool and not for either adding or delivering value through a social channel. So this whole mindset has to change. And that happened during COVID. And during COVID, for professional engagement, LinkedIn happened to be the only platform that allowed us to have any form of professional connections. Uh, if I had to care about this particular event, there is a good chance that I would have either done this on LinkedIn or tweeted it, but not put it on, let's say, Facebook or or uh, Insta, uh, although some of you guys are also using that, that channel very well. But for professional development, LinkedIn and Twitter are seen as the right channels. and. In COVID times, I really was able to use these two, two channels and revive them. Why? Because for a long time, I was just letting connections come to me. But during the pandemic, 
I, I started seeing that there was a need for me to rebuild my network, reconnect with people who, who had common interests and start building my own community. What's the end game here? Like I said, I don't know. As of now, I don't, uh, like, I'm not thirsty yet in the sense to go and ask somebody for a favor. But if ever I find somebody in the network who might be able to help me out, then I don't want to go to them at the time I, I need because I've already wired this relationship way ahead and I've been posting and I've been sharing and I've been giving my own experience on LinkedIn. Hopefully that connection will be live. See, a network is as strong as the live nodes. Uh, pardon me if I use an electronics and communications jargon uh, because that's my core uh, undergraduate uh, expertise. If you're an engineering student, you understand networks are as strong as the live nodes. If somebody is in your network and that person is not live and is not communicating or sending pulses, then that, that particular part of the network is dead. So if you want a truly vibrant network, which is live, kicking, uh, throbbing with activity, all these nodes on your network should be wired and you need to continuously keep sending information in order to keep it live. So pandemic allowed me to reactivate my network and keep it live. Yeah, so I shall let me take it, uh, you know, again, take the question that you asked in terms of what has been the pandemic effect. And I'd look yes. at it from, from women and networking because we're largely a women's, we are a women's college, right? Yes. Uh, so, you know, and I think let's look at while you talked about traditional networking and the physical networking, let me also add that that's not been true of women by large. In fact, one of the biggest challenges that women have faced is the opportunity to network because it's largely yes. a boys' club. And, you know, in India, we also have kind of domestic cores and responsibilities, which have prevented women from giving that time to work men traditionally, with all due offense to uh, Sunil over here. So I think the pandemic has in some ways been an opportunity because it's created a level playing field for one, where everybody is networking in the same manner. Two, it has increased the opportunities to virtually network. I think while, you know, there was virtual networks earlier, whether it's LinkedIn or whatever it is, there was also a hesitancy to do so. But now I think, you know, that hesitancy has gone away because everybody's in the virtual world and people are becoming more comfortable with the virtual and digital platform, whatever they might be. So I think it's opened up tremendous avenues for women to actually network. Um, and as uh, Sunil again has said, I think LinkedIn has been a great opportunity. Uh, but I'd also again over here, you know, say with caution that we need to know how to use these platforms best. I mean, we've seen a lot of comments on LinkedIn, for instance, saying this is not the platform where somebody should be sharing personal stuff on, on LinkedIn. So I think it's a question of knowing where to network, what you want to do, what your goals are, and then choosing the platform that best need, meets the requirements of the goals. But all in all, from a pandemic point of view, I think it's been a great opportunity, actually, for women in particular um, and, and everyone's equal right now. Plus, the fact mm -hmm. is that you're not necessarily only networking within your own geography. Because of the pandemic, we're also now used to working in a larger geographical context, multi-country context. And so it's opened up avenues. You know, you, you're not... You don't hesitate anymore about reaching out to people in another country because it's not about whether you'll be able to meet them or when you will be able to meet them anymore. Your virtual environment is your meeting ground today. And I think that's opened up avenues as well. Yes, indeed. Yeah. The virtualization has added a lot. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, uh, really a uh, great point that uh, now it's a great opportunity to network and uh, I, I like the idea about LinkedIn as that's one of my passion areas as well, connecting with people on LinkedIn and adding value, learning from uh, other people. Uh, one thing that I discovered that uh, we still are still... Um, uh, we still are lacking this human connection during this COVID time uh, and during this uh, pandemic lockdown time that uh, LinkedIn and social networks are great opportunity to network uh, online and uh, kind of uh, networking events that are currently happening online. However, uh, we need to remember we are still all human beings, right? And human beings need human connection, like one-to-one -one conversations. And uh, I'm passionate about personal branding and personal brand impact. So we build our brand through every little 
touch points that they have with other persons. So personal conversation, connection, comments. Um, and that's why one of the things that I encourage people to do from kind of our online networking platforms, uh, pick up the conversation and connect with uh, the person whom you resonated with on a personal level. Uh, give a call, uh, give a video call, uh, agree on a kind of one-to-one -to -one catch up time uh, to explore uh, how you can support each other currently uh, in this lockdown time, uh, what you can learn from each other, how you can share your networks, your current networks, how you can collaborate uh, for business opportunities, how you can do some uh, workshop together or a seminar together or uh, collaborate in the future. So uh, my encouragement is uh, one thing is that, uh, yes, uh, using social media platforms is fantastic, reaching a uh, wider audience. And let's remember that uh, we personally and people around us as well, we do need this personal connection. Let's, uh, let's pick up the phone as well to uh, people who are currently in our network or with whom we are building conversations or let's connect through a video call and uh, just have a personal chat uh, how they are doing and how uh, you can support each other. Asha, I'd like to carry this point over if you allow it. Sure, man, sure. Uh, I think there's some noise in the background. Uh, yeah, I think Dr. Irene was saying something. Or wait, yeah, uh, we can continue. Yes, yes. yes I just wanted to, to, to go back to your initial question. Um, which if we can see any difference um, between uh, pre-corona and post-corona time. And I can definitely see two major factors here. The first one is the open-mindedness towards building relationships more than ever before, even for those people who are introverts, because there's no other alternative. And if I can take on um, the distinction that Melissa, Ms. Melissa Arudapamp made, if we see it from a personal networking point of view, people don't want to be left outside alone, right? So they feel that they need to go out there and talk to people. On the professional side, yes, here people are noticing they will miss out on business if they are not building relationships online, right? So here you can see that people really see the need and um, the urge to do so and to build relationships online. And the other factor that I see is the speed. The speed uh, in which we can build relationships. To be honest, in real life, how many physical meetings could you take over, even though you live in the same town? Two, probably three, but now we are sitting here together. We are seven people at the same time, connecting, discussing, and we could repeat it even three, four, five times a day. In the past, when I met, for example, Bam Prit Mahajan, and I said, like, oh, I would like to further discuss with her. I would say, like, even though we're in the same country, for example, I live in Munich, so many people that I met from Berlin, they said, like, okay, once in a while, when you are in Berlin, and then it took, like, three months, five months, and then you needed several touch points, at least three, four, until you got into business, but nowadays it gets so so fast. I can I can contact someone I connected with and say, let's have a Skype or Zoom call. And then if I feel that we can somehow resonate and then we take the next Zoom call even two days later on, and then things go very, very quickly. And in fact, those are the two major factors that I noticed, open-mindedness towards relationship and the... Right, right. Yes, I agree with that one. Those two factors are really important. And yes, Ms. Vandan yeah. had to add in something, please speak to yeah. So I'd like to take it on from where uh, uh, Inga stopped. And I'd just like to say that definitely we've entered a new era where, as I mentioned, there are shifting cultural values and improved technology has actually enabled us to network in vastly improved, more focused and more enjoyable ways than, uh, you know, more than one in tune with our personal ties and passions. So I think technology has actually accelerated networking. That's the first benefit. It has reduced the degree of separation, as Dr. Irene said. So the degree of separation between contacts is actually reduced. Therefore, I think it has amplified our global playing field. And also it has redefined the job prospecting uh, you know, prospects as well. So it's today easier to find your niche communities. It's easier to find new relationships. And they are just a tweet or a, you know, or a message or a click away. So I think this uh, COVID period has been a period when it's not about 
social distancing. I think it's more about physical isolation while we've seen a whole lot of social cohesion actually taking place. Now, the thing is, uh, since we've entered into the digital space and as Dr. Uh, as Inga said, it's all about, you know, there should be a lot of human connect. So I also feel the same way. So there has to be an H2H connect, which is heart to heart or human to human connect. And using that, we need to ace what is called the digital space. So how to ace the digital space? So I'd just like to give in a few pointers for the students who are present out here and who are watching us. So I think, first of all, as each one of you said, uh, uh, there are these whole lot of uh, avenues through which you can make a whole lot of video calls now. There are instant messaging apps and all that. A new concept which has emerged, uh, you know, during this period is that uh, now that the unlockdown has started taking place in most of the areas in most of the countries, I think walking meetings is a new concept that has emerged. So uh, you just keep walking and, uh, you know, you network during that course of work. And at the same time, as you're moving your body, you're also flexing your networking muscles. And uh, see, and then as uh, Sunil Roberts uh, and Melissa Mann, as they said, when we are talking of LinkedIn, we need to ensure that you're sending, you know, personalized invites and then you're sending follow-ups. And you give time uh, to people to, you know, come back to you because you have to have that patience. You have to have that gut instinct also to understand, okay, this is how we have to go about it. And uh, another small thing which I'd like to tell to the students is that when you're, even if you're, you know, there for a video call or something, just be dressed and just be looking like as if you're in a, on a face-to-face -face meeting. So just make sure you're dressed properly. Uh, you know, you've already researched about the other person well in advance. You've prepared your questions well in advance. You focus more on the other person and less on yourself. That means you have to be an empathetic listener. And don't let it uh, let your conversation run dry, which means you have to keep some prompts ready by your uh, side, maybe in your head or maybe on your yes. In order to ensure that... And I think most of our panelists have already said use social media. So that, why do you have to keep using social media? Why are you constantly you know, creating value content? Because that helps to keep your name all the time in people's minds. And that increases your chances that you are the one that they contact that a new opportunity actually comes in. And it's also important to network within the organization. So like if your school, it's important that you network amongst yourself, be it through video calls, sending mails, or connecting with social media. And uh, coming back to COVID again, I think COVID has been a great equalizer in many ways. And uh, it has been a very real experience and everyone has been touched by this event in somewhat way or the other. And uh, I think at the same time, it has turned out to be a boost in the size for a whole lot of people. You know, look at it as an opportunity. It seems like now people are more open to new opportunities and connections and make it more So I think cons uh, you need to consider networking as a chance to make a long-term investment. I think one of the panelists again used this term as a long-term investment in your so it's not about what you can get from that relationship right now uh, when you get a chance to meet. So actually build up your relationship first and then see where it leads to uh, leads you to. So that's about goal orientation, as Melissa Nam said. So networking yes. should sound like dry folding technique. So uh, I, I just recently, you know, got to see this webinar by Ivan Meisner. And uh, he says that people who tend to take one-on-one -on -one online, at least, four times in a day, okay? So they are more likely to give two times and then return get two times back, at least two times back, not less, at least two times back. And in terms of opportunity and maximize your time, therefore, to interact with other people. And uh, you also mentioned that there are two kinds of people in the world. One, the agents who drive you further, and the other one, who are anchors who tend to weigh you down. Now, it's your, uh, you know, mental faculty, your cognitive strength, and you need to identify who are those kinds of people who are the anchors and who are the engines trying to focus on the engines? And if you're waiting, that the, let the tough time be over and then I'll start working on my business, on my networking opportunities. Believe you me, your business will be over by that time. So you have to be cautious about that. This is the right time yes. to use kind of network. So that's my yes. take on it. And obviously, uh, the way I look at it, the hybrid model that EPRG also refers to, I think the hybrid model will be something which will be both offline and online networking working in tandem with each other. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. I would really agree with that point that, yes, you know, um, as we uh, spend time and as we get into more of it, we get more of this. 
Yes, yes, true. Can I like something be done about, about the ambient noise? Uh, it's very yeah. uh, distracting. Yeah, yeah. Is there disturbance? Yeah, there is quite a bit. Okay, okay. One second, I'll just look into it. Yeah, I hope I hope you won't have the disturbance. Yes. Is it okay now? Aisha, I just also want to add that I think the students have to be prepared that given the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic has also changed the way organizations work. And the yeah. future of work yeah. talks about, you know, some of it could be completely virtual. Some could be hybrid model, but they're all explore. And students need to be prepared for this. That is where the value of online networking, I think, is going to grow because uh, one needs to invest in it. I think I need to give an example here to what Melissa Mann just said. Uh, you know, big companies like Ernst & Young, they are actually using their own workers to find new hires and that too virtually to save their time, money and effort. And at the same time, they are lengthening the odds for job seekers who don't have any connections, especially the long term and unemployed ones. The trend has been amplified since I think the 2009 recession by a tight job market and by employee networks on LinkedIn and Facebook. So which can help employers actually find candidates more quickly and bypass that reams of application forms that they use to receive from various job search sites. So I think Melissa Mann is absolutely right in saying this, that, uh, you know, the students need to be well prepared for this kind of a scenario. Yeah, yeah. And yes. I was talking of just the virtual physical work environments because that may not exist in certain organizations anymore. Right, right, right. Yes. Right. So also I'd like to ask... Um, then Ms. Deepa Sayal, uh, like uh, she's, since we were talking about how, you know, uh, what are the basic principles of how to build a network and all, and you're into entrepreneurship. So could you like give us some core principles uh, on, you know, entrepreneurship and how you can relate it to network? I mean, you know, entrepreneurship is something related to networking. So, so I, yes, I would, so everybody has summarized everything, but I'll take you on a different tangent, you know. Uh, sure, my sure. thought is towards employability. So you guys are engineering students. And before I switch on to the entrepreneurship summit or the entrepreneurship subject, we are doing an event and you can know lots about how to be an entrepreneur and how to build a network. But before that, how does networking evolve? Like you said, we are going to see companies to go to hire people remotely. Like that's point number one. There's no, no more going to be nine to five culture. That's point number two. Three, collaborative practices. So let's say collaborative practices, per se. Asana, per se. So what people are going to do is that wherever you are in the globe, wherever you are being given a collaborative tool, they're going to report out. That is a Netflix networking enablement that I see coming in. So there is basically no, uh, when you say the human part, yes, the human part is the most important part, but nobody can deny that the virtual highways are going to dominate the scenario in the next 10 years, this decade. And I would also like to tell you that companies here in India, the biggies like TCS and uh, you know, name it. Uh, any large conglomerates, they want that this country should be legalized. It should be legit now in terms of establishing and hiring people during the day, the next, next 10 years. So all you engineering students out there who are listening to this, prep up your skill set and build a network and use that to build collaborative work cultures. Coming to entrepreneurship, which was your next question. Uh, of course, personal networking, which culminates into professional networking is perhaps the most important part. So whether you can build a great company, but if you don't have a network, you cannot encash that. But that also doesn't mean that I would knock people and say, hey, I want this done, I want that done. I think it's very important to build and nurture good friendships in entrepreneurship and build, build that's what I call personal equity. What is your network oblique equity? What is deeper sales equity? So I think how valuable I can be as an entrepreneur to others. So I'll give you a small example. There's a lady who's not me, who's building an e-commerce business and she needs help. And she's told me, please help me. She's using her network. I'm a friend. And she says, please help me start my entrepreneurial venture on e-commerce. She builds children products. So these are some of the things that we need to understand. Blurring time zones is also important. She can hire somebody in Germany, in US. I have had my people in US working with me three to four hours every day. I have a guy who works in Bangladesh. So, you know, there's no more geographical, you know, there's no geofencing. The world is my play area. And my friends, 
they, some of them are happily, you know, we want to join with you. Let's work together. So in a meaningful way, which is valuable to other women, other entrepreneurs. I hope I'm not stretching long, you know, I would rather be brief and not like, you know, go on and on and on. Other women and <laughs> men. Other women and men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there's one more thing that I'd like to add. One is nurturing twins. So I'll give you a beautiful example that I made a connect with, let's say, Irene here, or Bandan here, or, or Inga here, or Melissa here, or Sunil. Now, I'm going to nurture that trail. I, I met Aisha. How do I, this is an art, you know, how do I nurture that trail? So like Sunil said, that people connect with me, and then they vanish. So why do you want to connect with the person? And would you be able to? you know, convert it to something meaningful, leading to an outcome which is philanthropic, which is not like commercial. So these are the basic principles in entrepreneurship that we, so this is the core. While I built my company in the last 12 years. Now what? Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to um, add to what uh, Deepa, you are sharing that um, completely agree that uh, it's, it's really important uh, how um, we connect, uh, nurture relationships, and um, again, I'll say add value to uh, others as well. Uh, and uh, there is one tip that I'd like to uh, share with uh, students who are looking into entrepreneurship journey or into career development uh, journey as well. Uh, before we go networking, we have to be crystal clear on uh, what um, I think uh, Bandit said uh, before as well, what's our passion and uh, what are our values, what do we represent? And uh, what are our goals? What do we want to achieve? And then package that in um, uh, 60 seconds uh, unique value proposition. So uh, who you are, what you do, whom you help, uh, how you help, uh, how you, uh, what's the outcome that uh, your uh, customer, collaboration partner, or employer uh, will receive by working with you. Uh, and that's uh, called uh, other, some people call it a unique value proposition. Uh, in all times, it was called unique sales proposition, but uh, nobody likes to be sold to. So uh, I'd li rather focus on value. Or sometimes people call it uh, elevator pitch. Uh, I'm uh, elevator, uh, pitch, yeah. elevator pitch. Yeah, um, I'm popping up this keyword so that students can search and uh, look at it from uh, different angles while developing their pitch. But um, before going into networking, we have to be crystal clear how we introduce ourselves so that. People with whom we talk, they really get it. They get it, how you are helping, who is uh, your potential customer or employer, how you are adding value. As if we are not clear ourselves and we don't have this uh, elevated pitch or unique value proposition clearly defined and crystallized, then we might come across like mumbling, like saying, oh, oh, well, um, I'm doing this or I'm doing that, and uh, people will not get it. And they will not be able to connect with uh, with uh, us, with other people who can help or whom we can help. So this is really essential coming back to uh, your question regarding entrepreneurship particularly, but also about uh, career uh, development and career aspirations. To have this uh, elevated pitch or value proposition defined and crystallized uh, whenever we are planning to go uh, networking or uh, build relationships with others starting with clarity about ourselves, second, uh, clarity whom we are helping and how, and then what's the outcome that uh, these people will be getting by collaborating with us. Cannot agree yes, more with, yeah, cannot agree more with that because I think, you know, what you just said about the elevator pitch is so, so important. I mean, well, the first step really in building a network is deciding what your personal brand is all about and building a personal brand. And I think it has to be authentic and true to oneself. And um, particularly in students, I think, because there's just so much out there. Don't be what someone else is. Be what you are and who you are and true to yourself. I, I want yes. to actually uh, give uh, two uh, comments on, um, on uh, young people and uh, LinkedIn. Um, you guys are in the transition between let's say insta and you know snapchat world into linkedin which is a little more formal and uh, the future world so i want you to start thinking of linkedin as like your online resume your online resume should not have uh, funky pictures very cool beach pictures or you know fancy angles um, no, no, no. They should be clean, professionally short pictures 
on your uh, plate. What works in Instagram, what works in Snapchat and the other uh, private WhatsApp channels kind of a thing will not work on, on LinkedIn. It has to convey formal professional uh, story. And the second thing I want to tell you, in addition to LinkedIn being an online resume, it's also your personal story. Don't don't put uh, uh, posts that can uh, create controversies, right? I mean, if you want to be seen as a serious job hunter or a serious budding entrepreneur, uh, you don't want to get into areas which are inflammatory in nature. For example, if India uh, during their first innings got all out uh, for a particular amount, don't go and vent on LinkedIn, for example. That's not the the place. I mean, it's a game. It has its ups and downs. One day they do great and the other day they don't do great. Forget LinkedIn to do venting. It's a formal channel. And and, and I can't tell you how, how often recruiters just scan and look for clues about whether there are any red flags on a LinkedIn um, uh, profile. Not so much a LinkedIn profile, but all your profiles if, if you are found easily on your thing. So any digital trail that you leave on social media has the potential to come back and and uh, and affect you negatively in your job hunt. So other things being equal, if a recruiter sees a different persona between your formal and your informal online behavior, you are likely to lose that game. So be very careful of your online presence, online image, because that's what that's even before people actually call you, they quickly Google search you. How often does somebody send you a request and you immediately look up that person even before you accept their request or, and, and uh, what type of a person, particularly for women, for example, for young ladies, you want to be careful of all about your online reputation as well. So what sort of a LinkedIn connection are you making is a very important question. So just remember, Online resume, online story. If you are not doing these two well, your story won't sell. Yes, that, that is like a part of a personal uh, branding, but in a professional way. Like LinkedIn offers that. Yes, that is truly right. So I'd like to ask Dr. Irene, uh, like you are into personal branding and networking, right? So how important is personal branding in networking? Like, could you like just elaborate a few? On that? Oh. Uh, personal branding is very important in networking, right? It's also the question, um, do you always need to approach people or do also people approach you because you're somehow interesting? And I always say like you can have certain certain skills, certain competencies, but it's for vain if nobody out there knows about it, right? I always say like, so it's good to be an expert, but what kind of value can you take out of it if no one knows about you, doesn't know what kind of skills you have and how you can add value in fact, right? And um, so building a major personal brand means that you're visible, people know what you stand for, people know what your purpose is, and also um, what is your unique value proposition? What is the that you can do better than anyone else? And I always say you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel Right, but it can also be like you you have um, adopted a certain methodology, but from a different angle than anyone else, or it's about your personality. It's all about personality. Just to compare, there can be um, five very good um, mechanical engineers out there, but at the end of the day, it's also your personality that will bring you into the game. So um, I would always always recommend you to. Um, always build a, a brand around yourself if you put yourself out there online, because that will be your ticket in the future. Anyhow, if you wanna progress your career, if you wanna build a company, right? If you're looking for a co-founder, if you have a great personal branding, you will likely um, attract better co-founders also. Or if um, you wanna do a research paper, what's the app? Anyhow, any um, initiative, any project that you want to run, if people perceive you as a great person or brand, they will likely want to work for, with you and they will chase after you and not the other way around. 
Yes, yes, that's really true. We have uh, Ms. Engash, you, um, um, Ma'am, you run like uh, programs on personal branding for like leaders, professionals, etc. So I'm pretty sure you agree with the, you know, the idea that Dr. Irene is placing forward. So could you, could you tell like how does that personal branding that you run in your program help for the people in engaging in networking basically? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I'm very passionate about personal brand impact uh, for um, either career professionals or entrepreneurs. As uh, for example, I'll uh, quickly share a practical story that uh, I applied for a job uh, when I was still in corporate career. I, I applied for a job just once uh, to my first job uh, more than 25 years ago. All the other um, promotions, uh, job opportunities, uh, job offers, came to me either through my network, uh, through people whom I knew personally, through recruiters uh, who discovered me through network, or through LinkedIn. So this is the beauty of uh, collaborating, building network, and adding value to others, and uh, building your personal brand and personal impact. And there was one uh, really uh, interesting situation a few years ago. I think it was uh, four or five years ago. I was still in my last uh, corporate job before moving to uh, building my own business uh, in personal brand development. And uh, I got a call. I was uh, sitting in London uh, in the office uh, looking after 23 countries as HR director. And I got a call from uh, Buenos Aires uh, from Argentina, from Headhunter, who was uh, originally from Scotland. So she was a Scottish lady, moved to uh, Argentina, working in Headhunting company. And she was sourcing for HR director in Russia. So uh, how globally connected is the world that uh, she discovered my profile on LinkedIn, called uh, and uh, offered uh, opportunity of job in some other country. So this is how uh, when you build your profile, you attract, as uh, Dr. Arin said, uh, you attract uh, inbound inquiries. People start reaching out to you uh, instead of you uh, constantly reaching out to others. So that's a practical uh, kind of example of how you can build your career uh, through LinkedIn and uh, through your brand. What I'm teaching in uh, my program, so far, uh, personal brand uh, development for professionals and uh, for entrepreneurs as well, is that uh, the essence is don't take it. Uh, be really truthful to who you are uh, as a person. Keep developing who you are. Uh, keep improving your skills, your uh, character, your personality impact. Uh, constantly keep developing that um, don't uh, make it and don't pretend to be someone else as uh, people feel it and uh, as uh, Dr. Ryan said uh, they will compare uh, and uh, I think uh, Samuel said that as well that uh, they, people will compare what they see on social media and how you are in person so you want to be congruent with uh, who you are, how you come across and uh, how you build your brand to represent who you truly are and how you add value. And then the beauty what happens is that uh, people who will reach out to you uh, and uh, who will connect, they will offer you opportunities that you are really great at, that you can really shine by adding value. If you try to be someone else and build a brand uh, based on someone else's image, then um, again, uh, people will, will reach out to you and offer you something that you're not great at. And uh, you will not be a happy person doing something that you're not great at. So that makes yes. sense to be truthful to who you are and build your brand and impact and share your unique value proposition in a way that really tells the story of who you are, how you help, and what other people will benefit from uh, collaborating with you. And uh, another thing that I really want to uh, flag here is that um, when you build your brand, you also gain stronger self-confidence and self-awareness. As through personal brand development, you clarify who you really are, and through that, uh, you clarify how you add value to others. And doing that, uh, your confidence increases. As working with um, young professionals and uh, professionals in the industry, I think that sometimes uh, quite a few of us need to increase the confidence level on um, how I come across, uh, how I communicate, how I have, how I can add value. And through personal brand development um, happens that you can increase the confidence levels by more clarity of who you are as a person. 
Yes, ma'am. So basically, the idea is that being true to yourself is definitely going to get you into something that you will perfectly fit. Once you are fake about it, once you're building someone else's brand, and then you know getting into it, you won't be happy later. So that's really true. I think it depends. It depends on the personal as well as professional network. Like I like to ask Miss Melissa that, uh, like as you said in the beginning, that you know personal and professional networks they are different. Yet they seem to they share the same ideology. Could you please elaborate on that and how important it is for personal branding for both the way, the like personal and professional. So I think where the students, I guess, are at that cusp, right, where they're moving from building their personal brand to uh, building their professional brand, it's a very different world. Um, and I think the personal brand is largely built by the Facebooks of the world, the Instagrams, the Snapchats that Sunil talked about, where it's all about having fun. It's all about sharing feelings, the venting about the cricket match, your opinions, and you're in a far more secure space in some of them. You know, you can choose who wants, who you want to uh, be friends with, who sees your site. You can set your privacy settings. You can do all of that in some of them, not all of them. Um, and so it's a very, very controlled environment. And then suddenly you're getting into this open space like LinkedIn, you know, where you can't really set your privacy settings to determine who sees you, who doesn't see you. And therefore, it's a far more evolved mechanism. And I think a lot more focus now has to be, you know, you're stepping out, you're growing from... Uh, you know, babyhood into adulthood, so to speak. And and your everything changes suddenly because you're networking with a very different group of people. It's not necessarily your friends. You're moving out of your comfort zone. And I think a lot of investment, therefore, has to go into building your professional networks because it's all about what your end goal is, um, what you want, you know, what's your sense of purpose, what's your identity. And it's not just something that is short term in the here and now. You've got to look at it at least a few years ahead and what you want to be seen as, what you want to build yourself as. And, you know, when Inga talked, it's also not about, you know, when she, and it's very important for the students to remember, it's not about something that's static, right? It's constantly evolving, it's dynamic. Who you are today may be slightly different. I mean, you've got to keep revisiting your profile. I do that. I mean, even as an exercise on LinkedIn, I keep revisiting my profile, seeing if it really is me, whether there's something I want to add, whether there's something else that matters, that, you know, in terms of how I've evolved or where I want to be seen in, or maybe certain other new areas of interest, uh, you know, that have grabbed me that, that need to be showcased in that. So it's constantly evolving. But I think, you know, it's important to determine really what is it you want to get out of each of these spaces that you are in. If you're on Facebook, what do you want Facebook to do for you? If you're on, you know, Facebook is far more, I think, comfortable space because it's it's a more, it's more internal to you and your friends and everything. And you can control a lot more. But once you go out, for instance, on Instagram, you know, it's, it's, a, it's more public. You can determine whether you want that Instagram profile of yours to be personal or, or professional and then kind of you know, the content will determine really uh, by what you want it to be. But I think it's also important to, uh, for me, for instance, I'm on different platforms, but each of my platforms serves a very different purpose. So my Instagram is all about, you know, the color in my life, my travels, and some of my food, some of all of that. Now, that's not something I'm going to talk about necessarily on Twitter unless occasionally, and it's not something I uh, will talk about on LinkedIn unless there's some kind of a link and, you know, then I will talk about it or bring in relevance. But otherwise, it makes no sense. If I'm at the end of the year and I'm reflecting on what the year has meant to me at a personal level, nobody really wants to hear about me necessarily on LinkedIn. Now, that's something you might talk about on a different platform, but on LinkedIn, you might want to know about what have you learned from a professional perspective in 2020. You know? So I think it's very, very important to be able to kind of and it's an exercise in itself. It's not easy, you know, building your, it's an art and a science, all of it. I mean, there's so much of analytics also available today and students can leverage those analytics to determine what works. I mean, even if you're looking at hashtags, what hashtags make sense, what hashtags don't make sense, you know, what are the things that you want to follow, people, influencers that you want to follow. You know, you can get lists, you can get data, you can get analytics. There's just so much available. I think the question is to make meaningful information and take meaningful insights from all of this. Don't get, you know, um, overwhelmed by all of it. But take what is absolutely necessary for you and use that meaningfully. I want to just share a, a personal uh, example. For example, even on this panel, I yes. am so uh, thankful because I'm just so surrounded by such wisdom and uh, 
in, insights laced with experience, right? Uh, I, I happen to know Melissa for more than 20 years and Bandan for the last one year. Um, and uh, what I found is what you are in real life, the, the character and the mindset that you bring actually translates into social media as well. You can't be uh, a very seemingly nice guy in real life and just be completely your online persona can't be completely detached or divorced from your core personality. So you really need to learn to understand the rules of these platforms before you actually start putting yourself out there. Uh, again, like I said, uh, arguments uh, are being uh, very uh, vocal about topics. Now, there is a space for online activism. Don't get me wrong. People have changed the world using these uh, online platforms. During the Arab Spring, the platforms like Twitter and Facebook literally helped a lot of activism go go wild. So there are there is a place for activism, but LinkedIn is not uh, it. Yes, yes, sir. That is that is true. It is like you need to know the platform before you get onto it and you put out, you know, yourself. There is a way how we show ourselves in front of our friends, and it differs when we do it professionally. Also, I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Sunil Roberts that since you spoke about community, like that is something that forms the basic, you know, the basis, the base of uh, you know, networking. And uh, since we have the topic also as true network, could you tell us like what uh, exactly would you define a good network and a bad network as? I mean, of course, it depends depends on the you know entirely on how the person is viewing it. But you know how the community will influence a network to be good or bad. Sure. So there are two, three elements to it, and I want to just be br very brief about it. So I'll I'll just quick throw some pointers. Let's say you're trying to build a connection with an influencer. You must realize that that influencer gets hundreds of requests every day. So how can you be different, right? What makes that influencer just not randomly accept? But even after you accept, engage with you. So there is this um, a, a, a coming into the network. But what if after you engage with him, the person doesn't respond to your in-mails or in, in messages or LinkedIn private messages, which means you have him, but it's still a dead node in that sense. That person is not responding. And so some of these problems can be overcome because particularly students are, you know, right now not yet in the workforce. So they don't really... It's like when you go for a job interview, what experience do you have? Are, are baba, mere, mere paas experience hai toh, then I wouldn't I'd be able to be called a fresher. No? It's like a chicken and egg kind of a situation. So that's where you need to demonstrate that you are not just here to get it, but also receive it. Uh, I mean, give it. And, and that's where the question you ask also um, becomes very important, saying, let's say this executive that you're trying to patao as, or charm or connect or engage has a few pet passions you research the person and you and you try and write a personalized email to that person saying you know i heard i know you are very passionate about pets this is what is my experience in in dealing with pets and find that common building bridges is what they they say in the world of communication so when once you start building those bridges that person will stay uh, take notice of, of you and then your worth relative to that person starts gaining because uh, he, he could potentially give you a testimonial. He could potentially open a door for you. Obviously, you're going, uh, you know, Hyderabad, they say that it's very When you say that. When you go to somebody for a, an explicit need, they'll, they'll look at you and say, it's very much. He's coming to me because of this obvious agenda. But long before, if you had established this connection and you were building on commonalities, building on, on things that bring emotional connection between the two, then this work favor is only an incidental, inevitable outcome. Like uh, uh, Inga was sharing, all her job referrals came from the network. And, and that's true. And, and I'm sure everyone else has stories like that to share on this panel. Once you become part of the network, the network starts rewarding you. But to get reward from the network, you have to first invest in the network. In fact, uh, the uh, legendary uh, leadership coach, Stephen Covey, said beautifully, he says it's like an emotional bank account. 
even among friends we see it even among parent children you see it among spouses you see it if one person in the two is always drawing from the relationship that relationship bank account becomes red it goes into debt so if if i have to draw from that person i also need to give in to this person see why do some parent children relationships or two friendships go sour because one person from the two has just been drawing out of it it's a fundamental principle of life this currency of emotional bank account right after that emotions run dry you are not able to connect so but if you are constantly emotional making deposits into a relationship on linkedin or even whatever is your network you are building that capital that bandhan talked about in the initial part of the conversation social capital relational capital and then you are able to draw it when you so badly need it so in other words how much you give in to the network it's like you the power of compounding the power of you know multiplying of a network comes together when you give in the initial parts and that's why you should start very early you can't wait to graduate out of stanley college of engineering and then say ki maine maine graduate ho gaya now i am ready you have to start now and use that time as runway to kind of take off at the right time and i think uh, sir sir as you just mentioned it's about connections i think uh, it's more about uh, you know creating symbiotic relationships and let's not have parasitic relationships where you're just wanting to derive from the other person and not giving back anything so i think it's more about symbiotic relationships when it comes to uh, you know networking so that's the way it should be yes yeah i would just like to also to, to highlight um networking can take so many different facets right many people ask me oh um how did uh, did you get connected to a certain person um and i say like it's always like 60% comes from my existing network through referrals and recommendations 30% people approaching me that they know me before just because of my social media presence and 10% me myself getting in touch with people i want to connect with you know so it's not just like okay uh, rest your back and everyone will come to, to you but still you have to put something effort and your energy in there and to go back to your question aisha where you asked like uh, what's the difference between a good and um, a bad network there's only one phrase i have to say quality over quantity Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, but that's a perfect answer. That that covers everything. That yes, quality is what matters, and that defines uh, the network. True. Sure, that's really true. Also, I, I'd like to ask um, Ms. Deepa Sahal. Uh, Deepa, uh, like now everything is like taking a digital digital uh, view. Like everything is transforming to you know digitalization. So, how would this digital transformation impact the future entrepreneurs? I love that question. question. I love that question, Aisha. My background is digital and digital transformation. So there are three things. If I connect this particular uh, boot camp to your question, and I'd say collaboration, connectivity, cohesion, and compassion, which leads to emotional equity and helps you build a network, and that leads to a great entrepreneur who's just starting out. the four c's like i said and when you say entrepreneurship you might be a great techie and you might be a, a great entrepreneur but until unless you have physical that interpersonal skill uh, is also enough that you need to learn so maybe you are you are a great coder you might be sitting to be a unicorn in the making in the next 6 months if you don't have a network you can't make the most of so an entrepreneur has to and if he does not know So as you, I'll give a small example. Somebody who's a uh, somebody uh, uh, who should we say Steve Jobs, the guy at the back, Steve was not was that. So this guy Steve, the, the the one at the back, he was a very good tech guy, and Jobs was very good in terms of building a network and see what they did together. And Jobs did not know how to build a machine, but he became a legend and changed the world of computers forever in how we interpret cloud and such. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you may not be a network. Then hire one, hire a PR agency, hire somebody who can build a network for you. That is one. Two, compassion, coupled with collaboration. So, what can they in Hindi? I should not be switching to Hindi, but face to face is not matter. But how you connect with face to face can never. Nothing changes that. 
even if you are in the virtual world for the next decade, how it changes the world for city. So while I say things, I would rather be to the point and focus, and this is what I say. You want to be an entrepreneur, focus on your equity. And money will follow. And there's a beautiful book by one of these guys who stays in my building. He's written a book. He says, take care of your brand. The money follows you. So don't worry. Don't focus too much on making money and being a pawn, which is which does not connect anywhere. You might be living in a dogma. Connect with people, build a brand, the money follows you. It's as simple that I've learned as an entrepreneur in the last 12 years. You know, that's the same thing. Yes. So emotional equity is definitely the place to look through. Yeah, and uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to add uh, to uh, what Dita said that uh, definitely build brands and money will follow. Of course, we all have some final goal or destination, either career promotion or getting a job or attracting clients, selling the program. But um, we cannot focus on this tangible goal because uh, people will not connect to that. Uh, build Good. brand add value and then uh, definitely money will follow or opportunities will follow uh, when you will do like we discussed uh, before give, 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 and only then ask and then uh, definitely uh, you will get uh, back uh, and much more than uh, usually much more than you have uh, even given as uh, people will appreciate your attitude that you give and only then uh, ask you build your brand first and uh, definitely money and opportunities uh, will follow. And I see that in the programs that I teach, that uh, when people come with the mindset, I want to uh, get salary increase, I want to um, grow my business, uh, then we go back to basics, uh, go back to ourselves. And when we start with value, uh, adding value to others, building brands, and only then setting the goals, and of course, uh, measuring how we are achieving goals and connecting with uh, customers or employers, then uh, definitely money follows afterwards. But not starting with uh, what's in it not, for not me, starting in what's in it for others. And this one, Aisha. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. I think you should have a story. So you might have a great. So from the entrepreneurial world, this is directly from there. It says. You have everything in place. You have operation in place, sales in place. You have everything in place. Your product, everything. But if you don't have a story, you can't get the fund, the funding. So, yeah. you know, here's a different perspective. Why do you want connections? Why? Because well, I want to scale. Why do I want to scale? Because I, I want maybe the capital or maybe any any kind of capital. It can be emotional capital or financial capital. So that's very important. You have to have a story. I can tell you because I went to see Vinod Khosla. He's a known man in the US, very, very known man for entrepreneurs in India. He runs Khosla Labs here. And I think in Hyderabad. And tell the story. Very important. That's what he said. I learned it from him back in 2008 in Washington. So this is something that I would tell all the entrepreneurs listening to me today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, sure, and I, sure. have, I have a case study, I think, which uh, uh, is somewhat similar to the kind of uh, narrative that Deepaji just uh, mentioned here. And this is the story of uh, George John. And he's the CEO of Rocket Fuel. And his first job, his Stanford PhD admission, his first and uh, you know second startup that led to two IPOs and $76 million investment to date. Plus scores of great hires into his current company called Rocket Fuel. He says all this came through a network of friends and colleagues. And according to him, as he claims, it is not true in some allegorical or metaphorical sense, but true in a real, very real, direct, measurable sense that looking back over the course of my life, the present value of my network has always eclipsed the value of my current assets by millions of dollars. And I just tried to be helpful to a lot of people, and the result was that all of my failures were repaid 10 times or more. I think this is the best example that we could have as far as the topic is concerned for today's session. So your network is indeed your network. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. I agree with that. Also, uh, like since you're talking about networking, and we have, we have covered up pretty much about LinkedIn and how you know to go professionally or not. But I I like to ask uh, Ms. Bandhan this question that uh, can you please tell us like what is networking beyond LinkedIn? Like LinkedIn is like a social platform, so could you like enlighten us about what is it beyond LinkedIn? Okay. 
So uh, before I actually go into what is networking beyond LinkedIn, basically what I wanted to talk about uh, was that LinkedIn in itself has you know come up with a few of these uh, problems, and I mean uh, not everything is anti Rohi on LinkedIn as well. But before I come uh, on to that, uh, let me share nine mistakes uh, or at least eight mistakes that I made in, you know while building my personal network on LinkedIn during the initial years. And why I'm sharing these mistakes because as they say, the road to self discovery. is always under construction and i will uh, i don't hesitate and i don't mind in saying that i still make mistakes and i am still learning from them and i keep improving on them now what are these mistakes that i made the first of all i was just adding contacts and i thought this was networking so i think sunil sir just mentioned this is networking the second mistake that i made was i was doing it without understanding the rules and values that were underlying it so you know as Uh, technically, the algorithm, how it works, and everything. I was just not aware of the rules. The third thing, I was not genuinely interested in knowing about the rules. Earlier on, it was just like, okay, how many likes I got, how many comments I got, did I get a call back on this, did I get any lead from this? It's not that. I was not adding any genuine value to people initially. That was my fourth mistake. My fifth mistake was that I was doing it beyond, you know, just for the sake of getting business and not for actually making some connect. So when I say uh, you know networking beyond LinkedIn, it's not just about who you are posting, are you consistent in posting, are you following the algorithm rules, uh, are you actually making a lot of connections, followers, as Sunil Rabatul said. It is information, uh, you know, fans connection is nothing but just a mere null and void. It's of no use. It's not for networking in the first place. So uh, that was my fifth mistake. The sixth mistake I made was I was pretty judgmental about people. So that was one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made. Then the next mistake I made was again something which uh, Sunil sir made a reference to. I did not keep in touch with people consistently, and I suffered from you know what is called the blink and you miss syndrome. So I mean I was even there on uh, LinkedIn for several long uh, you know periods, and then I come back to it, and then you know, you, you know you, there's this miss and you blink kind of a situation. And rather than trying to focus on how I can help people, I used to think about how they can help. So these were my major eight mistakes, and I have learned from them. And that's why I say networking is not a big thing. It is a way of life. We all, uh, you know, we have to develop this habit of knowing more about someone and checking how we can add value to these their lives, uh, you know, selflessly. And then professional benefits automatically come as a positive byproduct or a positive side effect in quite an amplified manner. Now coming back to the question that we just talked about, LinkedIn, uh, you know, working beyond LinkedIn. So I was just trying to say that number one, or uh, see, I am in no way to give up on LinkedIn. It is still one of the best professional platforms around, and I think that uh, LinkedIn is more like a pile. P I E. When I can say it is more about connecting with people, connecting with ideas, and connecting with ex- expected and existing opportunities. So uh, I am looking at a few more, uh, you know, platforms like uh, Meetup, and there is Zoom, Talk, Opportunity, etc. So I'm looking at these platforms also, and I'm still in the process of researching more about them because I've just got into the you know entire flow and fervor of LinkedIn, but I'm still researching on these because then uh, I. Recently, what I've observed is that even LinkedIn is suffering from a little bit of flaws. Like you know, you all go and can tend to get, uh, you know, just uh, lost in the sea of content that is there. Secondly, I do see some amount of spamming, which has just started, uh, you know, recently occurring across the LinkedIn platform as well. So I'm, I, I'm not saying that I'm in a mood to give up altogether. Yes, but yes, when you're using LinkedIn, you have to do it. Connect, and yes, connect. When I say connect. Again, I would say it should be seen for compassion, as the author said. I think O for optimism, N for naturalness, N for nicety, E for empathy, and C for credibility. And last T, which is very very important, the tact to how you handle something. So I think that is very important. LinkedIn or any other platform for that. So if I can just add very quickly, Aisha, I know we're on the hour, but I think. <laughs> Uh, I think it's important to look at other platforms, like for instance, even events. And again, that offers multiple opportunities to students, whether they want to volunteer at events, whether they want to present posters. Events of offer networking uh, rooms as well today. I mean, and there are virtual rooms that are created for students. Mentoring, you know, all those are also great tools and opportunities for students to use and leverage. 
So become members of associations of uh, you know professional associations. Um, those give you again an opportunity to network with other like-minded professionals. So I would agree that it is important to step beyond just the comfort zone of LinkedIn because LinkedIn has its value, but there's more that you can get outside of LinkedIn as well. Yes, yes, yes. that's true. Yeah, and it's if I may, um, I want to encourage uh, as kind of takeaway for uh, for students who are listening today mm -hmm. and will be listening later, mm -hmm. one practical action. So um, we have been saying, uh, talking so much about LinkedIn networking, building networks. So one practical action uh, for everyone who is tuning in: connect with uh, panelists on LinkedIn whom you resonated with, and uh, when connecting. Uh, several benefits that happen. So um, uh, when you send a listening request, uh, send a little feedback to the panelists, what you really enjoyed in uh, the conversation. This is your added value. And sometimes people ask, how do I exactly add value on LinkedIn or how do I contribute? So this is your first little uh, kind of step, uh, practical step. When, when you are sending connection requests, add a little message saying, thank you for uh, thoughts, thank you for insights. I really like this particular insight that you said and that's our first practical step that uh, everyone can uh, take is connecting with panelists uh, here uh, from this conversation and uh, start adding value by just giving feedback and saying hey i really appreciated what you said and what uh, happens is uh, this panelist most definitely all of us have quite big networks right as uh, we have been quite some years in the business uh, or um in uh, in what we do so um Whoever connects, uh, they connect to our network as well. And if you're a student looking for uh, next opportunity for projects, contribution, uh, work, might be then in one of our networks is your next employer or your next project uh, owner who might uh, notice you, uh, might start uh, kind of checking you out on LinkedIn and other social media networks and um, pay attention and reach out to you. So this is the beauty that happens when you connect uh, you add value and uh, you tap into other people's networks. So practical, practical action uh, for everyone who is listening. Yes, yes, ma'am. And I'd like to ask anyone on the panel that if you'd like to add something for the audience or just, you know, if out for the youth about networking and how it is our network. So it would be great before we wrap it up. Okay, I think I start. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Inclusion, as as far as I am concerned. So first of all, I'd like to say, uh, you know, give out uh, two very powerful quotes. One is by uh, John Bond. Uh, he's a thought leader, and he's of the opinion that networks are exponential, and network people are exponentially successful. So all the students out there, just keep this in mind. The second one is by Gary Fitz, and what does he have to say? He opines mm -hmm. that bigger social networks expand the size of neural networks as well, the neurons that are there in our brain. And lots of friends, lots of relations drive the growth of the gray matter in areas which are linked to social information in the brain, and they produce a lot of juices growing and and the last overall, if I were to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, come down to the discuss today, I think through networking, there is a connection not just between people, there is a connection between passion and productivity, between value and profit, between authenticity and purpose, and obviously, and definitely as the topic of the day, between art and wallet. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do we have Dr. Irene to add in something? Yes. Well, my recommendation to, to youngsters out there would be like um, always ask questions. Don't assume just because um, you just recently graduated, just you are younger, you um, know the digital world probably better that. Um, you know it all better, right? Because you can still learn from people who have more experience than you. So my advice would be also to look out for a mentor who can support you, where you can always um, rely on, ask questions. And next, I would always um, recommend um, youngsters also to not to randomly connect with people, but rather to, to make a great selection, right? And to, because I know 
nowadays people tend to um, connect with lots of people at the same time. Rather focus on a few people where you can really build lasting relationships. Even though we are all online and digital, um, as um, someone in the panel uh, said right at the beginning, we are still human beings, right? And we need this strong connection, rather those loose ties. You know, I think there was a great book uh, from uh, Kano Feta uh, who said, like, there's also a difference between the, the quality of networks, right? You can have loose ties or strong um, strong ties. And I really recommend you to look for strong ties out there because um, that's what will give you the success at the end of the day. Yes, thank you, ma'am. And uh, if uh, Ms. Melissa could add in. Um, very short. I, I would just say that I think it's very important to look at networking as marketing and then marketing oneself. And therefore, all the students and listeners should really um, invest in building the brand called me. And I think that is really a prerequisite to doing anything else. Um, and, and the most important part of you know what the session really is all about. And I completely agree uh, with the quote that your net network is your net worth and if you invest in it well and with a lot of effort uh, it will pay returns both in the short term and long term yeah right truly truly agreed uh, can i also have mr sunil roberts to give in his uh, opinion over here yeah. if you start a conversation by saying how may i serve you you're likely to make more friends than saying, sir, I'd like to connect with you because, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. If, if you ask that question, you should also be prepared to help, invest, nurture, cultivate that, that relationship. It's a very powerful question. You're always willing to talk, but you're not willing to say, all these uh, uh, powerful people that you're trying to connect with, the busy people, they are, they are always looking for ways to get their story out there, their ways of getting their brand out there. And if somebody comes and says, hey, you've done this, is it okay if I share it in my network? Or, and then they'll say, wow, there's somebody who's coming to me without an expectation of, probably there's an agenda down the line, but the first question is not, I'd like this from you. There are some people who just get to the chase and they don't believe in niceties or <laughs> cordial icebreakers, they, they just get to it and say, sir, I run this, can you help me? Can I get an internship in your company? Can I? That won't cut it because, I mean, I get that three or four times uh, in a day. So so you always need people who follow that etiquette of trying to build before you harvest, uh, invest before you harvest. So that's the tip that I'd like to leave them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was a really, very really good end. Invest before you harvest. Oh, we'll be sure to remember that. We have this uh, Deepa Isaya to uh, give a few suggestions or advice. Yeah, Aisha, I just, uh, from the perspective of reaching out to the youngsters, just believe in yourself. And uh, I see a lot right. of youngsters are very smart today. So it's a flat structure. Regard everybody, but don't lose yourself in the process. Play at par. Play just and bridge it, bridge the gap. So there's no need to run after somebody to get the connect. You create the value that people come and connect with you. That is the deal of the day. So that's what I'd love to say. Now keep your confidence, girls and boys and everybody who's listening, and make the most of it. Sure, sure. It was it was really amazing, getting inspired. And yes, we'd be sure to, you know, stay strong, build ourselves first, and then get into the network. So that will truly build our network. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to have hosted and moderated uh, such amazing and dynamic personalities. It was great having all of you. So, uh, yes, thank you very you much. Were, you, you were thank very you good, too. I want to commend yes. you. You were awesome, too. Great job. Yes, we moderated. Yes, she surely did. Thank you so much, thank all you. of you. It was lovely meeting you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Nice having all of you. Nice meeting you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, All the best. Bye. 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 All of you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.
All right, we have a next keynote session coming up uh, and it will be up at four o'clock. Yes. All right, this was an amazing session. I, I hope everyone really uh, enjoyed it and I hope it really added value to your thoughts and it will help you out. Let's meet in maybe 15 minutes, that is four o'clock. We have an amazing session coming up. It's a keynote session and yes, Thank you. You are currently the only person in this conference.
Hello. Hello. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, sir, could you please connect your video and then uh, we are good to go? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. Presentation. Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, our new video, everything fine? We can start? Yeah, I'm ready to start. All right, sir. Okay. So, yes. We are up. Okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, evening, good morning, because we are having people from all over the world connecting to us. And I hope you all are doing good. I am Sayeda Aisha Kaleem, and uh, from Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. So, um, today, before you know, we start this keynote session, I'd like to just give a glimpse of our uh, college. Our campus, that is uh, Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women, is a leading institution established in the year 2008. A temple of learning at the heart of the city of Perth provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students. Stanley is affiliated to the prestigious Usmania University of Hyderabad. It provides all eligible engineering courses which are accredited both by NBA and NAC with grade A. Stanley is also an ISO certified institution. Stanley ranks at 105th among the best engineering institutes of India and second best women's engineering college in all of South India. Glad to be a student of here. Yes, so now we have our keynote session with Mr. Vivek Atre. Yes, so let me introduce you to our motivational speaker, a dynamic personality. Let me just give us introduction and then we, are, we can move ahead with our session. So Mr. Vivek Atre, XIAS, is a motivational speaker author, mentor, advisor, columnist, and visiting professor. He resigned from the Indian Administrative Service, IAS, in 2017. He has eight TEDx talks, TEDx talks and three highly popular Josh talks. Over 30 lakh people have viewed his videos on YouTube. He is the founder of Suvichar Think Tank, visiting professor at Shulini University, member of the CSR Advisory Board of Action 8. He's also a founder of the Vibrant Networking Forum, Playwright Foundation, Chandigarh Literary, Literary Society, and co-convener of Intact Chandigarh. He is a member of the Governor's Advisory Council for Chandigarh UT. He addresses audience from industry, academia, government on leadership, good governance, emotional intelligence, life skills, people skills, public speaking skills, meditation, calmness, entrepreneurship, education, and sports management. It's great to have a personality like you taking a session for us today, sir. So we have sir talking on emotional intelligence. And I can hand over the session to sir. Please, sir, you're, uh, you can take the session ahead. Thank you very much, Aisha. That was very well done. And I'm very happy to be speaking at this Chainmaker Summit for Stanley College. It's a very good event. I can see a lot of very exciting and interesting speakers. And uh, I'm sure a lot of students will benefit from the deliberations and the discussions. And uh, also, I think that uh, uh, this is a beautiful way to connect different uh, thoughts, different processes, different mindsets, different ways of thinking, because it's important for us all to come together and uh, listen and share and deal with each other in this way. I have been speaking today in the morning to uh, my first physical audience for 10 months. I had gone to a company here, I live in Chandigarh, and that was a fantastic change for me from webinars, but here we are back in the webinar mode. Maybe one day we will all meet in a hall, uh, actually. So in uh, today's topic of emotional intelligence, I'm going to talk about a couple of things at the beginning, which you will probably take forward uh, as, as we go forward. Emotional intelligence is the ability to handle people and situations in a calm and balanced manner. It's a very simple uh, concept, but not understood very well by people. So I need to delve a little deep into it, being somewhat of an expert now in emotional intelligence. Daniel Goldman is the founder and father of emotional intelligence. 
and Daniel, Daniel Goldman gave seven different kinds of ideals. But we are not going to get into the theoretical aspects. We are going to do a bit of storytelling, a bit of motivation, and a bit of emotional intelligence uh, case studies. So let me tell you the first story that I would like to tell you of today is of Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe was a tennis player. He was the champion of Wimbledon. Wimbledon is the biggest tennis tournament in the world. And uh, the four tennis tournaments, which are known as the Grand Slam events, Wimbledon is the biggest. When Arthur Ashe won Wimbledon, he was on top of the world. Everybody was celebrating him and everybody was you know, praising him. And his paper photograph was in the papers, he was in the TV, and he was having yeah, interviews and parties and this and that. So he was on top of the world. And uh, after many years, or not that many years, he was still young, when he was critically ill and he was dying. Unfortunately, he was, it was an ailment which could not be cured. So he was receiving letters from all across the world, asking him, telling him, wishing him well. And one letter or more letters which said, Arthur, why is this happening to you? Why not to someone else? And Arthur Ashe replies to that letter in longhand because he was on bed, but he would write letters. He says, when I won Wimbledon, I knew that millions of people play tennis all over the world. Hundreds of thousands of them play seriously. Thousands of them become professionals. 128 people play Wimbledon every year. Men, women also 128 and other juniors, mixed doubles, doubles, etc., etc. Out of those 128, 64 reach the next round, 32 reach the next round. 16 reached the fourth round, 8 reached the quarterfinals, 4 reached the semifinals, 2 people reached the final, and 1 person wins Wimbledon. So my maths is okay, or those of you who are math students will agree with me, that this is the progression. And I was that person who won Wimbledon that year. When I won Wimbledon and I held the trophy high above, I did not ask God. Why me? Question mark. Why is this happening to me? I didn't ask God. I did not complain about that. I was so delighted, so happy, so whatever. But I was not wonderstruck or anything. I, I, I thought I deserved it. Now when I'm dying, when I'm not well, when I'm critically ill, I have no right to ask God, why me? That's what he replied to these people who said, why is this happening to you? Why not to someone? What do we learn from Arthur Ashe? We learn even-mindedness. Even in the face of a critical ailment, Arthur Ashe would say that I will not uh, feel sorry for myself. I will not feel low. I will start feeling strong mentally despite adversity. And this is something which Arthur Ashe exemplified and this story is very famous. But basically what we also need to learn, the first thing is that life is full of ups and downs. If life is full of ups and downs, then life is never going to be smooth. You can't have a smooth life like the wall behind me or the painting at the back. Life is not picture perfect. Life has to be sometimes low, sometimes high. How are we? That is what matters. Do we take the lows and the highs in our stride? Or do we collapse when the lows come mentally? And do we feel super excited when the highs come? If you handle your emotions and become balanced, calm, level-headed, you are winning the battle of life. Emotional intelligence means that we are able to control our mind a little better. Now, you are students, most of you. When you sit down to study, you might stay on the book for three hours at a stretch cannot be. It will wander. It will wander. It has to wander. It's a human mind. You will remember lunch, you will remember ice cream, you will remember games, you will remember TV, you will remember Instagram, you will go to Instagram, you will spend half an hour there, then you come back to your book and then you will go back again after five minutes to Instagram. So the point is, I also live on Instagram a lot but, and all of you, by the way, can follow me on Instagram. My same spellings are there. They are there. But the point is that our mind is never disciplined. 
is the most difficult thing to control. We can control lions and tigers as human beings, but we cannot control our minds. Because our minds are racing ahead and racing in the past. So where do we live typically? We live in the future or in the past. We are going on thinking what happened day before yesterday. Why did this person speak to me so badly? Why did so-and-so fight with me, argue with me? Why did so-and-so let me down that day, got late or whatever it was? We keep regretting the past. And we keep hoping for the future to be good. That this may happen, that may happen, I will do this, I will do that, I will agree. Which is fine. But we also keep worrying about the future. Worry, fear, negativity, they hold us back. So if our mind is going to be like this, that we are going to be absolutely uh, you know, restless all the time, not living in the present, but living in the past or the future, we are losing the battle of the mind and battle of life. Because our health suffers if we do that. Our health suffers, our concentration suffers. We cannot study. If we are living in the past and future, we are distracted, we are not going to be able to work or study. So, emotional intelligence is the ability to control the thoughts also. And that is a little beyond emotional intelligence, but it can be done. Our emotions and thoughts can be calmed down. How do they get calmed down? I mean, uh, some of you may know, the restless monkey, the monkey, gives a short life because its breath is pretty fast. And therefore, the breathing being fast, somehow the age is also linked to that. A turtle or tortoise will live for 150 years because the breathing is four times a minute only. Very slow breathing. Human beings breathe about 15 times a minute. That is four minutes, i sorry, uh, four seconds they'll breathe once. Which means that we live a longish compared to a monkey or some bird or something which is restless. Restlessness is our enemy. Calmness is our friend. Calmness is our best friend. Emotions being controlled, restlessness being controlled, agitation, anger, uh, you know, irritability, all these things if we can control, we need a superior life. You think of a person who inspires you. That person is likely to be a calm person, not a person who is restless, angry, irritated, or shouting all the time. A person like that will not inspire us. A person who inspires us is one who is normally cheerful, receptive, calm. So can we be like that? Can we minimize our anger, restlessness moments? How do we manage our anger? We manage our anger by being conscious of our anger first. I lose my temper five times a day, then I not me but anyone. If they do that, that means that their health is suffering. Five times a day you are shouting at people, your health is suffering. If it happens once in a week, much better. It happens once in a month that you lose your temper, super. You can't be superhuman, you are human, so once in a while you will lose your temper. You will because you are provoked by life and circumstances. But it doesn't have to be five, six, seven, ten times a day. Those who keep shouting, the, the efficiency of their shouting, if I may call it, the impact of their shouting on others reduces. After a while, people are not scared of that shouting or anything. They take it for granted. So oh, this guy keeps on shouting at me. What is the point? Forget it. Your authority reduces. You are using your power of anger, of fear, mongering too much. Respect is greater than authority. This is my next one. Respect is something which will make people work with you willingly. Authority makes them work with you out of fear that you are a strong person, powerful person. You have authority over them. You will write something bad in their report card or their ACR which is the annual confidential report of an officer, the government, and that's why they work for you. That is not the right way. Emotional intelligence will tell you that it is better to earn the respect and cheerful cooperation of your team. Cheerful cooperation. 
they become better workers better colleagues better output is maintained in practice another story i'll tell you so there was a young little boy and uh, this boy went to a judo coach and this boy had only one arm unfortunately he had lost an arm in a childhood accident now he was about 14 years old and he had only one arm but he tells the judo master he says this is a story from japan this young japanese boy tells the master i need to learn judo but the master says you have only one arm he says no but please teach me whatever you can so the master teaches him one move because that's the only move we can learn with one arm he teaches him one move and it takes 6 months in 6 months this boy becomes perfect at that one move but he can't do any other move. only one one kind of technique you know now the master says you are now ready to take part in a competition this boy is quite flabbergasted and surprised how can i take part in a competition because i have only one arm but he goes and he beats the first two boys with that one move because he's so good at his one move in the semi final he has a very tough opponent but somehow he wins over him in the last few minutes in the final the opponent is the toughest ever and the previous champion it's a losing battle for him but in the last one minute or half a minute he pins down that boy with that one move which he knows and he doesn't allow that opponent to get out so he wins the final as well now this boy wins the trophy and he's going back with his master he tells the master he said now will you teach me another move he said no you cannot learn another move you have only one arm but he says this one move is all you need because nobody can beat you because they cannot pin down your right arm that's the only way for them to get out of this clutch of this move and you don't have a right arm so therefore you are perfect in this move you don't need anything else. so what happened is the adversity became the strength the adversity became the strength and what does that mean a boy who has lost an arm has a right to feel low for a while right but he did not he didn't give up he became so strong mentally that he could win the battle of that judo as well as the battle of the mind his mind did not tell him you can't do it you can't do it you can't do it in our mind what happens when we fail we become sad morose we feel low and therefore we feel that we cannot win ever when you are feeling low you feel you are no good but feeling like that is not good for your health or your longevity or for your you have to be your best friend emotional intelligence tells us that life will change it may not be constant change is the only constant of life that's a very important saying if change is the only constant that means that better times will come those who stand and wait those who are patient those who don't give up even despite a setback a problem or a disability whatever it is they will win and their emotional intelligence will make them the next point i want to make to you about emotional intelligence is that adopt something creative in life creativity is your best friend it will make you more understanding of others it will make your life more fulfilling it will make your life more interesting in creativity could be music art writing i am a writer and a speaker i was an ias officer i resigned to become a motivational speaker now every day i have a lecture or a talk somewhere or the other that i have 30 lakh views on my youtube channel if you watch it i will increase by another 300 views or whatever it doesn't matter the point is that you have to be creative you have to get happiness from what you do a person who is opening the gate of a railway barrier doesn't have a creative job all he has to do is when he gets the call that the train is coming he has to lock the gate open the gate lock the gate open the gate his fault he has a he's a dedicated person doing the great job of securing that road without him people will die in accident he is doing a fabulous job. however if he is sitting in the sun waiting for the next train which will come in 4 hours 
he listens to the radio he starts singing he becomes a singer nobody stopping him from being a singer by practicing 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 along with the radio he becomes a top singer maybe he's a youngish man at 30 40 even 30 40 is considered young nowadays and he becomes a professional singer on his leave he goes and sings on the stage that is a creative thing in life his life changes becomes better so if we adopt creativity we will be more understanding and more happy as well. creativity einstein said that creativity is intelligence having fun intelligence without entertainment or without creativity is not fun so it has to be a creative element it could be creativity in your work it could be creativity in art like this painting behind me it could be the color that you love most you're painting something with it it could be a poem that you're writing a story that you're writing it could be music it could be sports whatever it is that you love become creative and get into it deeply and you will really really love your life more creativity will also help you understand others better and you become a better human being creative pursuits whether they are only on a sunday you always want to play the guitar who stopping you you got into a job or you want to study you busy but get into that guitar playing when you can it will really really help it will really really help you to improve your life if you adopt a pursuit which is creative or take heart from people who are creative inspire yourself by watching usain bolt by watching great musicians ar rahman by watching great uh, painters do their job or their great paintings by reading great books i must add here the reading books has to be a lifelong pursuit it cannot be that after college or after school we are not going to read any more books creative books story books novels non fiction autobiographies whatever you love read all the time i try to read every day something on the other without reading i can't write my words my thinking comes from reading because i've read my histories over now one for me to be a reader i have a tedx talk on on uh, being a reader and a writer writing more and reading more by the way i have eight tedx talks whenever you have time and the audience you can watch any of them on youtube there are eight tedx talks you search vivek atre and you find them on youtube come to the next point of emotional intelligence anger management also means that we move the other way and become calmer and calmer how do we maintain the presence of mind mindful awareness of our situation it is said scold somebody in private praise somebody in public it means when you scold somebody you should not have other juniors or other colleagues standing there otherwise that person feels insulted whereas if you scold that person you have to scold not that you scold without reason you have a reason but in that reason you make it personal conversation then the person doesn't mind the person will try to improve you are the senior you have scolded somebody he will try to improve but if two people were watching or listening he will not be feeling happy about that but when you praise somebody if other people are present it's even better they more people get to know so if we become mindful of where we are who is watching what is happening our emotional intelligence grows our happiness index grows and presence of mind what happens to most people these days their mind is distracted because of this friend of ours which is in our pocket becomes our enemy or frenemy as you call it now friend and enemy both this frenemy of ours which is in our pockets it it keeps the summons the moment you are idle the moment i finish my talk or the moment aisha gets free from here first thing she's going to do i am going to do is look at this right it is compulsive it is compulsive but we can avoid it for a while stay in the present moment social media can be reduced not eliminated i also love being on instagram facebook or linkedin but the point is that i need to balance my and emotional intelligence means i remain in the moment listen to people 
supposing a youngster is speaking to me and asking me people call me up and ask me advice of all kinds these days i'm a motivational speaker they ask me now if i'm not what justice am i doing to my work somebody sitting opposite me on a chair there's a chair empty in front of me right now you can't see it because i'm this way if you see the chair supposing somebody sitting on that chair and i'm not listening and or aisha is asking me something and i am looking at my phone i am distracted and there are there there is no point there also linked to this listening is compliment i should be able to compliment some for what they have we should not be stingy with that we are very very we are very free with our criticism if you watch your arnab goswami he will never stop criticizing anyone why should we do that his job may be that but we don't have to go overboard we need to be balanced and criticize what happened yesterday in the us but you don't need to criticize uh, your own family or your own friends or somebody who is above board even in india there are many things worth criticizing but we don't go overboard in one way or the other even if you are in a political party you do not understand it but you cannot be without understanding my point is balance appreciation of others and understanding that everybody comes from other mindsets two two people are like not even twins i have sisters who are twins but both these twins are also they are different in some ways they cannot be exactly alike my point to you is understand the differences of people and appreciate them and work upon your people skills it's not enough to be a computer science fool or an electronics fool or a history fool or chemistry fool and excel 100 out of 100 not possible but whatever it is 100 out of 100 however if you start talking to people nice communicating well getting your ideas across to them that is how you become a complete human being so i don't care if someone is a back bencher or middle bencher or mediocre marks your teachers might differ with me but if they have a complete personality all round skills creative skills communication skills listening skills empathy cheerfulness calmness so i'm going to give you now before i go on to the last phase of my talk i'm going to give you a story and then i'm going to give you the eight c which i often talk about and they will tell you what it, emotional intelligence and what life is about so einstein i mentioned i'm going to tell you a story of einstein to try and how uh intelligence he was as well as how high his emotional intelligence was einstein and albert einstein great scientist e is equal to mc square everybody knows the theory of relativity he was lecturing in america he was going around university towns lecturing in one town going to the next lecturing going again he would stay the night and go on to the next town the car was the same the driver was the same the lecture was the same but the university and the venue was different he went to 24 towns in 24 days and he was going to the 25th town the next morning the lecture was in the afternoon whatever it was and they were going and they would reach by afternoon straight to the hall the driver had not spoken all these days in stride instead of the big man now they are on an empty road and suddenly the driver says to mr einstein He said, "Mr. Einstein, I have heard your lecture twenty-four times, sitting at the back of the hall. I think even I can deliver this lecture now." Mr. Einstein is bamboozled. He is so surprised, shocked. He looks at his. He is reading his paper. He looks at the driver. What is he saying? He says, "Really?" He says, "Okay. In the next town, we don't know how I look. We go there. You become Einstein, and I become the driver." I'll sit in the front seat, you sit in the back seat. When we reach there, the dean of the university will receive us, and the dean does receive them. He gives them flowers. He gives flowers to the driver, thinking he's Einstein. Einstein goes and sits at the back of the hall and listens to the driver delivering the lecture on the theory of relativity. Einstein is waiting patiently to see how can this person uh, speak like me and deliver this lecture. But he has heard it twenty-four times. and he goes and delivers a flawless lecture without any mistake 100% correct one hour and 15 minutes whatever it was a little more than what we have today here and the driver's lecture was perfect 
and everybody claps applauds mr einstein at the back is so excited he claps and claps he stands on the chair and starts clapping as students of him do so what happens to uh, the driver is beaming he is so happy but in the front row there is a professor i'm sure you have many professors in the college and the professor gets up and asks a question and this question is a very difficult question now the driver looks at him and asks and he knows that he doesn't know the answer to this question he says professor this is a very very simple question so simple that i think even my driver can answer this of course mr einstein is the driver and he knows all the answers but look at the man look at the driver what do we learn from it first we learn confidence he had the confidence to tell einstein i will deliver your lecture if you allow number 2 he had the intelligence to grasp the lecture and note it down or whatever 24 times he heard it or whatever you and i cannot deliver that lecture number 3 he has the delivery skills to go on stage and speak you may know the topic but public speaking is an art it's a skill i speak on public speaking another day we'll do a session on public speaking skills how do you speak in public how do you pause where do you bring in the joke where do you bring in the story where do you uh, speak a little louder how do you modulate your voice how do you create the interest of the audience so all these skills were there with the driver and he was a driver he was driving he didn't know any practice he just had that talent but many of us have to work if you need to learn about public speaking we'll be in touch again but the last quality which we must learn from the driver is presence of mind he had the presence of mind to answer them and say that my driver will answer this question because we often don't have the presence of mind we are distracted we are restless we don't understand the situation that presence of mind is in, in, really really important. so i would suggest that you work on your calmness your presence of mind and the eight c's which i'm about to give you Aisha, we have about ten more minutes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can do that. Will there be a Q and A at the end? Yes, sir. I mean, I'd be asked. I'd be asking uh, if we have the Q and A. I I okay. did note down a few or three stuff that I would like to ask, but yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell you the eight C's, and then we'll get into the Q and A. So the eight C's that I would say that you adopt in your life, they will help you. These eight C's, you will remember them. you may remember that we wake up three game but you didn't remember what he said so try to remember these eight c's if you remember these then you'll get the gist of the lecture and uh, you'll understand so the first c you need to adopt in your life is courage the driver of einstein had courage confidence without courage you cannot be successful cannot be happy in my book finding success within which i have authored i will write right down here finding success within i talk about 52 qualities that you need in life and finding success within will give you that answer but anyway the first quality is c for courage c for courage means that you are full of faith in your own ability you are not scared feeling scared nervous worried is a normal thing people human beings feel scared when you are nervous worried even i feel scared nervous and worried at time so i may look fearless to you i don't know but the point is that being fearless means that you conquer your inner demons you conquer your unnecessary worries your necessary worries are not necessary worries necessary worries are somebody is late have to reach at 9 o'clock your brother sister mother and not yet home so you are worried that's a necessary worry you can't help it but unnecessary worry my neighbor is against me somebody has told you your neighbor doesn't like you you are worried that the neighbor will start doing something against me tomorrow he will gang up with another neighbor who doesn't like me and then they will all get against me and i am worried i am losing my sleep or so and so doesn't like me i am getting married to somebody this person uh, may be seeing somebody else i am worried if i am worried without reason if i am worried 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 how will i lead the battle of my life successfully I have to win the battle by fearlessness, courage. Less worry. You cannot be worry less. At least be 
less worried. That means you reduce your worries. Number two, after courage, is calmness. Calmness means that you have the presence of mind. You have a relaxed mind. You have a tension-free mind most of the time. Again, I said once in a while you lose your cool, you lose your tension. I mean, anger. You get angry. It's okay. But most of the time you are calm. Most of the time you are not restless. Supposing the power goes. Supposing the connection breaks. Do I get angry? No. I remain calm. I should remain calm. Something may go wrong any time in life. Pandemic came. Did we expect it? No. Some people they remain strong. They spend quality time with their families. They came out stronger. So next year we'll be back, or this year we'll be back to doing what we do. But some people collapsed; they became very, you know, bitter. Not their fault. But I am telling you that it is better not to get into that kind of mindset. Calmness will overthinking never helps. I have a video on YouTube which is about overthinking. This may happen, that may happen. This neighbor, this landlord, this colleague, this rival, all against me. Whereas if you look at the movie Anand. Amitabh Bachchan and Rajesh Khanna were there. Long time we were kids. We watched it on TV. Rajesh Khanna says, "The whole world is my friend." And Stan Dale, there's a quote by Stan Dale. Dale says, "I operate as if the whole world is my well-wisher." What is the harm? Maybe it's too perfect. You may have one or two people who you don't like. Why have hundred people or sixty people or forty people who you don't like? How can so many people be against you? So let us be largely warm towards people and expect them to be warm. If they if they prove us wrong and they become bad people, then that's their problem. It's not our problem. Number three is character. In fact, character would be number one also. Character means when nobody is looking, what are we? Doing? When nobody is watching, are we doing the honest thing, truthful thing, or are we telling lies to ourselves? Is that chocolate on the table? Is it for us? If, if supposing there are two chocolates, one for me, one for my brother, and I eat both of them, is my character good? As a child, I've, I started doing wrong things, naughty things. That means that I am getting naughty. But when we grow older, the chocolate becomes more important. Stakes are higher. Anything can go wrong. We have to be a little cautious and conscious of how we think and telling lies or indulging in deceit. Or uh, other things like that. But if we have done something wrong, I always tell young people who are getting into depression or guilt or low self-esteem. Everybody makes mistakes, even deliberate mistakes. Get out of it. Forget it. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't keep thinking I did this two years ago. Oh, my, my mama doesn't know, but you know, it was so terrible of me. Don't think like that. Forget it. Move forward. People make mistakes. They say, "Insan se galti hoti hai." Who makes mistakes? In the human, not the chair won't make a mistake. The chair is perfect. People can sit on it for ten years; nothing will go wrong. Human beings can make mistakes. So, character is that which you try to improve. If you are looking in the mirror, face yourself, realize your mistakes, but don't feel guilty and brooding and depressed. Move on. Next is creativity. I already mentioned creativity. C for creativity. I'm giving you the eight C's. This is the fourth one. Creativity is something which is of. It makes your life musical, magical. It breaks the monotony. It makes you loved. It makes you have zest. The film director or a poet or a chef, celebrity chef. Obviously, they have a creative life. But an accountant who is sitting in front of a computer, number crunching all the time, can also have a creative life. He can be a musician at home. He can be part of an NGO. He can be part of a trekking unit. He can, he or she can be into anything else which is a pursuit, like reading books or writing. I often mentor people who are writing. They send me their write-ups. I help them. I tell them this is good, this is not good. I help somebody write a novel also. I have written two novels and one other book, and my fourth one is coming this year. But uh, it's good to be in one creativity, creative activity. The next C is cheerfulness. You will get more friends if you are a cheerful person as opposed to an angry, uh, restless, backbiting, uh, gossiping kind of person and complaining all the time. Complaining is not a C that you should adopt. That's the C to not adopt. Complaining buzz. 
you know, being a complainant. Why, why don't complaining? Maybe once in a year you have something to complain about, it's okay. But by habit, get me the complaint book. What is this? What is that? Restaurant, some waiter, poor thing, you're shouting at him because the water is not uh, okay, the tea is not hot enough. Why get that into that mode? So cheerfulness is your friend. People will love you for it. People will like you. You will be popular. You will be happy. Your health will be better. The next C is compassion. Compassion means thinking of others. You don't only think of yourself. Egocentric. I, 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 my, 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 this, my, that. Self-centered, self-centered. That is very low emotional intelligence. If I have high emotional intelligence, I think of others. I help others. I join an NGO, I start an NGO, I plant some trees, I help an elderly person. Elderly people need young people to sit with them and just talk to them. They don't have anyone. Nani, Dadi, someone else. What do they need? They only need patient hearing. If a young person can take out one hour per day or half an hour per day and listen to an elderly, elderly person speak, that is a good deal. Even if you have busy, a busy life, but listen to that lady or that gentleman. That is empathy for them, compassion. Helping a poor child to study or, or doing something else for society. Compassion. Number next is contentment. Contentment means that I am not ungrateful. I am grateful. I have an attitude of gratitude. These are not my quotes. I follow uh, the autobiography of a yogi. It's a great book. And it is not a religious book, it's a spiritual book. I would recommend reading this book for everybody who can. So I would say that if you are content, it means that you have a great deal of happiness within you. And you are thankful for what you have. Right? I'm just typing it out here. And the other thing is that you need to have gratitude and then you will move on better, you will do better in life. Otherwise, you will keep on uh, cribbing about life. Being a cribbing component is not something that you should remember or a complainer is not something that you should this book is from 1952 it's not a current yogi's book so don't worry about that it's by Paramhansa Yogananda it's a fantastic book for you the next point and the last point I would like to make is communication the best C that you can have is good communication skills it is something that is absolutely vital for you if you are good technically at your subject, but you are not able to make a presentation, then you cannot really win the battle of life. Today, you have to speak well, write well, present well, be slick enough, and communication between relationships also is important. Husbands and wives, mothers and daughters, fathers and daughters, whoever, they need to talk, they need to spend time on, on a meal at a dining table, don't watch the TV while eating your food. Don't watch TV news ever. I hate TV news. Watch cricket or football. But, but be with your family. Those youngsters who spend time with their family, with their parents, and those who have children or young children, they spend time with their children. That is the biggest thing. It's extremely important for you. You will have better lives if you are communicating with them constantly. You are a good communicator at work. You are a good communicator at Friends, I, I have a lot of large following on Instagram, etc. because of my communication skills. I speak, I write, I do that, I post my articles. And that is something you can do. So I'm going to end here with these eight C's and I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, read them out again because they are important. I want many of you may have noted that, but I'll just say C for courage, C for character, C for creativity, C for calmness, C for cheerfulness, C for compassion. C for contentment and C for communication skill. The first seven are qualities. The last one is a skill which you need to adopt. And if you do that, then your life will become extremely worth living. Emotional intelligence and all the qualities that you need will lead to success and happiness. And let me lastly say that the goal of life is happiness. The goal of life is not material success. Material success like car, home, a house, a property, money will go away. It's temporary. The peace within, calmness, this is what really matters. I resigned from the IAS because I wanted to be a speaker. I wanted to be reaching out to young people. 
and uh, I had ten years more to go before I retired. But I I did that, and I'm very happy with my life. So here I am, and this is how you can connect. Thank you very much. And if you have question, I'm ready. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much, sir. I, I really found it very, very inspirational. You know, like it was very inspiring to know. And uh, the first story, I'd like to tell the first story. That is something we all should uh, learn to adapt in ourselves. That when we get success, when we get happiness, we don't really, uh, you know, uh, treasure it that way, and we don't make it find it like, you know, why me for that? But when people are unwell or when any any bad thing happens to them in life, they just go like, why me? So this was a very good story. That yes, how he. You no know, puts it that you know even mindedness was for the word you used so yes. that is very very good yes thank you for sharing this amazing story with us that was really good um in the second story sir you said change is the only constant in life so uh, like how would you suggest especially the youth these days you know and and things are changing especially due to the pandemic and you know it has been a vast change for us all of us it, it's, it was sudden it was unexpected and a very vast change so what would you recommend the youth like how do they uh, adapt to this change what are the steps or maybe something that they could do to you know you know adapt themselves to the change yeah so two things i'll recommend number one work on your basics that means your basics are right whatever changes come like a pandemic a storm or an earthquake an upheaval in your life ups and downs if your basics are right you will never go wrong that means you follow these eight c's you have good character you have good communication skills you are a cheerful person you are well read you read books you are aware you are confident then changes will not affect you adversely ever secondly when your mind is uh, feeling worried about change about college about jobs about will i have a successful career then tell yourself that life is a big long journey it doesn't matter how many marks you got in this today's test or whether you cleared this interview or not this is not the end of the world you lose a game you win a game you you go down sometimes you you win you bounce back so life is not going to be full of successes it's not going to be full of failures they will alternate sometimes happy sometimes if you can find success after failure that is the best way to win so change is basically our friend you cannot hope for a life of you know sitting on a couch and watching your tv interesting netflix all your life uh, you're munching away at a packet of nachos and you know you're loving your life that way it can't be always like that sometimes you'll have to work sometimes you'll have to go out sometimes you'll have to come back sometimes you'll get married sometimes you'll have children everything keeps changing evolving so the world is evolving you are evolving so be joyous in the moment and expect change to be your friend right so these two points will be noted i think they'll definitely help because that is something we need for our emotional intelligence you know mind diverts and we don't focus on things so yes this would be good also sir uh, you mentioned about the criticism criticization right so like people criticize and all we have good uh, we have like good criticized criticism as well as bad criticism so it uh, it's like could you like tell us how do we take criticism like we won't give okay fine we have i have learned like okay sir said this and this is good so i won't criticize others but i will be getting criticism so could you like tell how to take it in the positive way or you know how to move on with it yeah yeah it's a good question and i think uh, you're right in asking me this because if i become a very amiable and uh, cheerful person not criticizing others and i'm very happy but others are provoking me criticizing me or talking badly to me obviously i'm a human being i will feel low i will feel like recoiling or you know rebutting them or reacting shouting or maybe doing the same but i have to basically cultivate two qualities in this again the first quality is uh, being even minded means that i know that these people don't either they don't mean it or they are not going to be able to hurt me i i have made a shelter around myself that whatever they are saying is basically spoiling their own life i am not going to spend my time pondering over it he said something shallow i am not going to spend my life thinking about that shallow thing he said i should not expect him to be perfect 
even in a marriage or a relationship that person should not expect the spouse or the other person to be perfect we realize that i need to be in my own world comfortable second is the quality of forgiveness so if somebody says something to me and i shout back that person shouts back it becomes a slanging match never ending two brothers they fight over property and then they never met again you know in the movies or in real life also so my point to you is that if one of them forgives you know an ad came on tv recently where the two boys in a car young men and the other car overtook them and the younger man says come on bhaiya let's beat them so this bhaiya says no no we are we are you know bigger we are better we are more calm then let them go it doesn't matter to me if that car overtook me so calmness will help forgiveness will help and you become a better person of course you will feel low for a while somebody said even a mother said something you feel the pinch or a teacher said something you feel the pinch however we don't keep on dwelling on the negatives we move ahead move forward we forget it the next morning forget it go ahead yes yes the feeling low for a while is like you know it's is that this is saying that it's okay to feel not okay sometimes so this yes. it should just last for some time that's it apart from that you should you know be all good and all yes sir, that's true i think this would be what is last question maybe uh, but a very important question because i found people who are who want to connect who want to you know grow themselves who want to be better or you know just just go out and you know uh, have a strong sense of you know self emotional uh, intelligence and all but they are introverts so they they feel that you know okay she is an extrovert that's the reason she can go and talk up easily she can you know go and connect you know so could you like give some maybe some piece of advice for such people you know who feel uh, that you know they might not be good or you know there's some something that holds them back so anything that you would uh, tell these people yeah so i also used to be a little bit of an introvert and now i've become a speaker i'm speaking before you and others the point is that we evolve we change so if you are an introvert today doesn't mean you going to be an introvert forever secondly people who are in their shell they will emerge from it if they find that resolve one day suddenly it happens that you start talking a little better you start becoming a little more confident and everybody needs a mentor so i am very happy to mentor people i mentor a lot of them is a sir i feel so nervous in front of others i can't speak i can't do this so i tell them practice so if somebody is an introvert and doesn't know how to speak with others even speaking in front of a phone camera put your phone there speak record yourself for 2 minutes watch yourself next day tell your sister to tell you whether this is good public speaking will improve confidence will improve. if you are an extro if you are an introvert or if your shell tell yourself that by and by i will become better not today tomorrow i can't be suddenly i can't become you know someone like virat kohli who is so expressive if you are if you are expressive you just need to be uh, gradually improving look at dhoni ms dhoni was so calm he was so as a captain he would be very very calm and he would speak little but he would speak with proper uh, expression and he would say the right things he was a good leader speak when required so you need not be too much out there or you need not be too much in yourself again balance is the key and that is what i have found to be the best true sir balance balance is the key word balancing ourselves is very important yes sir yeah. thank you very much sir i i i feel very satisfied you know with your answers everything uh, all of it covers the entire idea that we have over here anything that you would like to let the young audience know you know just anything before we wrap this up yeah so i have typed out my uh, the name of my book finding success within which you can share with other channels also and my instagram id is vivek atre you can follow me and my book uh, finding success within is available on amazon basically i want to share it with all young people because i have given them secrets of what to make you in life to become a better human being a better successful professional i'd also like to share that don't be worried in life don't be negative life will improve please enjoy your life. it's your fun. and uh, also go within follow your religious practices meditate if you can and body mind and soul all three are important to so look after all three don't don't think only of the body that i am going to eat this i am going to exercise i am going to think of the mind think of your deeper self 
and that is how you become a better human being and that is how life becomes happier emotional intelligence is only a step it's a ladder for you to reach that state of happiness so happiness is the goal keep in touch i'll be very happy to be in touch with all of you thank you sir sir thank you thank you very much uh, i like to thank uh, you for your inspiring stories your motivational words and of course your eight c's i've noted them down and they definitely be helpful for us so thank you very much once again sir for sharing your time and your valuable knowledge with us all of us thank you bye bye yes sir thank you very much All right, everyone. So we are done with this session, and we have our panel coming up next in next three minutes. Our moderator Zuha Karim Ansari will take over. Evening. Are we ready with this session? Oh, this is the right link sent to me. I am Navomita. Good evening, everyone. I'm waiting for the other hmm, other speakers to join in. Good afternoon, Ms. Navomita. This is Good Zuha. Evening. Good evening. Hi, Zuha. <laughs> Finally, we meet. Exactly, we've been chat and you, with you also and with all other panelists also. I've been speaking with all of you for like so long for a month now, and now we finally meet. It's lovely. What an honor! What an honor! Thank <laughs> you so much. The honor is mine, please. <laughs> um, I would request all the other panelists also to please switch their webcam on, and we can immediately get to it. Hi, Zua. Hi, Miss Kavita. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am also great. <laughs> This is the final panel of the entire Change Maker Summit. Um, and then uh, ah, uh, good so afternoon, Mr. Nish. Yes, Miss Usha Rengaraju, are you with us over yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Yeah. um i believe miss archya hela she has to join us with audio uh, and uh, i would like to inform our panelists that miss usha rengaraju she has an issue with her webcam so she will be just joining us with her audio okay. um okay perfect we have all our six panelists on board So this is the so final time. I just mentioned. Yeah, we can. Yeah. She's joining. Miss Archanila. Hello. Miss Archanila. Good afternoon. Are you hearing me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, Miss Archia. <coughs> uh, Miss Archia. Yes. Yes, it would be lovely to even see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to connect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. So, hello. Hello, everyone. So, I just want to check: Am I loud and clear? Yes, perfect. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I think we should just immediately get to it exactly at five o'clock p.m. I S P. Okay, 
So, dear esteemed panelists, thank you for joining with us for the final panel of the Changemaker Summit 2021 organized by About Those Big Dreams at Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. So before we start this panel, I would like to give you all a glimpse of what our institution is like. We were established in the year 2008, a temple of learning at the heart of the city of Perth and provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students. Stanley is affiliated to the prestigious Usmani University of Hyderabad. It provides all eligible engineering courses, which are accredited by both NBA and NAC with a grade A. Stanley is also an ISO certified institution. Stanley ranks at 105th among the best engineering institutes of India and second best women's engineering college of all South India. Stanley is currently expecting an autonomous status which shall raise the honor of this institution. Stanley has a strong belief empower women, impact the world. It aims to empower girl students through professional education integrated with the values and character to make an impact in the world. And Women's College, Women in Technology, this panel and this summit was organized by About Those Big Dreams. We are a student initiative at Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. We were formed in April 2022, 2020, this is of the early days of the pandemic to shine the light of learning in all of the young hearts, especially when darkness took over the world. ATBD provides a chance in these difficult times to learn more about the working world from people who are willing to share their story, such as yourselves. So thank you so much for joining with us, our dear, dear panelists. And for our final session, it's very, very special to us, actually. And it's getting us really emotional. So with... Uh, as with me introducing us to you, I shall introduce all of you to our audience. So, joining with us as a first panelist is Ms. Achya Nila. She's an experienced digital production professional. She had worked with some of the leading global networks on clients such as Dell, Colgate, Hillspet, J and J, HTC, HSBC, Microsoft, HP. Epson, Vodafone, Betfair, and Nokia. She has total plus seven plus experience in web-based technology makes, and makes her to lead an interactive web-based solution provider. Over 10 plus years of creative background, enabling added fashion designing and strategic value. She also has more than five years of experience in digital marketing and specializes in product development and management, project management, team lead, dynamic website development, digital or online marketing, web development, mobile app development, analyst, multimedia developer, AS3 development, and Google products. We also have with us Dr. Rashi Gupta. She's fondly known as Battery Valley of India. She is the pioneer of manufacturing of advanced lithium batteries in India, along with the world's smartest lithium battery. She's a woman entrepreneur who has been fearless and ferocious in creating a brand for herself and the company in this male-dominated field. If one takes a closer look at the alchemy of this achiever, two distinct virtues pop up besides perseverance and hard work. These are pioneering spirit and willingness. Coupled with an impressive background, it was not therefore surprising that she became a prominent name in the renewable energy sector of India and is featured as Asia's most influential woman in renewable energy 2020. She has been working on gender equality and women empowerment issues globally. She holds degrees of both of MBE, MBA, LLM, and PhD to her title. She is also a committee member of Bureau of Indian Standards of Batteries, Energy Storage, and E-Mobility. We also have with us next is Ms. Kavita Jha. She is the co-founder and CEO of Kix AR Technologies. Kix AR is a virtual try-on company, creating real-life like shopping experiences for fashion retail using AI and AR. Her company, Kix AR, is one amongst the first few virtual try-on company with recommendations on styling and fitment across various categories in fashion retail. Prior to this, she was part of founding member and spearheaded the engineering in Ramyan Intelligence Lab, 
which got acquired by Arvato later on. A top German MNC and one of the world's largest mass media companies, she has been a startup person all through her life and hardcore technology enthusiast at heart. Her strength has been questioning the failures and finding the answer for why we cannot do it. We also have with us Ms. Nabomita Mazumdar. She is the founder of Com. She is the President's Awardee recipient of 100 Women Achievers Awardee from the Ministry of Women and Child Development. An XLRI Jamshedpur alum, she was felicitated during Rajmata Vijay Rajay Sindha birth, birth Centenary Celebrations at Talkotara Stadium in Delhi. Currently, she is the National Chairman to Confederation of India Micro, Small, Medium Enterprises and International Council for Technology Management and Applied Engineering, supported by the Ministry of MSME. She is a Council Advisor to the Board of All India Railway Council. She is also an Ambassador to the Ministry of Women and Child Development as the founder of Nabomita.com, where she amplifies meaningful messages to society using different formats of media, ensuring companies scale up their businesses and turn around earning million dollar revenues. We next have with us Ms. Sonesh Bharadwaj. He has 14 years of experience in the services industry, heading various portfolios under sales, marketing, operations, training, being a fine-tuned business and lifestyle coach. She has coached and mentored more than 10,000 plus various entrepreneurs, established business, startup owners across the global market in upscaling and enhancing their team performances and hence scale up their business. She's a certified sales and soft skills leadership behavioral coach and a master facilitator for TTT and various coaching platforms. Being a high enthusiastic speaker at various platforms for women entrepreneurs, youth summits, business leadership, startup ideation and life coaching, she has trained teams in various capacities, right from classrooms to various seminar gatherings on various modules and requirements. She has, uh, one of her achievements is also to be get awarded as the best outstanding trained graduate teacher by IESA Bangkok Island. Got featured as motivational speaker on Coach to Connect platform with top leaders from India. She's an exclusive business and life coach at ABCD International India. She's got nominated for Global Startup Business Leadership Award. Finally, we have with us Ms. Usha Rengaraju. She is India's first woman Kaggle Grandmaster and she is ranked as top 10 data scientists in India for the year 2020 by Analytics India Magazine. She organized Neuro AI, which is India's first ever research symposium in the interface of neuroscience and data science. She specializes in probabilistic graphical models, machine learning, and deep learning. She has prepared curriculum for Bits Pilani, Masters in Data Science program, and it's, which is consumed by 20,000 plus students, and Upgrad's PGP program in DS, that is data science consumed again by 10,000 plus students. Those are all the panelists for this session, and it is a great honor for me to actually meet you all virtually even. It's an honor that you all have joined us in the Chainmaker Summit as a panelist for the topic, Women in Technology. Thank you all so much for joining with us. <laughs> Pleasure. So, Pleasure. So as we move on, thank you. So as we move on with this session, uh, I think we can go around sharing opinions on this panel because it's, such, it's a panel that is very close to our hearts, especially as ladies ourselves. So let me start with Ms. Achya Nela. Can you please share your opinion on this panel? Hi, Shiva. Thank you so much for inviting me in this awesome panel. Actually, yeah, I just hear about everyone and all our awesome women, actually, all our strong women here. So I feel a bit nervous, oh my God, where I am now. But it's really, uh, I get inspired to the uh, story of Rashidis and the Kapitajis. Actually, uh, everyone is very, uh, very doing very impressive jobs in their world. So uh, I, I love to uh, learn more about them and their uh, work and how we can uh, connect with each other. So yeah, 
I, I love to learn from everyone and also Zua you I, I also <laughs> want to learn how actually you university is going and um, how uh, how many uh, many students in your class because in my class I, I have only one uh, girls in my class so I I love to learn actually what is the situation nowadays as i mentioned we are a completely women's college so i don't see yeah. anybody except ladies in my college yeah, yeah this is fine mm. yeah uh, so moving on uh, miss kavita jha please share with your opinion on this panel first of all thank you zuha for giving me this privilege to share this uh, forum with such strong ladies i think i uh, as achia said that i would like to learn from all of them because it's very nice to see you know that so many strong women and we say that you know there are less women in technology now here we can see all empowered women who are trying to do a change so i think i'll also try to learn from them and then learn how to make that small change in the society to empower an, an other women so i'm looking forward to the discussion uh thank you so much ms kavita moving on i would ask dr rashi gupta if she can please share her views on this panel women in technology please uh yeah uh, we can't hear you you are on mute now she is uh probably zua she is not joined on the audio probably no she she, she has joined with the audio yes 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 i think it is going back and forth on mute how about you just reload the page yeah Dr. i think that Gupta? would be a good idea um so until we are joined by her uh, miss nabomita can you please take over thank you zua am i audible Yes. 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 Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, what an honor being uh, being able to share my views and insight on women in technology with such forward leaders. I uh, I have to call them women because they are. But I live to live to that day wherein the gender wouldn't be the wouldn't be the address and the number would exceed everything. Only the achievements and the change that we can make would come. so uh, i'm looking forward to that kind of an interaction and that kind of a uh, that kind of an insight from this panel uh, I, i wish i wish every speaker all the luck and uh, it was great listening about your uh, your uh, achievements i did look up you look you up on the internet so yes i'm excited to hear you thank you <laughs> thank you so much mr bomita uh, dr rashi will you give it a try am i audible now Oh yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, uh, I am super thrilled to be uh, with the young um, audience here because we don't see too many women in the tech sector, and I am. Um, I love the panel out here. I can see six faces uh, here, uh, all lovely, bright, and uh, uh, complete accomplished. so that gives me a real hope that very soon we will have many many more uh, women in technology and uh, stem kind of uh, fields because that is something where we need them more because uh, women bring a lot of um, advantages to stem which uh, the industry has been deprived of so it's high time now that all of us together work and uh, with stanley college doing such a great initiative i really hope to see more women coming up to the sectors thank you so much dr rashi it's wonderful listening to all of you <laughs> uh, moving on uh, ms sunesh bharadwaj can you please share your views with us yeah so first of all i would like to thank uh, you know stanley college and zua to you for organizing such a wonderful uh, i think this entire summit is so amazing because uh, all in all i was just you know getting uh, on to the link Uh, day one, day two, and this is day three finally. So I was able to just see uh, in bits and pieces that how each and every speaker was so phenomenally great in terms of sharing their mm-hmm. ideas. I think it's it's wonderful. And um, coming down to this particular panel, I feel so privileged to be here because 
all the leading ladies yes there's a lot of learning going to be and uh, no doubt uh, i think it's it's a pleasure also to be a woman and uh, leading this especially uh, if we talk about tech industry yes it's a kind of very understated uh, industry especially as far as women is concerned due to certain uh, you know areas so as dr rashi has just mentioned that stem is something where we look out for more such talent but unfortunately yes probably we are not using our potential to the best and i think today this entire panel discussion i'm i'm sure that we are going to bring some light on and we will definitely try our level best to make sure that however we can empower each and everybody in all the best areas so let's do our best thank you so much yes yes thank you let's do our best and finally we also have with us ms usha rengaraju can you please share your views with us um first i uh, thank both the uh, stanley college uh, professor kishor who invited me and uh, zuha for organizing it wonderfully um i have organized a lot of conferences as well i mean last year in 2019 i organized a conference which had 100 women speakers and uh, it was a month long conference so i know the pain of organizing a conference and uh, particularly uh, if it's going to be a women conference Uh, there's a lot of coordination and a lot of patience is required. I think you are your pulse is a wonderful. Uh, because I've been on that uh, and and it's a very important platform. It's very important. I mean, for the problem to get resolved, it's very important. We have to first sit and uh, talk about it, and you know, there should be a platform to discuss the problems and you know how we can come up with a solution. So this is a very important forum. when you know, we can have conversations and have brainstorming on how to resolve certain issues which exists for women in the technology right now and then so um, the other thing which um, which really interests me is i'm meeting women so women i generally will be in panels where there is women in data science or women in analytics or uh, something related to data i've never been in a women in technology panel where i meet uh, you know the uh, women across the other technological sector also uh, it's also interesting to see how uh, you know uh, women are treated in other technology sector and their perspectives i would like to know if there's going to be a change or differences or can i learn something from other sectors if they are very good in a certain area uh, so i'm looking forward to all the uh, insights from this panel to take away hope uh, yeah thank you for the platform everyone yeah thank you ms usha um this act women in technology panel when you were even discussing about like we should also have this kind of panel you were like why is always that we need to make something specially only for women only for women in technology why don't people have panels like men in technology so when you were brainstorming this answer you were like if everyone does have women in technology so about this panel i should ask from the experts themselves why it is like that So, how about I start with uh, Dr. Nachi Gupta? Can you give us a view on why? Why do we have it this way? Well, we have it this way because women are in shortage and in ultimate demand. Okay, so the demand and supply is not matching, and that's the reason why we need to have four such panels. We have an oversupply with men in technology, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> by this uh, such panels coming up on many many conferences we at least aim to match the demand with the supply truly then uh, all, actually i'd like to ask as all of you are women in technology how is it like being women in technology how is it like being when the demand is not equal to the supply and how is it like being that and i would like to direct this to ms archana nela please thank you joha again uh, the thing is actually <clears throat> you have given my previous uh, experience the briefing and uh, so uh, actually now i i love to share my story i am ajanila founder of women in digital yeah so uh, founder of women in digital so my organization name is women in digital is a uh, software company running by all women engineer and so uh, actually uh, the the answer of your question so that is why women in digital is born because already rashi gupta them give an answer there is shortage 
So uh, when I start my company, people are asking me, "See, you are balloting gender. Uh, you, you company is not the gender uh, ma- maintain the gender equality." So my answer is, "See, my company is running by all women engineer, but, but other company you you will not get any women developer over there." other software companies so i am balancing that way so if you think it's the bangladesh and all the software companies they have only one or two women engineer in their company and in my company there's 35 women engineer working together so this is the way i am balancing the gender so the thing is actually why i have taken this initiative so when i was working in the industry so i you already mentioned i have working with the top, top branded companies so in that time i faced one common problem so people are thinking uh, maybe she is complete her engineering degree that doesn't mean she will be a good programmer because i am complete engineer so maybe she will be do, uh, go, uh, doing good in uh, uh, testing team or design team so that uh, that actually hurt my ego because i i feel something like this when i am taking my degree as engineer in that time i never heard this this thing so uh, we were not able to do uh, technical things so but why now so uh, for that reason i i think i uh, i will uh, complete my job uh, change so it's like i start as junior software engineer and when i promoted as a cto in a multinational company in that time that day actually i quit my job and start my own business so the thing uh, what we are doing uh, we develop initially i start developing skilled women and then they are working with uh, my team so uh, now actually i i just prove, I, i was trying to prove only one thing that is women is uh, women are doing very good if they get the uh, right actually guidance and right opportunity so the the problem is uh, people always uh, set their mindset women are not able to do this women are not able to do that so they decided actually women are not able to they decide but we are not so that's why um, uh, i am actually uh, taking this decision so i will make a company and here are all women engineer working together and i will showcasing my company in all over the world see women can do yeah this is my things thank you so much achia and that was a very funny but like it's it's it sounds funny but actually very it's sad that you, what you said that you're trying to balance the supply and demand by having running an only women company it's both yeah. funny and sad um next up i would like to direct my question to miss nabomita um you work with a lot of this uh, gender you know empowering women and stuff so how far have you specifically made the piece for gender diversity within organizations or within basically the entire industry i would say okay uh zuha let me thank you so much i love this question because we uh, we did an initiative way back in 2016 and 17 as well uh this initiative was called we are equal right it was run by ministry of women and child development from central union cabinet and uh what was the entire initiative all about the initiative required men to come up and say why they feel they are equal to women right so uh the entire exercise was brilliant we uh, we got responses from uh, men across india i mean tier 1 tier 2 cities definitely men surprised us right saying that um i i treat my daughter better than my son because when she good when i wet her off i want her to bring up a stronger family than i am building so imagine a father is looking at her daughter building a better family than he is so that kind of a strong individuality strong sense of a being strong sense of nation building came up and um, yes uh, one of the responses that got a beautiful um, a beautiful response uh, uh, was uh, from a startup community in mumbai and uh, the the two people right two eminent people from that community they held up the board saying that we are equal because until and unless we uh, we learn to support each other we no nobody remains uh, there will be no balance so yes we are supporting women so that we remain in the balance so yes uh, practically when it comes to business when it comes to technology when it comes to a lot of hardcore areas <coughs> sorry excuse me. we did have an ex- i did have an experience with itc 
and um, this was uh, during the girls technology day right which which is in march by un and uh, yes we went across india and we we raised a lot of uh, a lot of women leaders right young budding leaders from engineering colleges from different places not just engineering colleges girls who thought that they could be leaders in technology <coughs> we we did had several initiative running running for them however all these things does it boil down to the increase of number in the women leaders in technology sector uh, recently i was invited for a power keynote uh, at a international women in tech in technology summit right in uk interestingly i was i was extremely elated that i'm going to deliver this power keynote and just i was being introduced i realized that because the organizer said that i was the first indian to deliver that keynote in that summit right and the summit has been there for since a long time it was a huge honor for me but a sudden question came into my mind that they did not find any other leader from my country so far fine now onwards there have to be many more women addressing this summit powered keynotes and every session in here right what we need to do is to we just don't need to build women leaders as we go on building we need to keep that door open so that we make their presence count we make their presence make a difference in the industry yes we can we can hire more and more engineers in our company but at the end of the day we, if those engineers are not reaching the board of director level at the end of the day the outage would be too high and there would be not much that you can you can um, you can achieve other than achieving the diversity in hiring number for your company so yes that's my point of view from the government to the individual level that's how we see it thank you so much ms nabomu that was actually a very wonderful these kind of moments even though they are again there are so many things that are happening that are sad but they are very inspiring also and it motivates you to even do better so yes uh, next time i would actually like to ask ms kavita jha uh, i would like to direct it towards you um there are many turning points that happen because of these kind of moments in this our lives so what was the turning point in your career which made you thought that i i should take up entrepreneurship because that is very bold <laughs> so uh, one thing which i strongly believe uh, which uh, i have that in my mind is we are not equal men and women are not equal god itself has created that you know women have the power rather the source of birth you know is from women so there is no first thing we as a women have to believe that you know we are not equal we have to only thing which i am saying is that you don't have to step on someone you know to write to create your journey you can create your own path so that was my <laughs> journey towards uh, my life and as as you mentioned a turning point so i have been working in a startup throughout the my life like last 17 years i have been working in a startup so in startup you get lot of this opportunities where you are put in a very spot and as you said first question that women in technology why we did not have men in technology so i had to go through that journey but i would say that i was very lucky that my mentors and my uh, colleagues were very helpful but there was one incident which created a spark in me and that incident and i feel that um, many of us would have gone through is see when we uh, go for a maternity leave when when you are going for your maternity leave the questions are asked are you going to come back you know that is one question or once you come back when you are going for an interview you are newly married you are asked uh, are you planning to have a family what really hits me is that these questions are not asked to a man and similarly once i came back from a maternity leave i was heading my company in the technology and then i come back and because company needed that path you know that uh, place where it needed to grow we created a layer of people who all came and then i was like just because you know a very biological change i went through i cannot lose my opportunity so that gave me the spark that no i need i don't need to fight i need to prove myself that you know if a woman goes for a maternity leave she doesn't leave her things behind she is still in the way and that is where i created a team of technology people and that is where i also helped the company to get bought by a mnc and that gave me the spark that you know If, if I could fight, and I did not get into the fighting spirit, you know, I basically took it in my journey that 
I need to prove to myself that I am no lesser than any man or any one. I don't compete with men. I prove to myself that yes, I can do it. And that is where I said that if I could uh, manage my professional life, my personal life, and my newborn baby uh, so well, why can't I create another, uh, you know, company where I could, you know, do things in my own stride? And then, as uh, I said, this company is a virtual tie-on company, and we are into fashion retail. And I think no woman will say that we don't like doing shopping. And if you can do shopping sitting at home and then trying it on yourself. That is the biggest, uh, uh, you know, feather in the cap which we can do, and that is what was the genesis of launching this Kixa. And I can proudly say that we are um, AR company in uh, in the world. There are very few companies in the AR which is led by a woman, and Kixa is one of them. And also, we are very diversified. So our uh, HR head is also a woman. So I, I mean, I don't believe that. Okay, I need to create only women company. But yes, I do believe. that i need to create uh, that environment for women so that you know they don't because what i strongly feel is sometimes this stench of not taking up role in technology is because the women do not have belief in themselves we sometimes feel that uh, can i do better than a man can i go and compete can i go and ask like a simple thing like a woman i myself feel, we don't go for uh, ask for a salary right away you know men will fight to the tea that Why didn't I get? They'll compare, but we feel so. Uh, rather, sometimes we feel embarrassed. Can we should we go and ask? So what I feel is that you know we should not be afraid to what to ask, and then go and fight for it. Don't undermine yourself. Have a belief in yourself, and then I think you can do it. So that is how I landed my Kixa journey. Thank you so much, Miss Kavita, for sharing that with us. and you also mentioned about how you found right people also and how you find found good mentors also and that is i think also quite necessary and people say that a lot that you should have mentors so miss sonesh bhardwaj i also noticed that you really enjoyed what miss kavita was saying can you please elaborate more on these lines yes uh, thank you so much zoha and uh, i completely resonate with what kavita ma'am has just shared because see being a lady it's not easy but let me tell you first of all your competition should be with you then you grow in any area to be very honest i am a engineer by education i am electronics and telecommunication engineer and to uh, my uh, fortunate thing that i never joined into it though i got placed into <laughs> it and that to my dream company but then at the final time of joining somewhere my heart was saying so this is not what something you are looking out come on you you deserve something better but yes probably right now you are not ready and you have to make sure that you have to work hard and right on the day one after doing my engineering i always wanted to do something which is unique especially in the areas of empowering people uh, so i don't go by this that only women needs to get empowered let me tell you as as ladies as women we are already empowered because we are the symbol of power right all we need to understand is more than empowering i think we need to more, uh, aware lot of people in this particular side so awareness is a key factor which is lacking big time right now and i think i am so fortunate that all the leading ladies are working towards it and especially with this panel i think yes we are doing a phenomenal job as far as what is the best we can contribute now your question to me was how uh, I, i mean a right mentor matters let me tell you Uh, when i started my journey so my very first job was basically into a direct marketing i chose a very challenging field because i thought if i really want to create something where nobody has done so i have to really take big risk in my life and my very first risk was getting into a direct marketing job and uh, being an engineer there were a lot of uh, throw away challenges uh, my own parents were asking that you been scholar throughout i think you are you need a psychiatrist to consult immediately i was like <laughs> i couldn't dance and you know i forget about friends and relatives you know they are always ready to bombard you with a set of questions so i didn't bother too much i said right now the time is just to keep myself sharp work on my inner power believe what i feel and let me just tear it out to my gut feeling and go with that and that was a turning point which i took the journey was really long because uh, i still remember i was keep experimenting i never stopped myself and uh, i have worked with all the best of best uh, mnc and post that i decided that 
it's not only about working into MNCs. Then I jumped into startups. And as Kavita Mata just shared, that working with startups actually give you the right exposure to who you are. Because there you do a job of a security person and then you are the owner also, you know. And I was so fortunate to work with all the business owners, you know, where I was learning in and out of the all businesses. And I felt that journey was amazing. Though there was like 20, uh, I mean, I would say 18 to 20 hours of hard work journey every day. It was not easy. But then I say, come on, I have to take this because I decided to, uh, you know, do something unique. So definitely the journey is not going to be easy. And uh, that's how I entered into the field of advertising, then being into events. And I think my biggest uh, turning point uh, from this man dominating thing was uh, into a real estate company where I was heading that department as a marketing head, right? I had a team of almost 70, 80 people, all men. And you can understand real estate people are, <laughs> they, they are very different. And when they see a lady going to lead them, first of all, I think back of their head, they were laughing. And uh, probably I was looking too young in front of them, the kind of experience they were coming on. But ultimately, I believe it's not about your age. It's, it's all about how well you can turn all the things on the table. And uh, I always, uh, a firm believer of creating a work-life balance, because for me, it's not only about the work. As a lady, as a human being, man or uh, women doesn't matter. All it matters is how well you are able to create the balance in your life. That actually leads your further journey. Right. After working for a good seven, eight years and getting connected to the right mentor, a uh, lot of learning, unlearning, uh, getting trained a number of times and again picking up myself into this entire dominating world of man, I realized one thing that all you need to understand is you are the best version of yourself and you have to continuously try on the best version of you. Right. Don't waste your time in just comparing yourself. What is your neighbor's uh, job right now? Who, who the person who is sitting next uh, desk? What he is doing? Let them do what they are doing. I think if you really want to achieve or touch certain destination points in your life, focus on yourself first. I think then only you can empower people in the real sense. And I truly follow this because a lot of my mentors, when I approach them, saying that uh, this is what I am, but my dreams are quite big. Is there any possibility? And uh, they always think like, why you are thinking? Is there any possibility? I think very well there is a possibility. Why not? Then I was quite doubtful. I said, so being a woman, people always laugh, you know, saying that uh, coming from a middle class family and, and then being an engineer, you are entering into entrepreneurship. Again, you want to just, you know, coach people into business coaching and all. So it was so diversified. I couldn't understand that how this whole journey is. But right uh, the entire 14 years of my career, my journey, coaching and mentoring people, and number of times, all I've understood is your right guidance, right mentorship with right people always pays you. Don't stop yourself getting the right direction because mentors always play a huge role because they can direct you. Now, a lot of my mentors were very, very, uh, you know, I would say they were criticizing me initially just to check me on my thoughts whether I am a go-getter kind of person or I'm just trying to be into the dreamy land. And I think a real mentor always gives you that test and that's how you create the gem out of, uh, out of I think, nothing, right? So I personally believe we all have potential enough. All we need to understand is our real capability, real potential, and the right mentor can only bring that uh, right potential on the table. So uh, my journey was uh, was a never ending uh, and a continuous learning with all the respective mentors wherever I get a chance, wherever I, I had an opportunity to interact with national and international leaders, right? And even till today, I, I feel uh, learning, mentoring, coaching, even being a coach, I get myself mentored on a continuous basis. And I think that adds a lot of value to our skill set, make us more skilled, more powered. And that's how we are probably able to go and help people on their, you know, ground level work. So that's all from my side, Zuha. Thank you, Ms. Sunesh. Uh, you actually really well highlighted the importance of a mentor in your own personal life. And as a mentor yourself, you get mentored. That is quite amazing, actually. It's like very fascinating. Thank you so but much. Also, but there are also many mentor programs that happen. And uh, I would like to direct Ms. this question at Ms. O Usha Rengaraju that there are so many mentor programs that also are there. So what's the extent that it works in empowering 
women in workplaces specifically now? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, mentor programs are uh, very, very important. If you see these days, there are a lot of interesting mentor programs at work, um, uh, workplace which is happening. Uh, recently, I was approached from somebody in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so she is, uh, I mean, she is the program director of uh, mentoring for women, uh, particularly who are in the junior level, get to the manager level. And uh, I was like, why only women? I mean, uh, why not like both genders? I mean, uh, when we for uh, junior level to manage level, why not? I mean, she was saying, no, no, it's the women. You know, when they start out, it's around like uh, 23rd. Uh, I mean, when they start out from engineering around 21, around 23, 27, 28, they get married and somewhere around they lose track. And uh, so she's designed this entire uh, program, which, you know, uh, even if they get distracted and lose track, you know, the mentoring program ensures, you know, um, they get track and, you know, get the promotion they deserve, you know, get everything what they deserve. And uh, so it is well organized. I, I believe there are such kind of programs that are in India for senior executive leadership, but I did not find many programs for the junior level. And so women at all levels require mentoring. And uh, I mean, they should be a mentee and they should also be a mentor. So being a mentor for several women, one thing I realized was I was able to overcome my own insecurity. So I have a lot of things like uh, jealousy, uh, you know, comparing myself with other people. I used to do that very well. I'm a Canon grandmaster, so Canon is a competitive platform. So, you know, you keep comparing what your uh, other people are doing. You get a lot of anxiety and all that. So when I started mentoring people, I was able to overcome my own things. You know, I was becoming a better person. I was able to overcome this jealousy over a period of, you know, the moment I started realizing, you know, I can be a better person, I started making this transformation. It took me a long time. Uh, so, you know, uh, these kind of programs have to be introduced at all workplaces. So there are some programs which have started out in India as well, and there are a lot of NGOs which are starting out as well. Last year, I was, uh, you know, collaborating uh, and speaking with an uh, owner of an NGO, CEO of an NGO, it is like leader. So she has built a mentoring program for women in technology, particularly the print uh, TV and the web There are a lot of programs which are starting out, uh, but there is nothing concrete which, has, which is within an organization itself. And even if it is concrete, what kind of what skills do you teach? You know, uh, the skills which you teach people should be the right kind of skills. It's not just mental program. Are you giving them the right kind of skills which, uh, which matters? Like, for example, uh, you know, a language matters really in a workplace. Language is very, very important. So there's not many uh, programs which teach us how to speak, how to behave. So framing, psychology, all these things are very, very important in communication. But these things are not actually taught. And uh, there should be programs which should explicitly uh, teach such things and uh, which will be, uh, make a better uh, workplace, you know. Uh, and uh, it's very, very important uh, uh, for women to have mentors. And because the time you, uh, I mean, everyone learns from their mistake. But if you take, you know, by the time you, every time you fail and fail and fail and fail and by the time it takes a really long time. So, you know, by the time you uh, stabilize and, you know, reach a particular level, it takes that uh, time is too long. Uh, so if you can have a mentor, you can uh, cut short the time it takes uh, for you to grow in your career. And uh, so uh, this is, uh, and also in women in data science, I'm an ambassador for women in data science initiative, which is a Stanford University initiative. As a part of it, uh, we are having a lot of mentoring programs. Right now, there is something called data talk that is happening. And uh, for this data talk, uh, we, we have three mentors. Like, we have around 15 mentors, the women who are participating in data talk. Uh, they can form teams of five with anyone they like. And once they form teams, they come and tell us, like we Lakha and Anita, she mentor to them. So if you take this, I'm just giving an example. If you take this competitive platform, uh, around 99% are men. And there are one or two women here and there scattered. You can actually count the number of uh, women in Kagan. 
so the reason is that when it's not like women are bad data centers women are much more uh, great in crunching data but why is there a lack because you get the feeling of overwhelming something there's something that stops you from progressing or is there something which is clouding you so to figure out what is it which is stopping you it is always good to lean on somebody who has gone through that journey and hear from their insight or whenever you are stuck it's always good to you know go to somebody and also we are doing this we have been this for a couple of years for women in data science data zone initiative and we have been extremely uh, successful and uh, this is just a small thing you know this mentorship program has to penetrate into all walks of uh, corporate thing so i'm a consultant so i can't talk much about uh, how it happens in a typical corporate life uh, so that's why i've taken an example outside the corporate life women in data science initiative is a not for profit initiative i don't know how this mentoring program happens in uh, technological sectors or in a proper corporate like maybe the other uh, panelists can uh, answer if they really have mentoring programs that they work with and how successful are those mentoring programs are they you know some you know is it just for the pr say or are they really having a mentoring program which is creating an impact have they measured have they do they have metrics which they measure the impact uh, these kind of questions i think maybe the other panelists might be able to shed more light on uh so i have been i can only talk about the not for profit initiative which i am associated with uh, at this point of time and uh, yeah thank you i believe dr rashi gupta can add to that yes i have certain points here and i hope all your senior um, faculty and you know admin is listening to this see we are all talking of mentorship and mentorship i believe begins at home with the parents at the first there are first mentors they teach us everything so why cannot we have or rather why should we not take an initiative to mentor the parents first because if we mentor the parents first i think we'll have better equality status we will have better uh, freedom to the women uh, to the girls who are coming in to the sector and they will have a very thorough knowledge that this sector also belongs to girls and women it is not only a male dominated field and only men can succeed even women can succeed even their daughters can succeed like right now all the young girls who are listening are the future parents they are being mentored but what about the gap that we face today by not having enough young girls or women coming into the sector so we also need to bridge this gap by mentoring their parents by mentoring their families so if we can have an initiative at the college level right from the first year to the fourth year of engineering wherein we have certain interaction with the parents mentor them and give them the freedom that their daughters can excel in the field of stem in the field of technology i think that would break the barriers okay can can i add to the same point zoha by your permission yes please yes okay i i i love to add to dr uh, rashi's point here i think she has uh, rightly pinpointed the uh, main root cause basically from where this entire thing is coming yes parents are our first mentors no doubt about it and i'll tell you there is going to be a age gap even when we will become parents definitely our kids are going to have a generation gap and there will be a ideology gap so we have to understand this gap is going to be but there are certain ways how we can bridge this gap point number 1 first is awareness which we need to create at a parental level secondly whenever you are entering as as a fresher into a, any corporate company definitely you need to have your senses up that right now you are no more a college a uh, student right you are entering into a very very crucial thing and i think that one single start plays a huge role in your life to be very honest because that's how i turned out my life if i could have taken something else and i was just thinking okay i have to work for the sake of working probably i will never touch upon on entrepreneurship i could have lost that opportunity of finding what are my real strengths right so i feel yes parental awareness is, is the first thing which we need to take care of here secondly when you are entering into your first stage of career i think again you need a mentorship there or awareness that what you should choose how to read your own strengths what are your area of interest because i found after interacting to people most of them are doing a job for the sake of just earning 
they are not at all happy they are not at all enjoying what they are doing trust me and there are very few uh, ladies or i should say women that who are secretly taking up this kind of initiatives to come out st stand out and then just they voice out that this is what i wanted to do and they fight for their reasons but the number is unfortunately very very less and as the number is less so you can scout these ladies in in wherever the uh, you know international national summits are happening you can found that they are able to create their own value so i think we have a huge gap here in terms of generation as rightly said by dr rashi and point number 2 i also feel that we have some the back of our mind this gender biasing system and which is like to extreme level okay so now a lot of people especially when uh, because when i was working into corporate people used to look at me when i was heading certain department okay being a girl she is going to do that mindset was there though they couldn't directly tell me up front because i was performing well and my performance was speaking in terms of my action rather than words so i always felt when your actions are powerful you are able to bring on table the performance the right set of performance people are bound to bend and i think that's the right way rather than you go mm. and just fight with somebody on a voice out note <laughs> i don't find that that is really making any sense right mm -hmm. and third thing is uh, i think as women we have to understand communication and collaboration is something which we are failing big time because today we feel uh, it's all about just running a business let me tell you it's not about running a business business never runs by a term called i i'm sorry if you are getting up into this mindset but a uh, lot of college as uh, we are addressing to a lot of college students here so i want mm -hmm. to tell them one thing if you really want to make something big uh, men or women doesn't matter all it matters is right now what are your thoughts mm -hmm. how powerful you are in terms of traveling that journey with a word called v because if v is missing in your life trust me you might travel certain steps but you will never go far and you will never create that big empire which you wanted to so if you really wanted to create something big please focus on we and when i talk about we i talk about powerful teams i i never mean that you alone today i'm sure all the leading ladies who are running up their business they have a strong team to support without team there is nothing right and we cannot just create teams or leaders for the sake of numbers please understand that's again a very very powerful role and uh, i think uh, uh, uh pusha ma'am has just mentioned that how a right kind of mentoring can play a vital role there so yes. i feel you need to mentor your team in such a manner that you create future leaders in real sense not for the title or the tag sake so mm. that, that, that's all from my side thank you thank you so much ms sonesh and that that actually really interesting because we are making this panel run right now also it's always the word we Yes, Doctor Rashi, you was one. I'd like to add one sentence to what Sunesh ji said. Uh, see, uh, entrepreneurship, yes, but it's not an everybody's ball game. Absolutely, it's 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 a difficult journey. So, can we as leaders create intrapreneurs, entrepreneurs, oh. and intrapreneurs? So, you know, both are equally important. They should be equally respected, and they should be equally valued. if you do not have intrapreneurs in a company in an organization i don't think success is something that you can keep commanding every year on year so mm. i feel that we need to even focus on intrapreneurs and entrepreneurs both so when you have a uh, entrepreneurship courses in the colleges you can also have intrapreneurship colleges uh, courses in the colleges which will also give certain amount of freedom to a uh, women men all all the students who are in the uh, college to choose what makes them feel comfortable what makes them feel to come out of their uh, you know and spread their wings make them feel happy because if you're happy everything works well but if you're not happy you'll never be satisfied you'll never be able to perform so these couple of things if you know the colleges can start taking up very seriously and effectively implementing this i think industry will have a better pool of talent a richer pool of talent which can give all of us a success much faster and we can make india atmanirbhar really really fast very true, true. very true dr rashi yes thank you so much and we are actually discussing a lot about entrepreneurship and mentoring also in this but uh, many of our 
students and also who are, we actually have a few entrepreneurs in this college also but we also have many people who are aiming for jobs in this uh, in, among our audience so people a lot of times expect what kind of jobs and what they should be expecting uh, about biases or if there are any biases actually so i would like to ask ms nabomita this if she can elaborate on that like if she has if she knows stories about biases in the industry biases in hiring okay um so we are we are at a amazing time right we are at the right point of time talking about biases especially you mentioned hiring so let me just focus on that part rather than moving on uh since last year right once the lockdown mm. started uh, the entire world changed right and suddenly everybody was working from home so uh, geographies remained um, in uh, i mean invariable because it doesn't matter whether you are sitting right next to your boss or you're sitting 100 miles away from your boss you're working on your laptop gender was almost neutralized why because at the end of the day if the other person on the other side of the laptop is a man or a woman it did not matter the revenue the output the result you created matter this entire disruption this entire paradigm shift created a huge opportunity for women because if you remember um, in 2016 the maternity amendment to act was uh, uh, was uh, i mean uh, it, it was amended maternity act was amended and uh, it was from 3 months it was it was uh, increased to 6 months and then there was another provision in the act which was mentioned that work from home should be allowed and you know what was the repercussion of that uh, act there were several articles written in prime time media that how women will no longer be, be hired because of this act and who will who will want women to work from home work from home is, is an idea that doesn't work and uh, yes it's absolutely absolutely um, impractical right to go that way so uh, who was running our company since last year march robots no <laughs> human beings right so this is the right point of the time for women to step up because uh, as as i mean as let me say let let me call women as talent for the for time being as talent we are lot more focused right we don't uh, we don't need too many too much of a uh, uh, smoking break discussion right we our networking happens extremely differently right our focus is mm-hmm. essentially on building the family building the future of our family right uh, even if we we may not be married we are still caregivers to our parents we have yes. still to take care we are the ones who are going to take care of our younger siblings so uh, that way our entire work culture is extremely different which is why cooped up in a uh, in a cubicle for for 9 to 5 in a 9 to 5 format did not really work too well with women until and unless they made compromises with their work life balance and their family life last year march changed this entire thing for women this is the type point of time wherein networking completely has gone out of the window the way we work in a office cubicle has completely gone out of the window you don't need to have a face time with your boss all the time you can just be productive you can just be focused you can just be the exact version of the talent that women were supposed to be women were not designed as as a talent as as men are we were we are de- designed lot differently we have a lot higher empathy level so this is the time and again uh, coming to the point of empathy why i'm mentioning this is uh yes if you're listening to me and you're applying for the job these are the areas which which you should highlight uh, which you should keep in your mind in the, during the interview and highlight when you are sharing what your strengths are uh, there have been several studies by um, harvard business uh, harvard business college and even in india by uh, i am amdabad on the uh, on the emphasis of empathy during communic uh, in the communication during this lockdown right you know who were the ones who were ranking really high in this kind of an empathy study women women knows what not to say in a zoom call right what <laughs> word not to use we are extremely careful we are extremely mindful we are empathetic so this is the point of the time wherein women i mean talent women as a talent have their entire field day out so if you are preparing for the job these are the your these are your uh, upgrades that you can bring into the office so please uh, make sure that you mention them and you are you're strong enough to handle those questions 
So yes, this is what I would want to suggest, and the diversity and the biases that have that we have always faced. I believe with the virtual first uh, culture that is coming up, right? Wherein uh, it is uh, is right now. It is called three two two, wherein. Three days you work in office, two days you work from home, and two days your uh, obviously weekend. That entire mm-hmm. culture is again designed for women. Mm-hmm. So, are you ready to are you ready to rock that culture? Are you ready to lead that culture? So, my question would would remain the other way around. How far are we going to make sure that we make the most of this this new culture? That mm-hmm. very sad to say, but pandemic had actually given us something really good. to restore thank you it's just a dark irony over here <laughs> i like to add yeah zuna i would like to add something uh, is it okay uh, miss kavita miss kavita wanted to uh, she just pointed out that she wanted okay. to add something yes so sure please. i would really resonate with nabita and also one factor as she said that you know women should highlight their strengths and work on it and then and catch the opportunity the so one thing which uh, pandemic has also highlighted is that women are multitaskers and it has been <laughs> highlighted yes. oh, yeah. very very well because uh, you, as she said that uh, empathy in empathy ranking women were the highest multitasking women were the highest and then also manage their family so what as a young uh, girls who are like aspiring to be entrepreneurship or for a job uh, what i would say is be very confident in your interviews and don't talk about technology or your college degrees because if there are thousands of you all the thousands would have studied that but what difference do you bring to the table is what any uh, interviewer looks for so bring to the table that you know i am confident i i have the empathy i am a multitasker i'm no lesser than a, there is nothing like uh, as she rightly said let us break the shackles of gender biasness or discrimination because uh, even men are facing discrimination there are uh, issues where men also yeah. face discrimination but we don't hear it so much because as dr ashi had mentioned their demand and supply game so yes once we get into a high supply then it will all become men discrimination then again a whole different pandemic shift will uh, another corona needs to come to prove you know that men are also <laughs> equally which so what as a aspiration what you all should have is start looking at your strengths because which has been given to every woman and i think we need to work on True. it and as dr rashi had mentioned uh, create that environment get awareness because like as you mentioned you are this is one of the engineering college now it doesn't mean that if you are an engineer you need to go and work in it that as dr sunesh highlighted that she changed it she broke the shackle of you know i am in co- electronics and communication and i don't need to go and work in front of a computer i can go and do a direct marketing which is a very hard toil job and basically specified with men because you need to go out in the market so what i would uh, suggest is go for your passion what you like don't go for what your parents want or what your husband want or what your brother want you check yourself do a you know self realization that Yes, I am good in DJ. Like Zuha, you are very good in articulation. You can go and become an RJ. But what will yeah. happen? How many people will give you that advice? I don't think anybody. They'll say you are working in engineering college. You sh- you should be a scholar. And yes, if you are, go and apply in uh, Kaggle, as Usha mentioned, because very few women are doing that. But don't curb your passion. Live your passion, and I think that would what make us successful. Like you know, many of the times we don't go uh, women as such. we are so sacrificing in nature and we are by nature and then thinking about others that we don't think about ourselves so as myself a mother a woman but first i am a woman a individual i would not even say uh, men or women i'll say uh, as an individual i should look at my interests and what interests me i should work then yeah. as dr rashi said if you are happy everything al- around you will be happy thank you so much I kavita and all Yeah, I want to uh, add something with Miss Kavita. Yes, Miss. Yes, Miss Atiya. Please. Yeah. So the thing is actually what we are looking at in the view board. So when uh, the pressure are coming, uh, they are super confused. That they don't know what they want to do in their life. So yeah. sometimes they they they, they express. Madam, you can suggest me. 
the thing is that that's really interesting thing for us they uh, are coming for a position but they uh, ask me suggest me uh, suggest something for her so uh, actually that is not the right approach because when you doing your study in that time within that four year or five years you should find what is your interest actually what you love to do where you want to see you <coughs> to feel that things actually and uh, i believe uh, the students uh, in the uh, when we are doing the study in that time we have uh, learning so many things the speak one because you are not able to uh, master in everything you need to be a master on only one thing so you should be on that uh, and the, you, if you uh, see our life cycle uh, when we are working in the mid level and after that uh, we lose the women because they are not uh, going to be uh, promoted as a higher uh, higher thing so why is happening so because i believe one thing uh, we are not much focused we are focused on so many things so we need to focus on one thing and then we will actually capable to prove ourselves in the right place so the uh, my advice for the all students please uh, when you were doing your study pick one thing and make yourself expert on that thing and when you come to us in that sense don't ask us please suggest something you just tell i want to do this if you have this job give me otherwise i don't have time to waste my time in your company so this is the way i, I think uh, the students should be react because uh, in my company sometimes girls come and i suggest okay uh, i observe sometimes them when they are taking uh, internship in my company they put us uh, i think you will be doing uh, this thing i think you will be better in this you will be better on that then they take my decision actually they are not taking their own decision so this is very important to taking the own decision and we may not uh, my observation actually is my personal opinion also we may we are not able to capable to take their own decision so i think uh, the the we need to work on that also from our student side uh yes mr nish mm -hmm. yes dr ashi you want to go first yes please sonish <laughs> uh, thanks uh, i want to add in one pro tip taking uh, the conversation ahead from what kavita ji and archya ji said the pro tip is that now during the pandemic what namobita ji said that we have time for being ourselves the true versions of us right so at this point of time all you girls can you just develop one skill for yourself other than what is being taught in the college in your curriculum uh, see uh, youtube is available websites are available courses are available and mind you i am talking of zero expense free courses you do not have to spend anything extra but you have to develop one habit of learning a new skill outside your curriculum and if you can do that you will be immensely successful in all your job interviews that you give because what you are learning additionally as a skill will always help you in your career because that is something you do out of your happiness you do out of your love uh, for that particular skill maybe it could be a hobby so if you can generate this kind of skill additional to your curriculum you will create a much better version of you over mm -hmm. to you sonish thank you thank you all right so just to add on uh, because uh, what uh, right now uh, mila ma'am has just mentioned and dr rashi has just pointed out very rightly that especially when we are uh, engineering students uh, i am uh, hoping all of you will be able to resonate it well because i myself was an engineer and i took a u turn and then i do not know z turn and every turn has gone into right so uh, i still remember uh, way back in 2007 recession was at the peak i do not know how many of you remember that period okay and people were just talking about sunesh there are no jobs and can you believe that i being from delhi and a lot of people have this uh, mental phobia there that uh, girls are not meant to work and i was like okay what to do right now i have to create something because i wanted to do something uh, different right and when we get into that mindset let me tell you as as just now dr rashi has mentioned just work on key skill set during my college time uh, it was so unfortunate we never used to get a soft skill training 
There was no concept of soft skill, interview preparation, nothing. It was all hit and trial. And I'm sure most of the leaders here you see here, they are actually uh, made out of, come out of that whole hit and trial method, right? We experiment a lot. We have figured out a way and that's how we have come out on the journey, right? There was nothing called a fixed defined path for us. And I personally believe when you actually design your own path, that's where you learn. Because if you're just going to follow, okay, what uh, probably something has worked out for me, something has worked out for Dr. Rashi, need not to work out for you. I want to make it very clear because every one individual journey is different. So, and that, that is amazing because being an engineering graduate, I'll tell you, you do a lot of copy paste format, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I interview candidates from MBA colleges and I sometimes get shocked also. In the resume, they, they sometimes forget to just edit certain things. And I will be, are you, he or she, please under, make me understand. They were like, I'm sorry, ma'am, during the editing part, I think we missed it. Can you understand? This is the presence of mind, right? So, and, and sometimes we ask a question, okay, why you want to join our company? Now, just to answer that question, especially when you are an engineering graduate or an MBA graduate, let me tell you, as a recruiters, we don't look out for a normal answer from you. We always look out that, what you can bring in terms of productivity or something which is unique on our table as a company. Now, I think that is what something, uh, you know, Neela Ma'am was trying to just highlight here. That mm. don't come and ask us what we can give you an opportunity. That we will figure out later on. First, you showcase what you can bring something unique on our table. Like if we give you a chance. And from there, once you enter into a company, definitely there are n number of ways which even you will explore your uh, business owner will be able to identify your key strength and which we do like on spot strength weaknesses opportunities and threats and that's how the journey is on right so always as a as a engineering student as a graduate student and this is for all the students i want to tell you especially if you are going to take your first journey first job please do a strength a weakness opportunity and threat analysis for yourself because this is crucial right now. And I, I think uh, Navonita Ma'am has just mentioned a very good point again here that uh, this COVID, fortunately and unfortunately, has proven it that we all can work from home. Mm. And honestly, let me tell you, I was fighting with my bosses in my full-time job, like, why don't you give us work from home? And they were like, no, people don't work at home. <laughs> so I think this, this entire uh, one year of cycle, I think it has proven the right point that we all can work from home, provided that we should have the right ethics, we should have yes. a disciplinary way, and we understand that work is something you have to do it into a work format. Please don't take it for uh, granted. Don't take it casually. Work, you do it when you are into work time. Yes. Have your family time. That is also equally important because that's how you will create a work-life balance. It should not become an equation that you are only so workaholic or you are so family oriented that your calls are not getting answered or at the time of family, your family is just, you know, uh, cursing you that what kind yeah. of husband or wife you are who is not taking care of anything, right? Even as a single, you have parents, you have siblings to take care. So you are equally responsible for each and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's how you beautifully enjoy your life. And as I always mention, as we women, we always have a power inside us. All we need to understand is how we are going to utilize our power in the right manner and i think we are uh, blessed to uh, be a multitaskers right there is no second opinion to it we all are multitaskers so by god chris yes we have immense power we have immense talent all we need to understand how to channelize the path how to give a right direction and how to become super powerful in that without stepping on somebody else that is very, very yeah. important yeah very well said permission <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nish. And uh, one of the things that again, again, that was highlighted in this entire conversation was how important communication is. How important, as especially as women, you need to continuously put yourself out there and remind everyone, like, hey, I am here. So I would actually like to ask Ms. Usha Rengaraju, she's with us over here, and uh, how much language and communication is important in this entire field. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell some personal stories here and uh, bear with me uh, to just uh, see, uh, you know, tell you how, why it's very, very important, uh, you know, emotional intelligence is very, very important. And uh, first off, uh, I'm an autistic person. 
So when I say uh, autism, people don't actually understand. Uh, let me give a more clarification. I am an autistic person on the high end of the spectrum, and uh, I think there will be some mental limits here to be right now. So the other people on the spectrum are uh, Abraham Lincoln, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and uh, most famous footballer Lionel Messi. All of them are autistic people on the spectrum. What are the higher end? Uh, so the moment I say I'm an autistic person, people immediately say, "Oh, you look so normal. You're not autistic." So because the they said, "Okay, I am," uh, I mean, it doesn't mean autistic people are abnormal. Autism is not a disability. It's just that autistic people are neurologically different people. So it is a spectrum. On the lower end of the spectrum, you will find people who are totally independent, are dependent on others. On the higher end, you know, people are completely independent. It's just neurologically different. And so language and communication is very, very important for it. So I am working as a consultant right now. I mean, the reason why I am bringing this uh, at this forum is there are a lot of powerful women here, a lot of powerful executives here. So you know you might uh, you know start uh, taking it back to your office and incorporating few things. That's why I'm putting it in this forum. So a few years back, I was working in the corporate for a very short time. It was one of the most powerful banking technological company and all that. Uh, but uh, you know I quit that company. The reason was because of communication. So you know I was busy. I was uh, there was a manager whom I had, and uh, you know there was lot of bullying, there was lot of uh, emotionally unintelligent conversation, and all of it. I was not able to tolerate it over a period of time. I just quit the job. Uh, but on the last day of the job, for some reason, I had to travel to Bangalore. I had to travel to Chennai, and I was talking to all of them for a week. And towards the last day, I just went out with this manager person who was so horrible to me towards the entire duration, who made me quit. And the final day, I realized he was not actually that kind of a bad person. He, just that he doesn't know how to communicate. The aggressiveness, you know. So emotional intelligence is very, very important, and communication is very important. And you know, you may not be actually a bad person, but if you don't know how to channel your emotions, and you know, you might have some emotionally bad day at home. You cannot bring that to the office. So you need. Uh, uh, a lot of us as humans, you know, some of some of them it comes very naturally to them. You know, they're trained from their childhood and it comes naturally. But some of them, you know, they might not have that kind of an environment at childhood, so it doesn't come naturally to them. So it's very very important for companies to ensure you have these kind of training. These are more important. So you can be more productive. So after ten, the reason uh, okay, I'm not currently not in a corporate life, but I'm just putting it out there. So out when I was in that short stint in corporate life, and uh, for a work which takes three months, I was able to do it in two days. And uh, so why does that work which can actually be done in two days take that three months of time? It's because of a lot of fightings, a lot of meetings, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of times you know we don't want to accept the other person. Right? There's a lot dealing with psychology and emotion. So you know, if you can give all your employees a good amount of psychology training, how to handle yourself, then you start understand your own psychology and mastering your own psychology. You can understand others better, and you can treat others better. So these are very important education, and uh, with corporate can invest some amount of time and money into it. You know, you can actually be more productive and you can be more profitable as well. Because people think this is not why should I invest in psychology training and neuroscience training. So and a lot of people ask me, why are you so productive? How can you get some ten x times what you're doing and all? The secret is master your own psychology. Put in a lot of effort, understand yourself. When you start understanding that, you know, the time it takes ten x, I mean, ten times more, you can, you know, bring it down. So these are very important learnings for me. So communication is very important, and uh, for autistic person, it's even more important because we are neurologically different people. So we cannot understand social cues, and we cannot understand indirect uh, communication. So there's one company, SAP, uh, which is very good. SAP is very very good for autistic people. They have a lot of autism uh, hiring initiatives and all that. One biggest thing which they did was 
not only they do autistic hiring they train the non autistic people in the entire company they told them what is autism how to treat autistic people why they are neurologically different they cannot understand indirect communication how to communicate with them they cannot understand subtle cues a lot of things human beings don't tell directly they tell it through cues and things and expect the other people to understand but autistic people cannot understand the social cues in the first place you have to tell everything very directly so there's a lot of the communication between autistic and non autistic people and the term non autistic community itself does not to do with communication so we are all talking women in technology we are here because we are discussing gender diversity i am particularly bringing this there's something called neurodiversity as i have a neurodiver autism comes under neurodiversity so uh, uh, last year this was 19th and also 19th year first year for neurodiversity in india happened and uh, this year and the day before yesterday i am mean, uh, in 2019 i also went to ai which was for india first uh, conference in the interface of neuroscience and data science and 2020 i i just took a note i should do more to autism awareness so every forum i uh, get to speak i thought you know i talk about autism but just for two minutes uh, so that you know there are a lot of powerful women leaders here and just telling out my experience there could be a lot of people who are not in a position to speak out because autism is considered a taboo and there's a lot of bullying so the moment i said i am asking very open about being the autistic last one of years so initially when i started telling i am an autistic people there a lot of people who used to unfollow me on twitter right now i put it straight in my twitter linkedin profile you know i think kavita ma'am had sent me a record you know phone uh, you know my life mission is autism my twitter profile i just directly put i am an autistic person but when i started out two and a half years back there was a lot of bullying there's a lot of you know very hostile uh, treatment when i experienced over the period of time people started accepting me so there could be a lot of women in my position who are out like me who are not able to talk about uh, you know what they're going through and all these things uh, so i'm just putting out an open platform like this so you know there could be a lot of people like that go support them and if you are in a powerful position in your company you can talk about you know diversity at one of your company initiatives and uh, so communication is very very important between autistic people and non autism and between non autistic people among themselves as well uh, please invest a lot of time and money into it as well for training and all that uh, and then i thank all the women leaders out here uh, for sharing her platform together and also the management of stanley and to have so wonderfully organized in you thank you thank you so much miss usha um one of we are actually coming to the end of this panel and one of the greatest things that i've noticed in this entire panel it's not i won't say greatest but other again again ironic thing that i noticed in this panel is that we spoke about how women are great empathetic the most multitasking people and also the most um just confident people over, out there but one of the things that in this panel i noticed was even women also have the best dark humor <laughs> that it's just uh, again with the way miss kavita and again mr bomit also was pointing out about the pandemic and how it's also creating opportunities it's very crazy how we are so used to these things that we actually try to bring this all together and make everything making its sense it is i think optimism that also inherent in women um so with this we'll be coming to the end of this panel thank you so much to all the esteemed panelists for joining with us um i would actually like if you all could go around and just in a few sentences just maybe give this panel a nice conclusion this is the final panel of the change maker summit by the way so i would start with um, mr sabomita please oh thank you so much i'm the first <laughs> to start the conclusion that's a dark yes. humor on its own thank you guha you do it now <laughs> okay uh I, I, i'm elated and honored being a part of this panel right listening to the leaders was was absolutely absolutely a privilege right i stand to learn from from everyone over here kavita ji sone ji achila um, absolutely dr rashi amazing dr rashi and congratulations for all those uh, trophies behind you because you could see them so uh, coming back to what what i feel from this uh, from this panel yes uh, my takeaways are obviously uh, we remain positive we remain optimistic we remain 
uh, we, we keep we, we remain prepared, right? Uh, as Dr. Rashi suggested, that prepare your pre uh, prepare yourself with the new skill which is available around you. And Sonesh ji, you absolutely pointed it out. Uh, disruptions like this will keep happening. Be it 9/11, be it uh, Lehman Brothers crash, be it uh, demonetization, any kind of dis disruption will happen. And companies will always choose to hire or not to hire people. But then every disruption will actually prepare us something the way we have never imagined it. And Dr. Kavita, yes, we, we, we do not need another disruption to come and tell us that we could be, we women leaders could be better at many more things. So these are exactly, I mean, uh, you, I, I'm sure you students learned a lot. Even I learned you, a lot yes. from what they have been talking about. Yes, absolutely. We no longer need any more disruption. We are we are on our front foot and we are ready to take on the world. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhomita. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Sonesh, please, if you can. Yes, please. Uh, definitely. Uh, first of all, uh, wonderful. Uh, I'm so thankful to this entire panel. No doubt, uh, we as leaders, first of all, I think, our learning antenna should be on any time wherever we had an opportunity. And I think today sharing this platform with all the eminent speakers, all the eminent, I think, with, I, I should say, a leading women of the uh, Indian economy, right? Not only at the national level, at the international level. So I'm so glad to be a part of this panel. And yes, um, wonderful time to you, Zoha, for hosting us here on this beautiful platform and making My sure honor. everything everything goes well and which you are fantastic in doing and managing and last but not the least yes Stanley College for this owner right you guys have really uh, probably felt that we can add value and I'm sure we all as a leader have have done something good to add to this uh, piece of learning and uh, make sure that whatever we can just add value to you as young students feel free to reach out to us. I'm sure none of us, we are going to say no to you guys. Any point of time, if we can add any positive value to you. Now, coming down to one line statement, which I just want to tell to all the uh, students of the college. Don't think what is going to happen in your future. All you need to understand is prepare yourself for the present moment better way. All, this is what you have to learn, I think, from the present situation also. COVID has never given us any invitation before coming, right? But <laughs> somewhere down the line, we all become yeah. mentally ready. And now you can see the, the kind of changes, right? We all are doing fantastically at, at an international level, national level, at a state level. I think all the levels are open for you guys. And I think today we, we have a bigger reach. Today, just by sitting at Bangalore, I'm able to interact with such a wonderful personalities across the, uh, you know, country or, or I can say that, you know, wonderful audience out here, right? So all thanks to technology, no doubt about it. And again, it's it's how you want to use your opportunity, guys. Time might be good or bad, doesn't matter, it's life. You have to take it in a practical manner, right? And you have to face your own ups and downs. Once you, you just go through that journey, you will enjoy that whole thoroughly with a, with a whole piece of satisfaction, provided that mentally you should be ready in your present. Don't think what has happened in the past. Don't worry too much about future. Think about present. Make it so strong that tomorrow you can create your future in a better manner. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, next up, Ms. Achia, if you can just please wrap this up too for us. Uh, and yeah, thank you. This is the past uh, this is the time to uh, say, say uh, goodbye to everyone. It's a great, great honor for me to join this panel and thank you so much, Joha, for inviting me and obviously in you call it and uh, I wish you all the success in your life and uh, for the, all the students, so I have one, uh, it's not an advanced suggestion, so please uh, in your life to uh, maintain three things, I always believe on that, that is uh, focus, target, and action, and you will be succeed. So please, uh, just always uh, focus on one th uh, target on one thing, and focus on that. And after that, take uh, for achieving uh, that thing, for do some uh, take some action. So this is the main thing for student, I believe. And thank you everyone. And uh, I actually, I in my um, since I was uh, I was. Uh, Inform that I want to learn from everyone. I, I learned so many things from all of the strong women. Thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you, everyone.
ठीक है अच्छे से मिस कविता या सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई लाइक टू थैंक लुहा फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस यू डिड अ स्प्लेंडेड जॉब लुहा सो कूडोस टू यू एंड नेक्स्ट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक द पैनल because i really had a very enriching session and lastly what i would like to tell the audience all the young women who are aspiring to become the future is that you know hard two things which i feel uh, can never fail you is hard work and perseverance because if you do a hard work and as doctor i mean as somesh said that you know you don't have to worry about future so if you do hard work and have the perseverance to fight all the odds you will never be uh, you will never be you know taken back you will always be successful and the last line i would like to say which you can really take it as is that you know women when they are given opportunity we should fight for it because what is it is a woman is like a tea bag you never know how strong she is until she gets into hot water so have that belief in yourself that you can do everything nothing is impossible and then aspire for the stars that's all thank you thank you ms kavita and dr rashi please well thank you so much stanley college uh, suha beautifully uh, you know you took up the entire show today i simply loved it and i am in love with each and every panelist out here and i resonate and echo each and every uh, uh, you know idea and uh, the comment they have made and it's fantastic now uh, something to close up the summit the name itself is the change maker summit so today it is important at the end and the last session you i all of us together we as a community together bring about the change and what's the change the change is that women are important we have to believe in ourselves disability is only an act of mind we paralyze ourselves so we have to get out of that paralysis we have to believe that we have the inner strength to each and everything that we dream of so now it's a time to bring about the change and i'm sure that with stanley college with our beautiful zuha and the lovely and the most intelligent audience that is listening to each one of us for the last 3 days has a lot of takeaways and are highly motivated to bring about this change so we all would look forward to change and welcome you with open arms very soon in the industry thank you so much thank you so much dr rashi and finally we have ms usha rengaraju can you please share your opinions on this panel finally yeah yeah so the couple of things for the uh, young guardian who ma'am who watching this event a uh, couple of things to tell like one is a borrow like yeah Uh, there's a community called Women Technicals Community where I'm also one of the ambassadors there. So one of the uh, programs there is I am the Women Initiator. So the motto of the uh, initiative is when it's based on facts, it's not bragging. So it's very important when you do a lot of things. You know, women I have witnessed particularly doing a lot of my workshops and sessions. They do like that uh, because you know people might uh, make fun of them because you know they when they talk about their achievement, they might call that they're bragging. Right now, or the job market is very uh, complicated. It's back, you know, for the policy sectors, uh, for data science, for the two positions, or three positions, you have 500 million per person coming up. Uh, so, what stands out is how much of the social influence you have. So, it's very important you need a very strong social presence and to speak about your achievements openly in social media and create a strong social profile. And uh, the second thing that will uh, really help in your life is that you need to handle the action. So I have over the things to thank you. Uh, so ability to handle the action is some skill which you need to learn and master. If you can get it early on in your career, this is something a great gift. Because a lot of times when you face the action, I find a lot of women give up. Uh, so you know, you like to understand. Everyone goes through that phase, and everyone you know goes through the same feeling. A lot of people, but can you, uh, you know, handle that and keep working hard and progress further? So, if you can handle this section, one of the key skills which you need to uh, uh, 
masters and the good these two points i'm wishing you all the very best in your beautiful life and uh, can you call it do have wonderful uh, presentation work and all the excellent panelists who work my uh, who who might it is with uh, thank you all once again and it's a great listening to lot of you i know it's not from uh, youtube too hope uh, you know <laughs> Uh, meeting you all, and I'm waiting to meet you all in a different platform and a different place. And until then, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That would definitely be a wonderful day when we all can meet actually physically and personally. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in this panel for Women in Technology with the Tain Makers Summit 2021. It was lovely hosting all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Uh, bye bye and now i'll direct myself to the audience we are already joined with our next keynote address ms sita kakati sha so i would really request you to please switch um switch your mic on and also share your webcam with us please yes i can hear you ms sita please Hi, I'm here. Can you see me? Okay, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Exactly. Perfect. Oh, that's a lovely Christmas tree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to finally meet you, like virtually. Yeah, <laughs> finally. So. Thank you so much and welcome to the Change Maker Summit 2021. You are, this is how we are closing this entire summit. It is with you as I and your keynote address. So thank you so much for doing this with us. So uh, let me first introduce us to you. We are uh, about those big dreams, a student initiative at Stanley College of Engineering and Technology for Women. So Stanley is an established in the year 2008. It's a temple of learning at the heart of the city of Perth. and provides easy access to quality technical education to girl students stanley is affiliated to the prestigious usmania university of hyderabad it provides all eligible engineering courses which are accredited by both nba and nac with a grade a stanley is also an iso certified institution stanley ranks at 105th among the best engineering institutes of india and second best women engineering college in all of south india stanley has a strong belief to empower women and impact the world it aims to empower girl students through professional education integrated with values and character to make an impact in this world and we about those big dreams is a student body at stanley college that and we were formed last year in april 2020 midst of the early days of this pandemic to shine the light of learning in the all the hearts of the young in this dark times ATPD provides the chance in these times for all the our audience to just learn more about the working world from people who are willing to share their stories like yourself Ms Rita and audience meet Ms Rita Kakati Shah uh, she is an award winning gender diversity inclusion and career strategist author speaker mentor and advisor to fortune 500 companies She is the founder and CEO of Uma, an international platform that empowers confidence, inspires success, and builds leadership in women and minorities. Rita began her professional career at Goldman Sachs in London, where she was awarded the prestigious Excellence in Citizenship and Diversity Award. She is also a distinguished alumna of King's College London Triple TV Awards for Women in Business Opener. judge for the middle east awards and also recipient of the international icon award from uttar pradesh world records in india rita actively coaches and mentors business leaders veterans survivors of domestic violence women in technology stem school girls and students she also serves in advice as an advisor ambassador and diversity and inclusion expert to multiple boards and global organizations around the world Ms Rita has been featured as an expert on multiple international television and news shows interviewed and quoted in various podcasts and publications such as the Wall Street Journal Fast Company Thrive Global Dell Technology CBS News Fox News Yahoo Finance and iHeartRadio 
She's a best-selling author of books on women in business, diversity and inclusion, and also hosts the popular South Asian television show, The Uma Show, on Mana TV International. Thank you so much for joining with us, Ms. Sita. It's such an honor for us to host you. And again, you're the conclusion of this entire Changemaker Summit. So thank you for joining with us. Suha, thank you so much for having me and Stanley College. It's really an honor and privilege to be here and do your closing keynote as well. So thank you so much for the honor for doing this. Um, and yeah, I guess um, I'm going to share a little bit about my story. Um, this is a change making summit. So I think this is the prime example of doing it. So um, I was born and born up in London and um, my family originally are from Assam. So my heritage has always been something that has stuck with me um, all of my, my life and my upbringing, really. Um, so uh, born and bred in the UK in London. Um, I studied at King's College London and I actually um, studied mathematics and management um, and then later on went to do my master's in finance there as well. So um, that really is what started my interest in the world of finance, which is where I started my career, actually. Um, there was a chance encounter while I was at King's College London at a career fair. Um, you know, I was young, bright eyed, bushy tailed, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do in the future. I just knew that I was enjoying my studies. I enjoyed being a student very much. And I went along with a friend of mine. She was in the year above to a careers fair. And I didn't actually even go inside. I didn't know who I would talk to, what I would do. So I just waited outside for her. This waiting period lasted about 40 minutes. And while I was waiting, this lady, she was leaving the careers fair. She happened to see me and we just started up a conversation about life, about what we like to do, um, about sort of my drive for just wanting to learn about the whole world. Um, and that was really it. Um, fast forward 40 minutes, my friend came back and this lady, she was about to leave. She gave me her business card. She happened to be the global head of HR at Goldman Sachs. And that is how my story with Goldman first started. Um, she and we ended that meeting and she invited me to come and visit their offices, which was actually just down the road from King's College. So um, I went along there and I didn't know which division I would be part of or really what area in finance. You know, this was my first year at university and I was there to learn. So I had 32 interviews um, in total. Um, because I didn't know and the firm didn't know where to place me. I was interviewing all around the firm. And um, eventually um, I went to the equities division and I started my career as a pan-European sales trader. Um, so I had to be in very early in the morning, 5.30 a.m. Each morning was when I had to start my day. And um, my first duty as a summer intern, a summer analyst, was to get coffee for everybody. That was my first thing. And my first challenge started then, you know, um, at Fleet Street, our doors to enter at the time, the River Court, the, um, the Peterborough Court building was these revolving doors. And I had to successfully figure out how to bring all of these coffees and go through the revolving doors at the same time. And yes, they did get spilt and not just on one occasion, but that's how you learn. So I learned that way. That was one of my first tasks. But um, point being, it was a very, very team friendly environment. Um, it was my first experience and I was there to learn. I didn't set any standards for myself, any expectations for myself. I didn't have that pressure to perform. So I was there and just to kind of see what was going on. And I think that's what led ultimately to me just sort of finding my foothold and really just getting along with, with my team. Um, I spent the next decade at Goldman and I moved around into different areas. So I started off in the pan-European sales trading area. Um, I spent some time in equity capital markets. Um, then I moved over to fixed income and spent time in different areas there as well. I've been on the product teams as well. So I've done very, um, various um, different roles while at the firm. And, you know, Goldman was like a family to me. That, that was my first and only job out of university and all that I knew. Um, and during my time at the firm, I got naturally very involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives. So um, when I started, um, I was one of very few women on the equities trading floor. And I knew as a summer analyst that, you know, there were so many other women around, but they were in different divisions. And I wanted to just get to meet them. 
so that's fun really into the extension of me thinking okay let's sort of really do something about a women's network a women's network did exist but at the time it had the reputation of women just meeting in the canteen for coffee um, and that was it and I thought you know great if that's what was going on but I thought I, I would love to make this more of a professional networking experience you know um, I wanted to know what peers other women were doing in other divisions around the firm it was a huge huge company and I wanted to know and similarly I would love to have other women come and spend time with me so that's really what led to um, me helping really sort of build out uh, a formal women's network um, and then similar to that we started an Asian professionals network too um, Again, you know, there was a lot of diversity in the firm. Um, it was a fantastic place to be. But when I turned around and looked at the technology team, for example, it was very Indian heavy. And when I turned around and I looked at the Latin American desk, it was very heavy from um, people from the background of Latin America. And similarly, when I saw the Japan desk or the China desk, it was very similar. So I thought, OK, well, you know, what about if I wanted to spend time on the Latin American desk? Or I wanted one of the um, technology folks to spend time learning about, you know, the sales training side more than what. So that's really what spurned into setting up the um, and formalizing an Asian professionals network. Similar kind of thing, but how do we network there? So that was my time there. Absolutely loved it. Um, and then fast forward 10 years and a family friend approached me one day um, who happened to be um, the... Um, chair at the Institute of Psychiatry, actually, at King's College London at the time, and said, hey, Rita, I'm in the clinical trials industry, and you have a business background. I would love your help in setting something up in the US in a place called Delaware. So um, that was really my first exposure into something completely different, into the startup world, into building something from scratch, something that didn't prior exist. So, um, and I was involved in business development. It was a brand new area for me. And for me, it was the next challenge in my life. Um, I was used to the big multinational corporate structure whereby everything is very organized. Every single document has to be checked, checked again. All of your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Now, I was in a very small, initially a small company, where it was my job to set up these processes to build up business in different, with different stakeholders around the world. And for me, that was the next challenge. I remember going to um, my first presentation, um, actually, um, on, in this new area. And the first question I had was, why don't we just do a nice ring-bound spiral um, presentation to send to our clients? Um, and my colleague at the time said, well, Rita, there is a print shop across the road. And for me, that was real life. I was used to being in a multinational where you just send an email or you press a button or you holler across the floor and your task would get done by a team. I was in charge of teams there. Now you have to do everything yourself. And I thought, wow, this is actually real life. And that was, for me, an eye-opener, something that I never got to see really in the corporate world. So this is something I really, really enjoyed, getting my teeth stuck into just building something with my own hands from scratch. Um, and I was involved in business development. So I got to travel around the world, meeting various key opinion leaders across psychiatry, across neurology. So anybody who is a specialist, a pioneer in any new treatments in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, in schizophrenia, in depression, was somebody I got to meet face on and strike up conversations and make deals with. And this is something I love doing. So that took me around the world. And I loved traveling anyway. So that was something um, that was amazing for me. Um, and then um, part of the travels around the world took me to the U.S., and I now live in New York, which is where I am. And um, I settled here. I actually got married and I settled here. And now I have two small children who are now, my daughter is six and my son is um, seven and a half, almost eight. And when they were very, very young, um, I took almost four years off to raise them. And I have to tell you, Zuha and everybody watching today, that out of all the many, many jobs I've ever done, whether it's, you know, working sometimes almost 24-7 in the finance investment banking industry or traveling and crossing multiple time zones around the world, 
motherhood was by far the most challenging role I think I've ever done hands down. You know, um, I tell people all the time that um, when you are a full-time parent, um, in my case, a full-time mother, it is like working 24-7, but you're constantly sleep deprived. You can make it, never take a day off. You can't take a sick day and you are always, always on call. And you're constantly just managing multiple things at the same time. It stretches you beyond where you've ever been stretched. I thought I was very patient until I had my children. And that is what really, really taught me what patience really means. Communication. I always thought of myself as being a great communicator. I'd always done presentations and spoken a lot. I didn't really understand what communications fully meant until I had two little children. You know, communication isn't just verbal. It's not just vocal. There's digital communications. There's silent communications. There's communicating with babies who cannot talk back to you and you are getting the message across. So it really stretches you along many, many different spectrums of diversity across communications. You learn how to negotiate as well. I tell people all the time that if you can negotiate with a toddler, or later in life with a teenager, there is nobody that you can't take on in any boardroom interview. So that's something that gets you going as well. So back for me, this was the most challenging, most rewarding journey I'd ever taken. But the other thing as well is that when you become a mother, you give everything to that goal. And in some ways, certainly with me, I forgot who I was. Everything was about the kids. I remember my husband used to come home from work and ask me about my day. And my day was the kids' day. So he said, Rita, what did you do today? Um, Watch anything interesting on TV? And I said, yes, we watched Thomas the Tank Engine or whatever the kids are watching. And what about any books? Did you read anything interesting today? And I said, yes, we saw good, we read Goodnight Galaxy or the little blue truck leads the way. So the point being was every conversation, everything that I was asked translated to not about me, it was about my kids. So in many ways, I lost my confidence. Um, I forgot who I was. Um, There was um, a chance, um, an incident that took place. It was a bittersweet incident where I had to suddenly travel to India, to Assam. And this was the first time when my kids were very young that I had to leave them for the first time. I'd never done that before. My worry back then was what if they, you know, caught malaria or dengue fever or something like that, you know. Um, In hindsight, you know, it would have been totally fine. You know, I had so many cousins, relatives, everybody that would have taken care of them, fine. But the point being, this was the first time I'd ever been alone for them in, in a few years at this stage. And after a few hours, I would say, of just looking around my shoulder because I was used to the kids always being with me, I got to feel in my element. You know, when I was having conversations with friends, with relatives, I was laughing at jokes for myself. I started to remember who I was. And then I realized that I missed me. And I hadn't sort of realized this until this trip and until I was taken out of the situation. So that's when I went back, back to New York again, and realized that, you know what, I want to do something about this. There is a lot about me and my personality that I can just give the world. And I was just looking around. I started exploring, you know, finance careers. I started exploring um, pharmaceutical healthcare careers again. I wasn't sure which direction um, because I was, you know, come from both. But I was really surprised at the sort of questions that I was getting from peers and friends of mine. Nobody asked about my credentials and what I could offer back into the workforce. Instead, it was very focused on the fact that now I had a gap on my resume, on my CV. And I didn't know when I met friends for coffee that I had to fill, fill up a gap. Um, you know, I was just, you know, this is, this is what it is. But that was the reality that I was in. That single moment was what really planted the seeds to start UMA. So UMA to me was really an amalgamation of all of my life's journeys, everything that I had felt personally. And this almost was the calling straw for me to say, you need to do something about this. So what is UMA? In effect, it is an empowerment platform, an empowerment platform that helps to build confidence to inspire success. So whether you are returning um, to a professional career from whatever reason, from whatever background, whether you're already in a career 
but you're mid-level and you're thinking, well, how do I stand apart? How do I get to that next level and increase and improve my communication skills, my negotiation skills? Or if you're an experienced professional and you are at that level where you're about to break through that glass ceiling, but you just need that little bit of a help and push to get there. That is what Uma does. That is what the background I've come from and that is what I helped do. So it's been my passion really for the last, I would say, four and a half years now since the inception of UMA to really, really um, mentor amazing women and minorities across the world in different spectrum, but also build and coach and form processes and procedures for companies. You know, it's one thing getting amazingly talented women back into roles or helping them progress in roles in the workforce. But if your company isn't ready for you, if you have a bad boss or you go into a company with a workplace um, culture just isn't ready, somebody's going to leave. So in a way, I had to pivot and really focus my energies, not just on helping these individuals, but also how do I help the company? How do I coach managers, at, even at the C-suite CEO level, to understand what is inclusivity, how to be a decent leader, how to sort of get there and really expand your team efforts. So ultimately, you become the best manager, you include somebody in the workforce, and ultimately, you help drive the revenues in your corporation. So that's really a little bit of a snapshot of the journey there with UMA. Um, I also do a lot of, um, you know, speaking, I get invited or Prior to quarantine, I used to travel a lot as well and speak in different locations. Um, and that's a little bit of a snapshot of my journey, you know, um, a bit of a, you know, change in careers, entrepreneurial journey and, you know, a bit of a risk taking um, element, too. Um, so I just wanted to hand it back to you, Zuha, and all of the, the women at Stanley College for some questions. Thank you so much, Rosita, for that lovely talk. And I think one of the one of the reasons that the whenever we have a session on journeys, it actually resonates a lot with people because everyone finds their own pieces of life in others. So it really works. I, I think it, it was a beautiful session to end the Changemaker Summit with a journey. So thank you so much for being that journey for us, uh, Ms. Rita. So you spoke a lot about uh, how you got into business and how the development worked for you. But how did you, when did you believe that, yes, this is the one thing that I want to do? Especially when you came back. Up. Yeah. And it's actually very interesting you said that, Zuha. So I'm actually going to rewind a little bit in the journey. So prior to going to King's College London and studying mathematics and management, I actually started studied medicine and I did that for two years. I actually did my preclinical medicine because my parents really wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> and it was in my family blood. It was a very traditional thing. You know, my dad, mom came from a medical background, my grandparents, it was literally, you know, coming down the line. So that was just given to me. And I was very good at my studies. So they said, okay, Rita, you're going to be a doctor. And back in my day, the education system, um, certainly in the UK, was very much spoon-fed education. So you are not really taught to really think about what is it I want to do. Things are different these days, but back then it was very much like, you know, you were given something to, um, you're taught something by something written on a blackboard or a whiteboard. You have to copy it down, you memorize it, and you regurgitate it when it comes to exam time. And I was very good at doing that. When I got to university for the first time, and this is something I think um, the ladies at Stanley College might resonate with as well, this was the first time that I could actually, I was left alone. And I had to make my own notes. And that was the first time, how do I even do that? You know, I'm used to somebody giving me the notes and I just learned them. So that was the first time I actually got to think about what is it I want to do. I soon found out that I couldn't stand, you know, the smell of blood. And anatomy was one of the classes that I just used to skip because I didn't enjoy it. And I remember used to calling up my mom, actually, um, to say, mom, I, I, I just don't like this. And then she was like, oh, you know, just carry on with it, carry on with it. So my mom, actually, she was a zoologist and she hated dissection. So she was like, you know, trying to actually promote my studies by saying, you know, it, it will get better. And my father was like, you know what, nobody likes the initial years, just keep on at it. But there was something different. When I was studying, I, you know, practiced the same procedures where I memorized the work, I came to exam, I would get distinctions. So even my tutors weren't understanding when I was saying, I don't like studying this. They didn't understand. I was one of their top students. 
So fast forward two years, I had to go through this. I couldn't convince anybody that I did not want to study this. Two years came later. This is the transition between preclinical to clinical medicine. And then this was the first time that I could say, you know what, I'm going to put my foot down. I don't want to do this. And this is not making me happy. I was not feeling like myself. So to answer your question, Zuha, it wasn't until I made that decision, two things happened. One is that I felt incredible relief that something had been lifted, some burden had been lifted for me. But the second part was that I felt incredible guilt, guilt that I was letting down my family above anything else. You know, and that was the bit that stopped me almost for two years. Yes, my professor said something, but it was more my family. What are they going to say? What are they going to think about me? So then I thought, well, this is this is a time and it was a difficult conversation to have with my family. And they did not accept it initially. You know, they just didn't understand when I was doing really well. And, you know, the background they came from is that you go through a certain career, you do well at it, you keep going. But I knew something was up. And then I thought, okay, what do I want to do? And that's when I decided, okay, mathematics and management. I always loved mathematics when at school. I loved art and painting and I loved French, the language. So then I thought to myself, what do I want to do? And I thought, well, French, well, I love going, I love traveling. You know, it was like two hour train ride on the Eurostar from London to Paris. So I can go there every weekend anyway and practice my French. With art, I thought, you know what, that's my passion. That is something that I can still do when I have some spare time and I can always visit art galleries and on, you know, sort of enroll in sort of extracurricular art history lessons if I wanted to. But with mathematics, that was something that I found was a bit more difficult. One of the STEM subjects, it's harder to just pick up a book and learn yourself. So I thought, okay, mathematics is what I'm going to do. So I was about to study mathematics and then Zuha, a week before semester started at King's College London, I switched to mathematics and business management. Because I thought, you know what, what is it I've always been intrigued about, but have no idea about? And it was about the management world. It was about finance. And I just decided to take that risk. And I thought, you know what, what do I have to lose at this point? You know, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to enjoy things. And that's the reason I decided to study that. And that's why when I had this chance encounter at Goldman, I was so relaxed about it that I didn't put that pressure. You know, when we go to interviews and when we look for the next internship, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be perfectionists, to really climb out of our shells and to really judge ourselves and compete. I didn't do that. I let my personality flow. Yes, I did my research. I didn't just go in not knowing anything. I read up on on the firm and I read up on, you know, different areas. So the questions I had were genuine questions. That's something that really engaged and interested me. And I think that's one of the things that came across my passion and that intrigue about my personality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Sita. Um, I don't think that was, again, the way you said that when you turned a mother and you had to, and when you, your life entirely became about your children. Yeah. In our audience right now, we do have a diversity of uh, people. We have adults, we have both men and women, and we have students too. But this time I would like to ask the question from a student's perspective, as a woman student perspective. Um, right now, we do have the same goals. We do are just working on achieving our dreams. But when we do lose our priority, for example, when our priority becomes our family, and you had this moment of euphoria that, oh, like, or like okay, like, okay, this is what I want to do. But how do you find those moments in your, when you're, out of your goals? Yeah, you know, that's such a great question, Zuha. So I think if, from a student perspective, you have now invested your time to study and do this incredible degree, you're at a very prestigious institution like Stanley College. So remember that if you now have other priorities as well, so for example, it could be a family, it could be your parents, whatever it is, think why are you studying? Why are you doing this? Ultimately, for me, one of the things that drove me forward and to continue, because when you are an entrepreneur, things are very, very difficult. There is no easy day. Things don't just land on your lap. You don't just find clients. You have to go out there and get them from day one. And then later on, things start to flow. But for me, it was my children that were my driving factor. And I never lost sight of that. One day, I wanted to build a platform that they could say, my mother built that. And she did that, and she's building something that empowers other people. 
So whatever the goal is, in your case, Zuha, in the students as well at Stanley, think about why you are doing this. If you have children, for example, they are looking at you. You are their role model right now. Everything you're doing, everything you say, they are absorbing everything. Any emotion you have, kids know what you're feeling before you even say it or before you know it yourself. They can just sense it. So everything you're doing, they are watching. So in terms of prioritizing in your goals, remember that. Remember the why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. Remember ultimately who's watching and driving this in the, as well. So I think that should help you kind of remain that focus. We all lose focus. It's natural. Things happen. You wake up one day and you just you want to go back to bed again. But I think going back to remembering why you're doing this and the actual driving reason should steady forward. Zuha, I can't hear you. My problem. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, again, uh, that the talk you spoke about education also a lot. So, how would you say the important in education over here in this entire aspect? What's the role of the education that you've had that has played role in shaping you? Yeah, I mean, I think great, great question. Um, I think education is it, it's a bit of a twofold answer, really. So, I think in some ways, education is very, very important. Um, in one reason, because there is competition out there for jobs later on. And there is selection criteria and everybody has a certain minimum level of qualifications. So to be even thought about and to compete for a certain role, there is a minimal level of criteria that you're going to have. But above and beyond that is your personality and your drive as well. So I think when you have your education, think of areas that you really like because it's the skills and how you study for exams or what you do with certain assignments and projects that will help you build your case studies later on. So don't just go in for the sake of education. You really treat it like a holistic experience. Education isn't just about memorizing numbers or understanding theorems. It's also about practical elements. It's teaching you about widening in your mind. It's teaching you about one day I'm learning this. How can I apply this to the world later on? So think outside of your just basic learning for the sake of learning. But then the other thing I'm going to tell you as well, Zuha, and this is true. I have seen, especially as an entrepreneur, that a lot of what you are learning now is going to be not relevant at all later on in what you do. There are so many jobs out there that unless you go into something very technical or very quantitatively driven, isn't going to be relative or relevant to what you're studying now. Some of you are going to be going into finance. You're going to be going into different jobs in industry. And then you're going to, it's going to be good that you studied what you did. You have a certain analytical mind, but you're not going to be doing that. So education, while it's amazing and great, learn the holistic approach because that is ultimately what's going to drive you forward later on. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Rita. And another thing, uh, am I audible to you, fine? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Um, another thing that you mentioned that you travel a lot for your, like, of course, in these times, but you travel a lot for UMA and for your business. So other than that, I have a friend and I know many people actually other than my this friend that they want to do a job. They want a profession. They want to do something in life. But what do they want to do? I don't know. I just want to travel. Yeah. So what would you say to people like that? You know what? I did that too. Um before I started um, medicine, I traveled. Um, before I started at Goldman Sachs, I traveled as well. I, I went off to Guatemala myself because I wanted to fully immerse and learn Spanish. And I was there for, I would say, clo you know, close to six months in the end. Um, you know, I just went, took off and left. And for me, I needed to get traveling out of my system. It's still not out of my system. But for me, it was almost like it really broadens your mind by traveling. I think if somebody wants to do that, you have the travel bug, you've got to do it because you're always going to be thinking about the world, what's out there. I love meeting people from different cultures. I love dancing and music and just embracing and really getting immersed in the way of different people's lives. And I think the traveling is ultimately what's helped me now. I'm very much in the diversity and inclusion space. I teach lectures at different colleges and universities around the world. And I think part of that is the ability to resonate and understand where people are coming from in different cultures. People, 
you know, we are all the same people, but we come from different backgrounds. Our cultures define how we do things and how we think in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I think traveling really helps you understand that. So if somebody wants to travel, you go ahead and travel because that will ultimately help clear your mind and help realize, make you realize what is it you actually want to do later on. You know, quite often, you know, students these days, you are given the opportunity to do things and you don't know. You do things because you think you want to do it, but you can never know for fact what's what your career is going to be or what you want to do. Um, but traveling can help with that. And you can also try different things, too. You know, I mean, back in my parents day, even in my earlier day, once you had a career, the career stuck. That's all you did. Yeah. But that's not what happens now. Right. Um, people can swap and change. You try different things. And that's why your skills are really important. And traveling is big on one of those skills list. Thank you so much, Ishita. And uh, we're actually coming to the end of this, even this keynote and the entire the Change Maker Summit 2021 also. So can you actually give a proper conclusion for this entire, key, your keynote address as well as the Change Maker Summit? That would be lovely. Um, absolutely. So um, in terms of my keynote, I would love to say that um, being an entrepreneur, being an individual, being a woman is something that you should take pride in. Quite often in society, um, you get the impression that because you're a woman, you have to try that much harder or you have to take a back seat or you have to react slightly differently or you're put into a certain situation because you're given certain helping hands. My lesson would be to everyone is that just remember it's your passion that drives you forward. What is it you really want to do? Because that's the only way that internal change and then external change can happen. This is the Change Maker Summit. So ultimately, you have to know what is it you want to do. Don't let some little birdie outside or a family member direct you. Yes, people can give you advice, but ultimately, you, you're the one who's going to decide what direction you're going to go in later on. You have to take risks. I tell people all the time, it's like having a left hand and the right hand. They talk to each other. You have to put your hands together. When you're driving a car, you use two hands. When you're riding a bicycle, you use two hands. You use two hands for a lot of things. So they have to talk to each other. And when you have one skill and you're right-handed and you only use that hand, you also have to educate your left because there's some skills that you might be neglecting. And you don't want to do that. In order for your hands to talk to each other and you to drive yourself forward, you've got to make sure that not only are you really harnessing what you're good at, harness what you're not so good at, what you challenge as well, because that's ultimately what's going to set you forward. You are change makers out there today. Think about what is the one thing you want to do personally to make your change and mark in the world. What is it about your education and your background that you think you can fulfill later on? Personally, I want to make lives better for women and children. I like to talk to policymakers about what they can be doing better in their societies. For you as well, you amazing women at Stanley College, think about what you can do personally. It might be something very little. It could be about going home and having a conversation with your family at the dinner table. It could be about speaking to your children or speaking to your parents about what it feels like about your career. That is change happening. And that is how it starts. It's the little things, it's the small things that ultimately lead to the big things that can change the world. Thank you so Thank much, Musita. So and I love the analogy of right hand and left hand, good skills and bad skills. Thank you so much for this entire keynote and also the beautiful conclusion that you gave us just now. Thank you so much, Musita. It was lovely hosting you at the same month. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. It was a pleasure having you. I'm sure the audience loved you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to direct myself to the audience. Yes, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to direct myself to the audience. This is the end of the Changemaker Summit 2021. And thank you for staying with us for the three days of such amazing panels and keynote sessions that we've had for the entire time. I would now, now in five minutes, we'll be back with a proper validity ceremony. So thank you so much. Now, even for our future endeavors in organizing even more sessions for you, we'd really love if you can fill out the feedback form that is written in the comment section of the YouTube 
YouTube channel of Stanley Women's College. So please press, uh, please fill the feedback form so that we can do even much better to present to you the even more greater events. Thank you so much. You are currently the only person in this conference. Hello everyone. We have now finally reached the end of the three-day Changemaker Summit 2021. I would like to thank you all and all the panelists and the speakers from all around the world who joined us, irrespective of their time zones, for giving us their valuable knowledge and time. This event would not have been possible without the support of our chief patron, Sri Kodali Krishna Rao Sir, Secretary and Correspondent at Stanley, our chief patron, Dr. Satya Prasad Lanka Rao Sir, uh, Principal at Stanley, with the director, Dr. Vinay Babu, sir. Special thanks to our program chair, Dr. B.V. Ramnamurti, sir, and our convener, Dr. P. R. Anisha, ma'am, for their consistent effort and dedication to, towards this event. There is no stone that moves as Stanley without the undying support of these dynamic leaders. I would like to thank the team of ATBD for their relentless efforts in making this event a grand success. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants for patiently listening to us for three consecutive days. It was indeed an amazing experience hosting such dynamic speakers and enthusiastic audience. I thank you all once again for making this event a huge success. Hope to see you all in our next event. Thank you.